establishing the conservation fund. We went and learned from other places in BC. We workshopped, we consulted with APCs, community organizations, residents, business leaders all around the region. And when it was the right time in 2017, uh, the South Okanagan Conservation Fund was established. And as you've said, the purpose of this fund is to provide that local uh, financial support to projects that are ensuring environmental sustainability um, protection of natural areas and to help kind of create a resilient and healthy uh, Okanagan uh, area. So the benefits of this fund we thought would be seen in every participating municipality and electoral area and that is indeed the case. So I thought we'd cover a little bit of the highlights here. Um, this The conservation fund we thought would be the anchor to leverage other funding, um, both cash and in-kind from around the region and outside the region and boost the impact of projects and benefits to here. And that indeed has been the case. So since the time we established the fund, we've had five calls for proposals and here are some highlights to date. So over $1.5 million has been dispersed to organizations that are working on environmental sustainability around the South Okanagan. This constitutes about 38 individual grants for 24 projects, nine being single year projects and 15 projects that are delivered over multiple years. That South Okanagan Conservation Fund $1.5 million investment over five years leveraged an additional $5.3 million in funding. This is actual cash uh, to the region from outside sources in grants and foundation funds for these environmental projects. So that also doesn't cover the $700,000 in in-kind contributions of volunteer time, expertise, equipment and other support. So this fund has quadrupled its investment in matching funds and in-kind support towards environmental sustainability. There's a broad depth of organizations that are working on sustainability here. So mostly nonprofit charitable societies that have their own niche in the environmental realm. They coordinate with each other to reduce duplication and to advance science-based uh, planning. Um, and they also work towards uh, making sure that the priorities on the land base are delivered. The technical advisory committee that has been established by RDOS has an exceptional breadth of expertise and knowledge and the criteria they uphold is carefully constructed to maintain the integrity of the fund. So not every application is recommended for funding and you also as a board have vetted and ensured that your decision to fund projects is well founded and that's ha has been very appreciated. Projects were delivered across the region, benefiting every municipality and electoral area that are participating. This fund supports land securement. So to date, the fund has protected 392 acres or 160 hectares of the most at-risk ecosystems in BC. It's supported habitat restoration enhancement. So it has supported projects that have removed thousands of kilograms of garbage and invasive plants from natural areas around the region. It's planted thousands of native plants to recover ecosystems that have been damaged. It has supported the improved passage and spawning and rearing habitat for fish in our mainstream rivers and tributaries. And it supported the important goals of reconciliation and objectives of bringing one of the Ford food chiefs back to the waters of the Silk traditional territory. All the while these projects improve flood protection and water quality as kind of an added bonus. This fund has supported the education of thousands of landowners about how to care for natural areas on their lands and including how to improve the sustainability of our lake foreshore habitat. So to increase resiliency for flooding, improve water quality and also create habitat for wildlife. And this fund has helped to engage hundreds of residents in learning about their environment, getting their hands dirty, undertaking volunteer projects around the region, planting invasive plant removal, counting bats, snakes, and everything in between. So from school kids to seniors, residents have been invited to come and have come in droves to do something, some small act that helps to uphold the quality of life that makes the Okanagan so special. So these are just a few of the examples of the power of this fund and outside the region, local governments and organizations are watching and learning about what's happening here. So for example, the North Okanagan now has a conservation fund because of your leadership and, and example here in the South Okanagan. I get calls and uh, am asked to come and speak to many places around the province of BC to learn 
and teach folks and answer questions about the, the South Okanagan Conservation Fund and, and what goes on here. So there are lots of places that are watching and learning from, from what's happening here. I've really enjoyed creating this important opportunity with you. I encourage you to keep the course and uh, keep the fund moving forward. Get out and see the projects on the land base with the new administrator. And I know that that's a step that's coming. Um, when they're in place, um, they'll be creating opportunities for you to get out and see some of this really important work. Thank you for all your support and enthusiasm for this program. It's making a difference and it's really the really important way that RDUS and member municipalities are investing and delivering on sustainability in this region. It's, it's an incredibly important program. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to chat with you today. Well, thank you, Bryn. Again, all your efforts are appreciated and you're going to be hard to replace in that position for sure. So all the thank best you. in future endeavors. Thanks so much. Look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda. It is UBCM Minister meeting requests and I'll go to the CAO for that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, every year, the Union of British Columbia Municipalities uh, sends out notes to every local government in British Columbia uh, asking if they want to set up meetings uh, through their annual conference with uh, ministers uh, or staff in the various ministries. And we have to have our list in by uh, June 24th. So we talked about this. Uh, at our last corporate services meeting, we had some suggestions from some of the members. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have this list at committee, and then we're going to need the resolution uh, later on this afternoon in order to send them in. So uh, we've identified what we thought uh, was what we were interested in pursuing. And the challenge this morning now is for uh, committee to make sure that we've captured what exactly it is that you want to talk about with the uh, ministers and or the staff and uh, make sure that we uh, can then put that into the uh, meeting requests that we have to send in to uh, UBCM. So uh, I believe that legislative services sent out a list, uh, an Excel, uh, Excel spreadsheet uh, just very recently uh, listing all of the issues that we had on our uh, radar. So I'll go through that uh, spreadsheet with you and then just make sure that uh, whoever proposed the, the request for the meeting, make sure that we've captured exactly what it is that you wanted us to uh, do. So this first one, transit cost apportionment, uh, we added this one administratively. Uh, we have noticed that uh, we believe uh, that rural governments may not be treated fairly uh, with regards to the uh, BC Transit funding compared to the urban municipalities. Just because the cost of providing transit in uh, rural areas is more expensive. Uh, we have further distances to travel. We have lower volume. Uh, we have a number of uh, scheduling issues. Uh, and we think that the proportionate share of the funding from BC Transit uh, to local government should go to the rural municipalities. So, uh, we're interested in talking uh, with that. Uh, we we believe that we're probably targeting BC Transit itself uh, to see if they can give us some additional information on that or to uh, provide a target as to where we would go if we want to change that policy. We're not sure if it's the provincial government or if it's BC Transit, but uh, uh, that would be a good place to start. So, um, that would be, and I'm not sure how you want to do this, Mr. Chair, if you want to have a little bit of a discussion after each proposal, or if you want to wait till the end, or how we're going to do this. And I would ask if there's anybody who is taking issue or has some suggestions for this. If I don't see any hands, then we'll move on to the next one. Okay. Uh, the next one was the urgent and primary care network, and there was a concern that uh, as to how the 
the Ministry of Health uh, designates who gets captured in an urban system uh, as opposed to the rural ones. We know from our last discussion with uh, Interior Health that they are looking at extending the primary care network throughout uh, the Okanagan and Similkameen, but Summerland and Okanagan Falls get captured uh, in the Penticton uh, area. And uh, so they're not set out separately. Uh, and we know that Penticton already has two uh, primary or urgent primary care uh, clinics. So uh, the prospect of uh, adding another one for the Penticton area uh, doesn't seem to be on the radar right now, whereas the rural ones for Isaias, Oliver, Karameas, and Princeton are. So that uh, is what we interpret to be the issue that we want to discuss with the Minister of Health. Okay. Any thoughts on this one, Director Joe Hanson? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, CAO, I think we need to do some work on this one. Um, there's some fundamental sort of errors in it and maybe some further discussion with Summerland. But the first issue is that there really is no UPCCs being contemplated for Oliver Asudius, Princeton, Karameas. It's, it's rural PCN money that's being used to uh, renovate capital interior health spaces for those, for those workers. That's happening at Princeton Hospital or being proposed for the Princeton Hospital and Karameas. Oliver Asudius is still in the works. We don't have an interior health facility necessarily that has come forward for a renovation project to house the interior health or the allied health workers for that area. Um, I think that the challenge with Summerland, and I talked to Director Holmes about this, and, and it's whether Summerland should go to the ministry as a, as a district of Summerland on their own. And I think really the ask isn't uh, necessarily for rural PCN money, it's asking for more capital for phase one which was PCN, phase one PCN, which was Penticton, in Summerland and, and included OK Falls, I believe, Naramata and West Bench as well. There, there is no capital left for phase one. So if there was additional capital for phase one, it would be possible maybe that that money could be redirected to OK Falls, to Summerland for uh, PCN facilities in those communities, not just Penticton. Um, I'll go to Director Holmes if you've got any comments on that, but I'm kind of thinking we need to rejig this one and, and be clear on the ask because there is money, there is rural PCN money available, but it's for Oliver Asudis, Karameas, Princeton, which is phase two of the PCN, not phase one. Okay, thank you. Looking to see if there's any other hands Director on this. Holmes. Uh, Director Holmes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. So yeah, it's just not the it's, it's not just a rural urban sort of divide here. I, I, the way I see it is, uh, the, the province, uh, in terms of capital funding for setting up primary care center uh, centers, there's only one model where there's an ability to fund capital um, upgrades to 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 put, open up a primary care center, and that's through interior health. And then it has to be an interior health facility. If another community wants to go another way, do something different, there's no opportunity to obtain um, funding either from from the hospital board, from us, or from the or from the province or interior health for anybody. There's just no funding to, to be able to do it, and so that creates that that that's so it doesn't allow any flexibility. Um, in communities to do things that work best for their own communities. Um, it, it's, it's, it's either the interior health way or no way. And that, and that causes, you know, problems for communities like ours in Summerland and Oliver's too, I believe, where, where uh, we're trying to do things, something differently that works, that, that will work better for us. Um, especially since interior health isn't interested in putting a, a clinic in, in our community anyway. So, uh, that, that's the issue. Uh, we, we are in, in Summerland. We are requesting a meeting ourselves, and so we're happy just to you know um, to meet with the minister as, as Summerland Council. Um, uh, but if, if if I don't know if the board sees this as an issue as well, then I, I don't think it would hurt to 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 speak to the larger problem because it's not just a, it's not just us. It's province wide. I think.
not seeing any other hands at this time. So I guess that puts us in a spot of should we proceed to a minister's meeting on this from our perspective or just support Summerland in their ask? Not seeing. Go ahead, Director. Well, I just think we need to be clear about our ask. And if we're if we're going, if Summerland's going and making the ask, what what are we asking for on top of that? Because um, I do see the Oliver Asuius Carmius Princeton PCN two different than than the PCN one. So it's it's like apples and oranges. We're asking for the ministry to rejig and and how they roll out PCNs, or are we asking for additional funding for phase one? I can support going to the, the ministry as the hospital district asking, asking for more funding for phase one uh, PCN, but I'm not sure that I, that I would favor going and asking for a rejig of the entire PCN process and how they put different communities together in different phases. I think that message might just, it is a good message, I just think it might get lost. And, and I know from my meetings with the minister, it's much better to have something more specific you're asking for. Um, if Summerland, I know, is working on a clinic, that's a really good starting point to ask for additional funding for phase one. And I think Summerland has a case to be made uh, for phase one capital funding for additional facilities for allied health workers and or physicians, not necessarily a UPCC, because I've had that conversation with the minister directly and there's a recognition that UPCCs are not the silver bullet that's going to fix everything. So um, at this point, I'm kind of struggling to go there as a hospital district uh, because I just don't know clearly what the ask is for. Okay. Director Gettins. Uh, thanks, Chair. I wonder if, if there's a way of approaching it that you're looking for partnership funding based on community need rather than a bank and blank of solution. So what Summerland needs is different than what Oliver needs, but there's no way to get that voice back up. And so I'm wondering if that's a way to clarify what the ask is. Okay. CAO? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so what we need, we just need a brief blurb. Uh, all of the request, uh, meeting request forms are electronic now, and there's, there's not a lot of space uh, to, uh, it's not a full briefing note. We can do that for our members that are gonna be attending a meeting. But to get the meeting, we just need a brief blurb uh, from those that are most knowledgeable about it so that we can submit an electronic form. Um, what I'm seeing now is that, uh, Director Johansson, you have a specific uh, issue that you're very knowledgeable about. If you could send us in something oh, yeah, yeah. that we could use to uh, submit the form, that would be very helpful. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah, I that see. Would have a, a lot. Uh, that sure. should have a loss. So and just, just to remind the members to put your mics on mute if you're if you're not speaking at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth there, CAO. I was just going to remind everybody of that. Uh, go ahead, Director. John. Yeah, thanks uh, to the Chair and the CAO. I, I'll put something together um, and, and send it in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Director Obrick. Uh, yeah, thank you to the chair. And I'm, I'm having difficulty finding this on the spreadsheet. I, I have a comment to make as well, but can, can anybody help me find the spreadsheet? I've got an email yesterday from 1037, but I, I'm not seeing this on this spreadsheet that I have. Uh, it is on there. Uh, this number three on it, urgent and primary care network. It's actually the second one on there. Oh yeah, it's actually the second one on there, but it's listed in number three for Yeah, some you know, my computer uh, mouse, I, I'm having trouble. I just found it, but when I scroll, it skips. Yes, right it past does. You've got to use the arrow on the other side to yeah, I, slowly. Yeah, no matter, every time I, I push the button, uh, it jumps right by, so I can't even see it. But I, I, it is here. I just my my uh, mouse. The technology is too sensitive. I can't even focus in on it, even with your help. Can you imagine? Even with your help, I'm that. Um, here, here's my question or my comment is, uh, and, and thank you for the help. I do appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate Okanagan Falls being mentioned 
uh, in this context of uh, primary care. Uh, my experience has been that we're, we're usually not involved or not considered. Our community has uh, real issues, and the I've been really impressed, even from before I was elected, with the direction of this concept of team-based primary care network. Uh, we've had conversations at the hospital board. Uh, I would very much like to be involved, if possible, in this meeting, if that's possible. Yep and uh, participate, listen, but also express concern um, uh, with, uh, in 2013, I had a meeting with uh, Minister Dix, he was then leader of the uh, party, New Democrat Party, and expressed concern then. Uh, here we are, uh, many years later, I, I know Director McCordov has told me many times, you've got to be patient, things are slow. And she's right, uh, and, and I know the chair has told me the same thing. but. It, it, it is slow. We, we just need to get uh, a little attention on our community. And I think when we're looking at priorities, maybe a Suyus has a higher priority than OK Falls. And maybe so does Karameas, and maybe so does Princeton, and maybe so does Summerlap, and maybe so does Oliver. But I'd like to be on the list, even at the bottom, would be a nice change to be on the list. So I appreciate that uh, mention. And I just ask if I can be involved. I sure appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. I think we got to move on to the next one, CAO, which is the safety and traffic calming measures. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Director Gettins raised this at uh, one of the meetings, and this is uh, well, we've had previous discussions on this as well. Uh, we believe we'd have to go uh, directly to the uh, Minister of uh, transportation and infrastructure on this one. It would seem to, I think, be a policy change for them. Uh, so if we've gathered the right context, uh, we can just uh, submit this one in. If there's something else that we wanted to add on, uh, we should get that out on the table. Okay, I'll go to Director Gettins. Um, yeah, I think this is pretty... Um pretty spot on it's just it's just giving a voice to the citizens that live on the roads that use them the most is what we're looking to do and there's no way of doing it we've been working with Modi for so long and once they update this um speed limit signs and that's really their hands are tied there's nothing else that they can do because like you said our cao it is a policy so i'm happy with this but i'm just suggestion if anybody has them okay thank you director Roger. Yes, thank you to the chair, and, and I really appreciate this one, and I thank Director Geddens for all she's done in moving it forward. Uh, this is a really huge concern in OK Falls, has been for a lot of years. Uh, again, one of those examples of how slow things go. Uh, letters in community from 2013 still not dealt with. Uh, you may recall the board meeting of, uh, I think it was December 17, 20. 20 when we had the Modi delegation here and I, I managed to get them to come into our community in September for a tour, four hours we spent dealing with issues of concern just like this one. Um, we're, we're not getting any success. Now I want to speak to this because I was at the LGLA conference in Richmond and on uh, in April, first uh, five, six, seven, eight of April, and the Electoral Area Directors Forum was fascinating. There was only 66 members there, uh, rescheduling COVID, lots of reasons why numbers were down. The delegations that spoke were impressive, Ministry of Environment and, and other provincial ministries. And the staff who show up, they work hard and they report out and they, you can tell they really work hard and they really care and they really like to share with that room the, the, the information. And I watched delegation after delegation after delegation do a great job. And I watched the mics as people queue to ask questions. And one delegation was different. One experience was different. It was Modi. And when the, th the three people on the panel finished, and they did a, a fine job, they were, they were, they were good, hardworking staff members from the province doing an admirable job reporting out and, and the mics just swarmed, swarmed, one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another electoral area director took a mic and complained, frustration, 
and the issues went on and on. But the point is, this is so much more than just us. It's, it's more than West Bench. It's more than OK Falls. It's a provincial concern. Not Now, Roly Russell was there. He said he came to listen, to learn. And, and that was a moment where it was obvious in the province, this is a big issue. And it's, it's one that is, uh, well, again, it's too slow. We're, we're not getting any good success. So this is a small, small step forward. But I wanted to mention that because, well, uh, there was nobody else in this room at that conference, and I thought you'd all benefit from knowing what others are experiencing. This is not an issue unique to us. Thank you. Okay. If we can keep it short, we do have a number of these to go through. Uh, Director Canodo, I see a hand up from you. Yes, and to the chair, thank you very much. And, and to uh, add to Director Oldrick's point, this is a very uh, um, important issue for rural areas. Uh, but perhaps one thing we could add to it is the uh, ability for the rural areas to, to actually help fund these. Every time I've come up against Modi, uh, it's become a funding issue. Uh, and uh, I have offered to put money towards signage and, and uh, calming issues. Uh, but I think we need a mechanism to allow that to happen. And possibly that should be included in this debate. Perhaps we can expedite some of these things in that manner. Thank you. Okay. Could be scary, scary thought, but Director <laughs> Kazakovich. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add, I, I think everyone's well aware this is nothing new. We've been after this for more than a decade. I've presented before to Minister Stone multiple times. I even offered to pay at Area E, even not out of our budget, citizens were willing to pay to just have a crosswalk painted for the students at the school. They refused to allow it. Um, we could not put it in. They did a couple um, assessments on the amount of traffic that was going by the school, and apparently it didn't justify any traffic calming measures such as a crosswalk. So it's really frustrating. Uh, even offering to pay for some of it has not yielded any results. So I just wanted everyone to know, especially for newer board members, that this, this isn't new, but it's something that we definitely have to keep pushing. And I know other regional districts have been pushing for this as well for a very, very long time. Thank you. Okay. Director Holmes, I see a hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just an idea. If we've been banging our head against the wall with Ministry of Transport all these years, maybe we should request a meeting with the Minister of Education and and saying that uh, it, it's, a, you know, for outside school, especially, you know, if you, if you take that angle to it um, and then explain to the Minister of Education that we've gotten nowhere with the Ministry of Transport, uh, but this is for your students and this is for student safety, and uh, I know, you know, in municipalities, we're talking to the school board all the time. And the school board's, uh, you know, about crosswalks and where they ought to be and where all that sort of stuff. So, you know, it's not just the Ministry of Transport issue. It's also mis Ministry of Education. And, and, and uh, if you could get the school board support, that, that would even go further, I would say. So just an idea. Well, that's a good suggestion and may help. But we just want to know if we're on target with these meeting requests in the message. So if we can keep it to that, it'll speed the process up. Uh, let's move on to the next one, CAO. I think it's homeowners grants. I uh, just got a note caught off the press, uh, Mr. Chair. I see that Mr. Safino has been working on this with Director Canodal and that the uh, request on this one will be that the additional homeowners grant be increased to reflect the actual school tax charge on the property and that this would then reduce the overall tax payable by the resident. So... That's the proposal? That was what I saw in the uh, briefing note that Mr. Safino just uh, sent out. So this one... Um, and I, I, I'm not sure who this goes to uh, as far as a homeowner grant. I guess the Minister of Finance? Probably. So, 
Uh, but that is the proposal, Mr. Chair, and I think uh, Director uh, Canodal probably has more info on, on this. Okay, I'll go to Director Knodel and then Director Gettins. Go ahead, Director Knodel. Thank you to the chair. Uh, the reason that we're tying this to the school uh, tax is that was the original intent of the seniors grant to alleviate school taxation. So uh, Mr. Zavino has done considerable uh, work on this to, to, to bring it to, uh, to home. So it's actually tied to the original purpose of the seniors grant. So that's, that's why we're aiming it in that direction. Uh, and it's, it, he's got a formula there, but it, it's different for all areas, but it's a province-wide initiative. Thank you. Okay. I did see a hand from Director Gettins, but it's gone. So I'm assuming she's okay, or you want to speak? Go ahead. Yeah, just a really quick question. I didn't realize that was the intention of the seniors grant was so that seniors didn't have to contribute to public education. So I'm not just as a as a personal aside, I, I think that we should all be investing in public education. So I, I'm not anyway, I was just surprised to hear that it was basically my comment. I didn't know that was part of it. But I think we all invest in in education because we all want educated people. So that's my <laughs> two cents. Absolutely. OK. Uh, seeing no dis oh, uh, Director, Director Watts, Watts. Go ahead. Here. Yeah, Director Watt, go ahead. To the chair, just to touch further on uh, what Director Gettins has said, I, I think you cross a line when you start discriminating between who pays. And ultimately, if you're going to consider seniors not paying, does a single mom not have to pay? Does a you know unemployed person not have to pay? And ultimately, this is for the benefit of a whole community, and those those taxes really have a purpose that I think is uh, well intentioned. And I, I also I agree with Council uh, Director Gettins. <laughs> Director Canole. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, th this was on the recommendation of, of, of Finance Officer Zafino to stay with a, a tool that the provincial government already has to protect people who are on fixed and limited income. <coughs> We're seeing a, a terrible impact in the rural area with as much as 60% increases in some of these. Uh, homeowners uh, we've, we've lost another two seniors in this area uh, this year because of these huge increases um, it, it, I had, uh, originally thought that possibly just increasing homeowners grants period uh, but uh, Mr. Zavino says that it, the regular homeowners grant is tied to another mechanism uh, so we'd have to uh, do it in two segments uh, again we're looking to uh, protect the uh, uh, fixed and, and low income people who are falling off the radar here uh, considerably. Um, and it, it was just a step to get us going. And we also had discussions with uh, uh, MLA uh, Russell's office in this uh, regard. So it, it's a way to get something started, uh, but it's by, by no means the, the end to that. Uh, another example is that the poverty grant doesn't kick in unless your house is worth 1.9 million. Uh, so anyone whose house is less than 1.9 million doesn't qualify for the uh, the poverty grant. So that puts another caveat onto it and something else that we're going to have to look at too going forward. Thank you. I see you hand director Gettins. Yeah, just on process, are all of these meeting requests, have they all gone, were they all approved by SILGA? Like are these the resolutions that are approved by SILGA that we're using or no. just, okay, thanks. Just No, some were, but not all of them. Okay, so there is a little bit of dissension, I guess, on this minister's meeting, but the idea is to get a reduction in homeowners' grants, how it's actually worded is where the, the problem lies. I think everybody agrees that a, a reduction in the homeowners' grant isn't a bad thing. So. Are we okay to move on? Seeing no hands, CAO, the next one. Just need enough information to request the meeting. We can build the briefing note and, and uh, flesh it out uh, well before September. So just uh, just enough to get the meeting uh, is what we're focusing on today and to make sure that we want to request the meeting. Uh, so yes. good discussion there. Uh, the uh, next one on the Emergency Operations Center staff resources. So right now, 
Uh, typically, when we're in an event, uh, the municipal staff uh, go into the EOC and uh, we pay that through their normal uh, budget. And then we can request additional resources through EMBC uh, uh, to enhance uh, our response or to backfill for staff that have gone into the EOC. The problem being that uh, typically uh, the staff that go in uh, have a unique uh, skill set or profession, uh, and it's not easy to go ahead and try and find resources to backfill. So what this request is after is to have a discussion with the minister about um, just being able to go ahead and, and issue resource requests uh, to enhance EOC work or to uh, um, pay uh, for uh, staff. So uh, I think that one's pretty straightforward uh, and we're probably not unique in that regard. The minister's probably getting lots of requests on that one. So I think we're all right on that one, Mr. Chair. Okay, yeah, this one came from me. It meets what I had wanted to see. Uh, seeing no hands here anywhere. So next one is invasive species list. Uh, I believe this was a request uh, to put uh, the uh, elm tree on the invasive species list. Um, we haven't uh, fleshed this out very good. Um, so we probably need some additional information on this one. Okay, that did come, I think it says Director Monteith, but if, did you get a, a form? If you could fill out a little bit of background and get it sent in, that would be helpful. I spoke with Ms. Mulder this morning and I believe that they're handling it with a bylaw change. So Okay, I think so it right. doesn't need a minister's meeting? I don't believe so. Okay, well then we can take that one off. All right. Uh, school board boundary realignment, CAO. Uh, I believe this one also came from Director Monteith uh, looking for a realignment for APEX uh, for uh, uh, the school boundary. So we probably need more information on that one as well, Mr. Chair. Okay, I know she explained it to us earlier, but if yeah. you could send something in if we want that minister's yep. meeting, okay. I'm seeing no hands on that one. So, oh, yes. Director Roberts. Oh, sorry there, Director Roberts. I seen you waving, but go ahead. Uh, no worries. It's not this one specifically, but similar. It was the discussion that, which I don't see here, and I'm uh, wanting to find out whether or not what um, Director Coyne and I were discussing about the creation of a new school board district um, was left out or whether or not um, he was planning to do that municipally because again we're looking at something we've got some uh, discussion some support from first nations and we're looking you know looking at wanting to have a school district that basically takes up the whole Similkameen Valley Manning Park to Nighthawk with all the communities Tulameen, Colm, Allison Lake and the one surrounding Eastgate, Princeton, Headley, Caribbean, Olala, Coston with the support of the USIB and LSIB so <laughs> There you go. There's a mouthful. But I was wondering whether or not, you know, is this just a generic um, We're going to do that municipally. Alignment? Pardon me? We'll do it municipally. Okay, that was my question, whether or not that was happening there, and that's why it wasn't yeah. there. You're probably welcome to attend. I'm sure yeah. Spencer would encourage you to come with him on that meeting. Okay, I'll bring uh, donuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next one would be the KBR Trail Recovery Update, CAO. Uh, we had some egregious damage, especially in the Similkameen uh, due to the November, December floods, Mr. Chair, and there was lots of the KBR infrastructure that was damaged. And we were looking for an update uh, from Rec Sites BC as to whether they were going to replace uh, some of that infrastructure and try and get an idea on timing. And we've received, uh, we haven't received very much. I'm not sure they know right now, but uh, the idea was to, uh, and then they got shuffled. So they're in a new ministry. Um, so the idea was to go in and uh, either uh, talk to the Rec BC staff at UBCM or to request a meeting with the minister to then uh, further advocate for additional funds. Uh, they don't have, Rec Sites BC doesn't have a very large budget, capital budget. Uh, so we could 
uh, ask for special circumstances due to the flooding uh, during that time. Okay, I think that one's fairly straightforward, and I'm seeing no hands <laughs> in here. Let's go on to the next one then, which was uh, organics, I think. Yeah, and this is the last one I have on my list, uh, Mr. Chair. We submitted this uh, again administratively, but it's an old issue in that uh, we still are waiting for the Agricultural Land Commission to render a finding on our request for reconsideration on 1313 Greyback Mountain Road. Uh, we wanted to either uh, get that exempted. Uh, it, uh, 1313 Greyback Mountain Road is the site we've targeted for the uh, organic facility. Uh, adjacent to Campbell Mountain, and it was initially turned down. It's partially in the ALR, uh, not all of it, but partially. So we had requested that it be um, removed from the ALR or to be given a non-farm use status so we could build this organics processing and treatment facility. That was denied by the Agricultural Land Commission. We submitted our request for reconsideration, and we have yet to hear uh, if we were to get a decision prior to uh, September, then uh, this may not be necessary, but at this point in time, we're not hopeful of that. It took us a year and a half to get the initial decision uh, from the ALC, uh, so we're not sure what the timeline is uh, for the reconsideration, but we wanted to submit the meeting request and just get it on the docket and, and have that discussion. Okay, makes sense. I don't see any hands on this one so i believe these will come back to us if we're comfortable with it uh, the meeting requests will be formally approved by the board later on today so this was just to make sure we were all on the page the same page director <coughs> Obrick, you have a hand well i had a few requests but i didn't know there was a deadline for today's meeting i, I understood the deadline was the 24th i've spoken to people in the community and uh, I don't know how to get them on the list, or if it's possible, am I too late? At this stage of the game, it is getting late. Uh, CAO, can you answer that? Well, members were invited to send something in, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, we are getting kind of tight uh, to the deadline. We do have to fill in the appropriate forms for whatever minister uh, we want to meet with, but we aren't aware of the request right now. Okay. So I would suggest fill out the form and, and get it into staff as soon as you can, and we'll see where it goes. If I can clarify, I have a meeting on Monday, for example, with community members on an issue with Vassal Lake. Um, Monday is, you know, as soon as possible. That's, that's not very soon compared to my concern here that we're already running late. Um, so I, I appreciate the words as soon as possible, but I'm not sure what that means. Well, <laughs> pretty. Director Monteith? To the chair, perhaps we can have an idea of the topics so we can have that included with the information we vote on later. I can put it through right now. If it's not, then we're wasting time waiting for information. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're not going to wait for it as okay. far as approving the ones yeah. we've got, but I'm not sure we get them in time to but let me, the next let me mention four for you right now real quickly Vassal Lake we may recall the uh, South Okanagan Conservation Fund gave a grant for 30,000 that study report uh, is, is done I asked for a copy recently and received courtesy of a copy that's one that I think we need to meet with ministry on if it's environment or, 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 or otherwise we met with Donaldson in 2019 this is further to that meeting, and it, it is significant. That's a big issue, siltation, in, in that, that's one. Uh, a second is child care. I've met with community members. We have, uh, as, as this board well knows, we have record number of building applications right now for housing. Our, our school enrollment's going up. We went from 75 up to 100, which is like a 30-some percent increase. We have 114 acres industrial area coming on, on online with jobs, maybe 200 to 400 jobs as that site gets developed. This means uh, housing demand, it also means children, families coming to community, and uh, childcare is an issue everywhere, but childcare um, 
it is an issue of concern in our community. Uh, a third is housing. Uh, we had a, an application for a housing grant on the, uh, we, have, we went in shovel ready, land is there, phase, we have a waiting list, we were unsuccessful. But housing is a big issue in our community, so that was one we were discussing. And the fourth is governance. As everybody here knows, we're uh, coming to the end of a phase one. Phase two is likely to be uh, coming. When I was at the LGLA conference and the Silva conference, I speak to many, 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 many other people from other areas. And, and uh, Paul Demina, for example, Blind Bay uh, director in that area, he cautioned me about um, transition funding, which has not changed in 30 years is you want to make sure that gets addressed it's real important i didn't even know about it before april 6 2022 but i think that is something you know if we can speak to ministry it would be timely it would be for us very timely and it's an example of uh, governance issues there's others arising uh i'd be happy to speak with legislative service manager uh and, and cao further to these issues if, if they could uh, provide some guidance but these are important to our community, these issues. Okay. All right. Director McCardoff. Thank you very much. Um, just made me think of uh, uh, Director Ulbrich, um, a, a meeting that I was attended with the school district. And, um, and I can't find the notes in here. I must have it on a separate piece of paper. But one of the things that, this, that the Minister of Education is doing is um, putting in place the fact that children who go to the school, uh, any school in BC, will be, um, will ha have allowed uh, child care to be before school and after school at the school premises. So that doesn't solve all of the child care needs, but it does help. So anybody who's at school also can get provided child care at the facility, not at a separate facility, which I'm sure will. I don't think it's in for another year. I think they're in the process of doing it, but some schools are already doing it right now. Okay. Good. Thank you, Chair. And, and arising from that comment, our discussions in our community include possibility of preschool child care in the school. So, so both. And, and that... Um, anybody who's ever had children and tried to get child care in the last 30 years knows this is not a new issue. In our community, it is one of those foundation stone issues that people maybe don't think of very often, but there is concern. Okay. I would suggest, though, you fill out those forms and get them in. As You can do that without the meetings. You can still have the forms in. Okay, moving on in the agenda to, to the next item is staff retention, CAO. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, this is not a new topic for us. We've discussed this a couple of times before. Uh, uh, for administratively, uh, we know that we're not unique in this regard, that staff retention and recruitment uh, is more or less a universal issue now. It's just that type of an economy in a labor market uh, where there's uh, a high competition for qualified individuals, uh, sort of uh, more demand than supply, uh, much like we're uh, seeing with the, the, the uh, housing issue as well. Um, but we do a lot of environmental scanning in the organization. We do SOP perception surveys and uh, we uh, do the typical strengths, weakness, opportunities, threats uh analysis when we're doing our strategic planning we do risk assessments and we've identified staff uh, recruitment and retention as as a high risk now in the organization uh and again not because we're different than anybody else but because uh we're seeing a higher than normal uh turnover of staff and if, and we are growing because of the economy uh so we're bringing lots of new staff in as well so we identified this in the 2022 business plan uh in order to uh, um, try and address uh, the issues that may make us more of an employer of choice uh, to try and uh, either slow down uh, and reduce the turnover and to make us um, uh, more attractive when we're recruiting. So we talked about it at the legislative workshop on December 4th of uh, last year. Uh, we had really good uh, discussion amongst uh, our members in small group sessions and we came up with a uh, a list of uh, 
uh, silos that we could try and address uh, some of the issues on. And then we brought back an update on that on March 17th uh, back into corporate services uh, uh, to uh, give the board an update on how we were doing. So in the report, uh, I've listed the areas that we were going to attack under. Uh, I mean, certainly compensation is always part of the discussion. We don't want to be leading in that regard, but we want to be competitive, uh, as does every organization. And uh, the market is changing uh, due to the uh, lack of supply. The market is changing with regards to local government staff. So uh, we looked at that. I've given a brief analysis uh, as to where we are. We, we took those uh, two, four, six, eight uh, suggestions that the board gave us uh, back on December 4th, and uh, we put them on a value graph as to identify what we could do quickly and where we could get the most value. And uh, we've given you an update uh, on how we're doing in that. Uh, from the quick wins point of view, uh, we wanted to look at our work environment. That's important to staff. Uh, and especially uh, during COVID when everybody's trying to distance and uh, uh, because we're in a high period of growth and we've uh, 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 attached new services that uh, the physical constraints within 101 Martin uh, were becoming a problem for us and uh, not... Uh, I mean, the, the building is old itself, so the HVAC system and the wiring and uh, all of that other stuff that goes with an old building uh, were becoming a concern as well. Uh, the building uh, is deteriorating somewhat, so that's always a concern to staff. Uh, with uh, the on uh, slot of COVID, the requirements for electronics uh, and especially electronic meetings and uh, remote access, uh, all of that wiring stuff uh, became more of an issue. The, uh, um, the growth in the economy is not slowing down, so the building calendar is still very busy, and we wanted to look at the front end. Uh, the board can see that in the boardroom, uh, because of the electronic meeting, uh, now that we're going to go hybrid, uh, offering both, uh, uh, remote access and in person, and then trying to fit the public back in. Uh, we needed to get rid of the one little meeting room that we had. So all of that stuff came together under physical work environment. Uh, on the positive side, because of COVID, uh, the provincial government issued COVID funding uh, to all local governments, and our board decided that we could use some of that money in order to identify additional space just happened that First West was uh, divesting themselves of a facility uh, right across from City Hall at 176 Main Street uh, that had a data center uh, that they were going to leave behind along with all of the equipment, um, most of which was already better than the, than the stuff that we're using. So uh, we took advantage of that and we now have leased 176 Main, the first and second floors of it. And uh, we have moved over and uh, the information services department and the finance department are now located at 176 Main and uh, they're getting outfitted over there, allowing us to do the ongoing renovations at 101 Martin Street. So as far as the physical environment goes, uh, we're working through that. Uh, renovations, as everybody knows, that's done one on their house is never pleasant for those involved, but uh, we have some tidying up to do and, and uh, still some work to do in the boardroom, uh, but we're getting there uh, on that. And certainly the new data center and the equipment uh, that we're going to be able to use for uh, electronic uh, uh, capabilities is good. And that will also allow us to address some of the security issues that came out uh, from the report after the cyber attack in 2020. So uh, that's going well. Um, the work culture communication, I mean, work culture is always important. Uh, and, and there's many variables that are involved with uh, identifying uh, work culture. Communication is certainly a component of that. So we've identified uh, that we wanted to share more information between departments uh, with staff. And we do that through our interdependency workshop. So we've doubled that. 
we've included more people in it. Uh, we get more information out internally, just as we're trying to get more information out externally as well. Uh, but staff are very interested in where the organization is going and, and uh, how we're going to address uh, issues. So uh, we've uh, well underway on that. And then uh, because of COVID, much of the fun stuff that organizations typically do was not available to us during these past two years. So getting staff together and uh, talking about us, uh, we we used to do that in a in a one day business meeting for staff where we'd canvass them on some of the significant issues with regards to the organization. Uh, so we reinstituted that for 2022, and we're going to do that in the fall. So uh, well underway on that. Um, the affordable accommodations piece again, not unique to the regional district of Okanagan Similkameen. Uh, every organization, and in fact, every uh, Every person uh, in our area is affected by the cost of housing these days, and it's a much bigger issue than just us. But we have, uh, we believe we've made really good progress on how to identify housing for uh, staff that we're trying to recruit. First of all, we're looking more locally, um, but uh, secondly, uh, we have options now. We've networked and partnered with other organizations that are facing the same problem and that may have. Uh, uh, transient housing available for short periods until uh, a new uh, employee coming into the area can identify their own uh, housing uh, availability. So we've done uh, good on those. Some of the longer term ones, uh, this is the third year uh, in our compensation uh, program. Uh, the board has uh, uh, previously uh, has identified that we should do a market survey every third year. And this was the third year. We haven't done it uh, in the last couple. So we are underway on that now. Uh, you'll be seeing that uh, probably in August, I believe. Uh, and uh, we need that in order to make sure that we're competitive uh, with what uh, other organizations uh, in our category are doing. So that is well underway. Um, and I mean, the other thing is our uh, our collective agreement expires at the end of this year, or sorry, at the end of 23. We know some member municipalities in the regional district have uh, agreements expiring this year. Uh, so we're working with them uh, to make sure that we're still um, uh, moving forward together because uh, in some ways we're our own worst enemy and that we recruit from each other. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're competitive uh, and that uh, uh, the compensation part doesn't make uh, sort of the decision making factor uh, that uh, that it should be other other components of that as well. So uh, that's underway, and we'll be bringing that into the board uh, in uh, shortly. The training and development piece is an interesting one, and you'll you'll see this when I show you the statistics uh, of our current situation. Um, we've done some uh, a longitudinal study over the last five years to see just where we are with some of the important uh, workplace variables. So training and development, we encourage that uh, in our organization. I think every organization does now uh, in that uh, many of the employees that we're getting are still uh, either getting their designations or trying to uh, move up uh, within an organization. Uh, what we found through our our uh, staff perception survey is that uh, our employees are happy with the opportunity for training, but they don't have time to take it. They feel guilty taking time off work in order to go ahead and do training. And there's some other factors involved in that as well. So. Uh, we have to make allowance for that and uh, we have to make sure that they feel safe doing it that uh, if somebody goes on training and they uh, they need to have that calculated into their work plan that that doesn't compromise uh, their position so we're we're looking at that uh, we still need to work on some of this role clarification as to what an elected official does and what a, what a staff person does and the interaction between staff and elected officials. Uh, there's high expectations out there. We know that. And uh, in this environment, sometimes it's not uh, just as as uh, uh, normal that 
uh, to meet those expectations that we have been able to in the past. So uh, everybody uh, shows up for work every morning trying to do the best they can and they get, uh, uh, if if uh, we're constantly not meeting expectations and that's uh, portrayed, then that is a, uh, a non-motivation factor that we have to take into account. And uh, we also wanted to make sure that uh, we were consistent between our nine departments as to access for training. Sometimes uh, we found that we were, uh, some departments were uh, promoting it more than others. So uh, we wanna make sure that everybody has as much access to that as they need. Um, the flexible scheduling one, uh, we've talked a bit about already, and we're going to talk more about that specifically under planning. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about that later on. Uh, but uh, the whole the whole employment shift under the pandemic uh, is now entrenched. So that ability to work remotely and to have flexibility and um, to do hybrid types of meetings, uh, that all has to be taken into account now. It's just part of uh, uh, being an employer. Uh, certainly work-life balance uh, is an issue, So, uh, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that later on, um, but that is a factor for us that we're addressing. We're working on it, uh, and then we've already talked a bit about the our Regional Emergency Operations Centre responsibilities and the impact that has on already busy staff that have to take that time away from their normal job in order to uh, make sure our citizens are safe and that we protect their property uh, and how that affects uh, the stress level of working in an emergency operations center compared to a normal uh, local government job. Um, I mean, we're addressing that by uh, trying to make sure that we train more of our staff and more people in uh, emergency operations center operations and that we give them the time to do that and that we exercise them and that we coordinate with other organizations that can support us or that we can support and there's all that networking that goes on uh, in order to make sure that we have uh, that redundancy and bench strength so all of that's going on um the other parts of it uh it's just everything's becoming more complex so more provincial standards, more local government standards, more services, uh, the uh, regulations around a lot of the functions that we do are becoming more complex. It just takes a higher level of uh, knowledge and understanding uh, in order to do that. So uh, we're working on that as well. Let me talk to you about some uh, stats that we've been gathering uh, as far as retention and performance indicators and trends, because in the end, uh, this all comes down to productivity. Uh, but looking back uh, over the last five years, so from 2017 up to 2021, um, the num just the, the sheer number of uh, turnover uh, because of either resignations or retirements, you can see that we've gone uh, from 26 in 2017 to 51 uh, in 2021. Uh, there's been some some dips, but the long term trend on that is not encouraging. So that uh, I think was initially why the uh, staff retention recruitment was raised as a as a red risk uh, in our, our risk management plan. Uh, and why we need to work on it. That just sets the foundation for us. It, it's it's happening. Um, so uh, we need to try and address it. Some of the other softer indicators that we were looking at is, is that we understand that staff have to have some time off. It, it goes back to that work-life balance uh, factor. And usually what we look at is uh, we've always tracked sick leave because you don't want people coming to work when they're sick, especially during uh, a pandemic. And uh, when everybody's overwhelmed or over busy, they tend to come to work whether they're sick or not. Um, but what we wanted to look at uh, was what's, what's happened in the last five years. And you can see that just 
from our union staff uh, that we have gone up in the, the number of sick days taken. So yes, it's encouraging that people are actually staying home when they're sick, but on the other hand, they're sick more. Uh, and whether that is a COVID factor or uh, whether there's, it's a stress leave factor or uh, whatever else is doing it, but uh, the amount of sick leave that people are taking uh, is becoming more significant. And that was only union. We, uh, we self-fund our sick leave for the exempt staff uh, until they get to that six month period where they go on long-term disability, if that's a requirement. Uh, so we don't capture that well. Uh, so we, we have better uh, statistics on uh, union. The other one is how much vacation per employee are we using? Because you want employees to be able to take their vacation. And again, it's the same thing. If they feel guilty about leaving work, they tend to just not take vacation. Uh, you can see that our uh, uh, use of vacation days per employee has gone down over the last five years, uh, which is not the trend that we want to see. That's a negative trend line uh, for us. We want to see employees using their vacation, and then that compares with the number of vacation uh, hours that are banked or paid out. We don't want to pay staff out for vacation. We want them to take it. Uh, but uh, that trend line is going up significantly as far as the hours banked and the hours paid out uh, has gone up uh, exponentially over the last five years. So that is a that's a negative trend line uh, for us, and we're going to have to uh, address it. And the reason is because employees are they believe they're too busy in order to take their time off, so they don't do it. Uh, we don't we don't want to see that. Um, we don't. Uh, we, don't, we don't track use of uh, 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 overtime hours or uh, some of those other important factors for our exempt employees because we don't pay them for it. Uh, we, we can capture the union staff uh, use of overtime, um, but uh, that's because uh, they submit it uh, through their uh, uh, into the electronic program that we, we use to pay for. But, uh, for staff, we know that some of our uh, managers are uh, are working well over the 450 to 500 hours uh, a year uh, on unpaid overtime, which again, they do it because uh, it needs to be done, but that is not a healthy uh, uh, factor either. So uh, some good information there. We know that 50% uh, of our employees are over 50 years old. Uh, almost 20% of them are over 60. And that uh, of the 109 employees that we tracked, 40% uh, uh, of them have less than two years of service with us. So uh, we've got a number of employees on the cusp uh, of retirement, and yet we have a really high number of employees that have been with us uh, only a short period of time. And again, there's there's some consequences of that. Uh, when a new employee comes into the organization, there's less productivity, not because they're not good workers, but because uh, they it takes time to orient. Uh, we don't have any entry-level jobs uh, in our organization anymore. It's, uh, they come in skilled with a designation or a certification, uh, and uh, uh, they have to learn our systems and our processes. So uh, you lose productivity. Uh, the loss of knowledge when a senior employee leaves and you and you bring in a new one, a big factor there. Uh, and not only in the job that they're doing, but in the ability to help others. So the senior employees that we're losing now uh, are usually the ones that mentor or train new employees coming into the organization. Well, we're losing uh, that knowledge base. So that uh, is a problem for us. And then... Uh, where there is those, again, higher expectations uh, that just takes some people longer to do uh, because they haven't learned the job. Uh, that creates stress in the organization, and uh, hopefully our standards are not reducing uh, because of the number of uh, new people, but uh, it's, it's a factor. So we did calculate the overtime on this over the last five years, and just uh, the regular overtime is going up. You can see we went from 
1951 hours in 2017 were up to 2434 in 2021. Uh, the number of hours spent in the uh, emergency operations center are somewhat seasonal. Uh, they're season dependent. So you can see in 2017 and 2018, those were the bad flood years. The amount of overtime uh, was significant. And then uh, the fires in 2021 uh, caused a spike in that as well. Uh, and like I said, we don't track exempt overtime well. Uh, so we don't have a good figure on that, uh, but you can see the uh, of what we do know uh, that that has gone up exponentially uh, too. So it, it's one of those work-life balance uh, things again, where somebody's working that much overtime. Uh, we're we're going to talk to you more significantly under the planning uh, committee about uh, the impact on our planners uh, with the number of evening meetings uh, that. Uh, we attend right now, but uh, that is more specific to them. We have uh, increased the size of the organization uh, since 2017. Uh, and again, that's either because of just the growth in the economy or more likely uh, the growth in the number of services. So where we take on a service like a water system uh, that just requires uh, more uh, employees on the job. We did a little bit of research, not a whole bunch, uh, as far as a literature search, um, but uh, in the United States, they did a national employee survey uh, just on local governments, which was what we were mostly interested in. And they said, uh, yes, money is important and employees expect to be treated fairly, but it's not the leading cause of uh, turnover in an organization. Uh, the Work-life balance, uh, so not only is the nature of work changing, but the nature of the workforce uh, is changing. Work-life balance is really important uh, to uh, employees nowadays. Uh, they expect to they'll be able to uh, work their time and then uh, go home and spend time with their family or do their hobbies or whatever they want to do. And when you impugn uh, their ability to do that, in, in this market, they have other options. They just leave. Um, so uh, that's something that we just really have to take more seriously. And then the other part is morale. People want to be able to enjoy work and they want to be proud of who they work for and they want to be able to come in and do their job uh, to the best of their ability. Uh, and uh, there were some factors in this United States study, like if an employee doesn't feel appreciated if they're being uh, treated disrespectfully or being abused or uh, really in local government, uh, they they termed it hatefulness of citizens, but it's really, uh, I think, more just the more scrutiny and uh, the more uh, personal some of the remarks are that come in uh, uh, takes an imp uh, a toll on public service uh, employees. In the senior levels of government, there's a bit of a separation between the public and bureaucrats. Not so uh, in local government. They're uh, they're uh, interacting with the, the public every day, and it takes a toll on them when they're not uh, again meeting those expectations. So, one of the things I learned earlier on is that yes, we have a collective agreement. So for the majority of our employees, uh, we have uh, work conditions set out by contract and they have a bargaining agent and uh, it makes it much easier on us to be able to just follow the rules. On top of that, when somebody comes to work for you, they enter into this psychological contract, which basically just says, you treat me fairly and I'll work for you uh, to the best of my ability. And it's a, it's a give and take uh, type of relationship. So where we bring somebody into the organization uh, and they have an expectation they're going to work eight hours a day, which is what their contract says, and then we make them go to night meetings uh, or to spend 15 or 16 hours a day uh, several times a week or month, in their mind, we're breaking that psychological contract and they're going to move on. Uh, and in this, in, in some, in this market, they can. When uh, the labor market isn't as hot as it is right now, then sure, they may stay with you, but they'll disenfranchise. 
uh, they'll come to work and they'll do what they have to do, uh, but uh, they won't do it as well. Uh, so the psychological contract uh, that we need to uh, follow with our employees, uh, and again, a whole bunch of variables go into that, uh, and it's not written down anywhere, but it's an expectation that they'll just be treated fairly and, and that uh, respectfully and well. And if they aren't, uh, they'll believe that we've uh, abrogated that contract. We don't see this economy uh, changing right now. We know that with inflation going up and with uh, interest rates going up, uh, that that is meant to uh, uh, bring the economy back to a, a more stable level. Uh, but at this point in time, and for the last five years, uh, the economy, probably longer in the Okanagan, uh, the economy has been uh, uh, growing exponentially and uh, we haven't seen any indication that that's changing uh, in 2022. So at this point in time, we're still very busy and uh, it's, it's tough to manage in a growth environment because you're never meeting expectations. You develop a plan and you resource for it, you get the capacity to do it, and the economy grows and you're always behind. And not only from a management point of view, but from a staff point of view, you can just never catch up and it's stressful uh, because you want to and you wanna produce uh, that good uh, service. But uh, in a growth environment, it's hard to do. In a retraction, not good for the organization or the economy, but it's much easier to manage uh, because you've always got more employees uh, than work. <laughs> so when you're going downwards, you can get all that stuff done. Uh, you can't do that in a growth environment. And that's where we, we're sort of uh, the last five years is always trying to catch up and always trying to plan in advance for where we're going, but never quite getting there because it's an extra resource uh, requirement. When we get into the Planning Commission uh, uh, Committee, uh, Chris is going to talk to you about uh, some of the suggestions we, we have, uh, some of the, the uh, activities that we're going to try and, and uh, modify in order to address that work-life balance. Uh, everybody knows that uh, we've had a significant turnover of planners in the last year and that we're still uh, pro probably not meeting that psychological contract that our planners believe we've entered into them uh, with regards to work-life balance. But uh, And there's reasons for that, and he'll touch on them. But one of the other things from COVID was now that we have these hybrid meetings, instead of one person going out to an evening meeting, we need two if we're going to do it electronically, because our uh, you, you can't run an electronic meeting uh, and also speak or present or engage in discussion uh, at the same time. So, and those professional staff that go out to the uh, planning meetings and the recreation meetings, they aren't uh, electronically uh, gifted the way that some of our IT staff are. So. Uh, when you need a hybrid meeting, you need a definite space. You need uh, the equipment to uh, engage a, in a hybrid meeting. You need staff trained uh, in order to get the equipment working and to get people into the meeting and to uh, modify it or run it uh, during that time. So not, not only do we have to send out staff to an evening meeting, we have to send two if it's going to be uh, a hybrid meeting. So just another complication uh, that we're trying to address uh, when we get into those uh, things. So interrupt you for a half a second. I uh, sure we're running short on time here. Yeah. And the next committee meeting is got a lengthy agenda as well. And this is going to require some further discussion. I think we're going to have to bring it back. And can we finish? or let you finish up at the next meeting, and then the board can enter into some discussion on this. I think oh, yeah. it would be no, the report was out, Mr. way Chair. too long if we let this roll. And 
Yeah, we can't afford the the loss there. So I think we'll look for a motion to adjourn and move on to the next committee meeting with the understanding this is coming back. So move seconded. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. I will turn it over then to Director Canoel to move on with the Planning and Development Committee meeting. Go ahead, Director Canoel. Thank you, Chair Pendergraft. Uh, I have an addition to the uh, agenda item F, a soils bylaw. Uh, with that, I'd like to look for a motion to accept the uh, agenda as amended. Uh, move Director Roberts, uh, second uh, Director Pendergraft. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, we'll move on. Item B, staff attendance at APC meetings for information only, CAO. Uh, I think it's all continuation of your discussion. So please, sir. <laughs> You're on mute, sir. Sorry. Uh, so we'll turn this over to Mr. Garish and he'll uh, talk specifically about the planning. Thank you, sir. Mr. Garish, please. Thank you. I'll just get my presentation up here. Uh, so yeah, so further to the uh, the presentation that the CIO um, just gave in corporate services, I'll be talking about at least initially here uh, planning staff attendance uh, at APC meetings and just giving some more context to the board as to the recent changes that we've implemented. Um, so again, further uh, to what the CIO was uh, advising the board, um, we are in a very competitive job market uh, for land use planners. I um, I just took a quick look at. Um, uh, the Civic Info Ready, uh, or sorry, Civic Info site yesterday, which I believe is the main site the planners usually go to for job postings. And um, since January of this year, there's already been 38 uh, postings uh, solely within the Okanagan and Similkameen region. So that would be from Asoyus up to, I believe, Salmon Arm and all the local governments in between. And for planning jobs province wide, um, again, since January, about 347. So that's private and public. Uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for planners out there uh, at the moment. And again, I, I don't want to repeat too much of what the CAO said, but um, a lot of the challenges that we're facing, uh, particularly what I'm hearing from staff when they leave is the work-life balance, uh, workload issues, night meetings, and uh, other job uh, obligations. So just to set it up uh, in terms of what the planning department's been experiencing for the last few years. So this is just some basic uh, census information that shows how uh, growth has been increasing within the valley uh, since uh, 2011, so we're on an upward trend. Uh, same goes for the growth in private dwellings. So this this would be an overall increase in numbers, but of course it doesn't capture um, redevelopments, teardowns, uh, uh, and reconstruction on the same site. But again, it's it's the upward trend, and so not surprisingly, a, apart from the COVID dip uh, in 2020. Uh, the number of applications and referrals, and I, I believe the, the committee has seen this stat before, but uh, the overall number that we've been processing has been increasing uh, slowly but steadily uh, since uh, 2014, 2015. There was that minor dip in 15, and then it went up, and of course we had the 2020 COVID dip, but uh, we've gone from about 124 in 2015 to over 300. So I think that was 145% uh, increase in the last uh, six years. So, you know, obviously the, the census data gives an indication as to that. Um, uh, also, the co contributing factors to that growth in, in applications is uh, just transition of functions within the organization. So the example I believe I used in the report was subdivision coming over to planning. And um, also new and revised permitting requirements uh, that just come through various reviews of bylaws. Uh, so the example I have here is the SDPs, uh, which for us in the planning department was a significant change in 27, 2017, going from about two to three a year. Uh, and I think we're averaging uh, over 40 uh, the last number of years. So uh, additional workload there. And of course, with increasing development activity within the Valley comes increase, increasing queries uh, from property owners, realtors, um, others, uh, you know, looking to check uh, zoning, uh, development potential, and we get that at the front counter, we get phone calls, we get emails, and we try to respond to those as quickly as we can. 
And um, the building department, uh, they're experiencing uh, the same level of growth. And of course, that spills over into planning because we zone check a lot of the, well, almost all the building permits that come in. And uh, also, as uh, enforcement has uh, increased over the last number of years, so has our involvement with that uh, particular department, uh, especially when it comes to confirming um, infractions uh, and whether they are an actual infraction against the bylaw or not. Uh, so, overall, just a, a, a greater or higher level of um, current day to day uh, planning requirements. And again, um, the board will recognize this from the quarterly review. On top of all the current applications, we also have a fairly daunting list of uh, strategic projects that we've committed to try to get completed for the board. And we're trying our best to get as many of these as we can done uh, this year, particularly before the election. So we do have the RGS review that's ongoing, uh, the area GOCP, uh, area EOCP review, the subdivision servicing bylaw. Uh, we've been working on the noise bylaw. ESDP, not so much, uh, but we are starting to gear up with our discussions with the ministry uh, in relation to their audit of our ESDP to help us with our monitoring and uh, performance of that particular permit. And um, I think that we have the conversation towards the end of committee today on the soil removal and deposition bylaw, which we've been working on for area F as well. So uh, a lot of work uh, within the planning department. Um, Again, just talking about changes over the last five years. So I think our department has averaged approximately eight to nine staff, uh, give or take at any one point in time. Um, I've got the breakdown here. We do have the current uh, vacancy within the department at the moment. And uh, in terms of the project work and uh, the types of applications that require night meetings, uh, such as rezoning applications or temporary use permits, uh, most of that workload is handled between uh, about half the department. So for the four to five staff being myself, uh, the planners and the technician. I've got an asterisk there on the technician role because that one's actually transitioned now into a, a full-time planner one uh, position. And again, as, as the CIO was indicating, we, we have experienced uh, some years of significant uh, turnover. Uh, this chart attempts to try to capture that and portray it. So we've had some tough years, 2019, and uh, particularly uh, 2021, because the, the three vacancies that occurred last year happened all within about a month um, and left the department uh, shorthanded for, for a while. And, uh, you know, also we did, it take, did take time to start training up uh, the new staff and getting them familiar with our processes and our bylaws and uh, all, all the stuff that goes with that. So uh, that, that does present a challenge. And again, some of the feedback we received is the life of a work-life balance and, uh, you know, the number of night meetings that uh, staff are required to attend. So with the available resources that we have and uh, the workload that uh, we've been tasked with, um, unfortunately, one of the ways that uh, we try to deal with that is through the, um, uh, the use of overtime hours by staff. And again, a, a large contributing factor to that is the night meetings, which I'll, I'll touch on in a few more slides here. So again, I, I've used this slide at a previous uh, uh, committee meeting, but um, I think back in April, uh, we were projecting that um, if things didn't change, we were gonna eclipse the 836 hours of overtime we did last year. And we were on track for just over 1100 hours of overtime within the department, which is totally unsustainable, uh, particularly if it's a, a, a leading contributing factor to staff uh, leaving the department. So uh, rather than continue to hemorrhage staff, uh, we felt that changes needed to be made after the most recent resignation. So we've implemented some changes, which I know the board is aware of, uh, but I wanted to go over them as uh, all of them uh, because they're not they're, 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 the change to the APCs is not being done in isolation. It's part of a suite of changes uh, that we've implemented. So uh, the first one is public information meetings. Um, we had done these on occasion uh, prior to 2017, and uh, it was generally in situations where we had complicated uh, rezoning applications or situations where we felt that um, additional input from the community was needed. And we, at the time, as some of the directors may recall, we were referring to those as question and answer sessions um, because we were having challenges at the public hearing with people like seeking additional information. Well, we, we formalized those question and answer sessions in 2017 when we did the Kaizen on uh, the rezoning process. And um, so that, that has required staff to go out uh, unintended. We had originally thought that uh, possibly more applicants would take on public information meetings themselves, particularly where uh, they engage the services of a consultant. Uh, but the experience has been that even when consultants are involved in an application, they're still relying on staff uh, to organize and schedule the public information meetings. Uh, we have tried to limit our, our nighttime meetings in relation to those by piggybacking them on the back of APC meeting uh, schedules but there's still that requirement for information meetings. So 
we've made a change going forward that um, if, if uh, applicants wish to rely on our RDOS staff to help them with the public information meetings, we're happy to do that. However, we're only going to be doing it once a month and we will only be doing it electronically. Um, and they need to let us know at least two weeks in advance. Their, their applicants are still free to schedule their own public information meetings, but uh, we're not going to be doing them every week of the month anymore. Uh, so we're hopeful that reduces uh, one aspect of the night meeting obligations. Uh, the other recommendation, which I think we've alluded to previously, is um, all recommendations coming forward to the board now uh, for public hearings will be to schedule them uh, prior to a board meeting in the morning uh, rather than have them delegated uh, out to uh, director for night meetings. Of course, the option for the board uh, to continue delegating to directors is, is available. Uh, it's just the staff's recommendation will consistently be now to have them at board meetings. Um, we've also taken steps to exclude uh, planning staff who are lodging uh, high overtime levels from the EOC uh, because the EOC also tends to um, uh, add to the overtime hours, especially when it's involving weekend work, which, uh, you know, when you're already doing night meetings during the week, uh, I think the last thing you want to do is lose your Saturday or Sunday to uh, overtime in, in the EOC. So there are other staff within the department who are available uh, for EOC who aren't logging the same amounts of overtime. Uh, but for the planning staff who are, we're going to try to keep them out of the EOC as much as we can. Uh, as the board's also aware, and I think it's up for discussion later in the committee today, we, we, we want to try to, uh, or we'd like to make changes to the number of public information meetings being mandated, mandated for temporary uh, use permit applications. Uh, again, this was a change that occurred in 2017 when the uh, development procedures bylaw was originally introduced back in 2011. Uh, the board had discretion uh, as to whether it wanted PIMS for uh, temporary use applications. Um, we changed that again in 2017 just because of the Kaizen with rezonings and uh, you know just trying to facilitate that additional public consultation. But we'd like to move back to the original intent, which is that it's not mandatory and that it's really at the discretion of the board as to whether it wants to have the benefit of additional public information meetings. And then the final one, um, which is the main point of discussion here with this presentation, is the uh, the, the cessation of uh, attendance by planning staff at APC meetings. And so the reasons for that, as you can see here in this slide, which uh, I believe is a graph uh, that I used in the report as well, is that the APC meetings, uh, based on some statistics that we were able to pull out of the WebEx software from May of 2021 to June of 2022, uh, those APC meetings comprise the majority or yeah, the, the overall majority of uh, night meetings that uh, planners are required to attend. Um, the PIMs are a close second, and I, I recognize that we try to schedule those two types of meetings uh, back to back as much as we can, but uh, that's not always the case either because of scheduling issues with applicants, uh, quorum issues with APCs, uh, et cetera. And so you can see the other types of night meetings here, public hearings and then the project work. Um, so that would be when we have uh, night meetings with say the electoral area E OCP review committee, or if we're meeting with the area G uh, OCP committee, uh, that's what those night meetings are, are, are related to. And again, here, just for interest, uh, a breakdown of uh, where we're spending most of our APC meetings. And I suspect that uh, the reason Area E is so large is because of the number of temporary use permits for vacation rentals, um, as well as the ongoing OCP review uh, that we've been doing. And so again, based on WebEx stats, uh, it, it appears to us that the APC meetings are generally about an hour and a half in length. And um, in terms of average number of attendees, just out of interest, it's uh, 11.22, and that's staff, public, and applicants, and APC members. Uh, so going forward, uh, despite uh, staff not uh, attending APCs in person anymore, or providing the, uh, the, the technical assistance for WebEx meetings, uh, we are committed to continuing to assist with uh, the, scheduling, the scheduling and publication of meeting dates. Uh, the preparation of agendas for the APCs, notification of applicants, uh, letting them know when the meetings are and how to get there, uh, the circulation of uh, the administrative reports to the APCs for their consideration. And uh, we'll also, as best we can, uh, try to answer any questions that the APCs might have uh, in writing and ideally prior to the meeting date uh, so that any issues that they might be unsure of as a result of reading our reports can be clarified uh, or adjusted, et cetera. So that's it for my presentation. I'm I'm happy to try to answer any questions that uh, that the committee might have. Thank you, Mr. Garish. As as always, a very enlightening uh, uh, presentation. I do have some concerns about the lack of staff at APC meetings going forward. Some of these can be quite serious and land use issues and uh, histories sometimes need to be answered. But uh, 
I think there are other uh, options that we may have to look at, like changing the time of the ABC meetings to, to make them more uh, in line with the staff work hours. But for the time being, we'll, we'll carry on that way. Are there any questions for Mr. Garish in, in regards to this? Uh, Director Monteith, I see your hand up. or is this up for discussion because i know my community we value apc we value having staff there not having staff there you're leaving it to myself i'm not a planner i'm trying to help an apc make an informed decision to re make a recommendation to this board that puts me in a really bad position i don't have the technology you're putting me in that position of providing technology i don't even have webex like i can't post a, a, a virtual meeting so by staff not being there, we're abolishing ABC, APCs, and our communities expect that. That's part of our consultation with our public, getting that informed feedback, helping us as a board make good decisions. And I don't think this is the right way to go at all. Thank you, Director Monteith. Uh, I, uh, are there any other uh, comments for uh, Director Ulbrich, please? And thank you to the chair, and uh, just to echo what Director Monteith has said, I've already heard back from both my Parks and Rec Commission members and from the Advisory Planning Commission members the exact exact concerns that Director Monteith just uh, identified. My, my fear, of course, is this is going to do irreparable harm to our community, to our Advisory Planning Commission volunteers. Uh, it, it may become the end of that really valuable community input and feedback. I remember uh, October 29, 2018, when the CAO at Strategic Planning said, we value and respect community and public input and feedback. This is one of our primary uh, opportunities. It, it's a mechanism under legislation for that purpose. When we, when we cancel it, we are stopping our respect and, and our valuing of that feedback, it, it does lead to that hatefulness that we heard about earlier in community. I've heard the word hate by members of this board. This board, I've heard that word, and I've heard in community as well. It's an awful word. It's an awful word, but this is what this kind of decision leads to, is more frustration, more upset, more disappointment, Staff are a resource. I remember when Ellie Mina was here, I spoke to him and, and, and I discussed process with them and roles and role clarity. Staff have a role to play. They're a resource to these commissions. I have a, I have a yesterday, well, Tuesday, so two days ago, one of my APC members, one who's been involved for a lot of years, decades perhaps, he wrote me this. He said, hi, Ron. What is your opinion regarding no one from RDOS attending our meetings? I find it ironic that we do our thing for free and can't get some assistance from well-paid RDOS personnel. Hopefully there's more to it. Now I'm going to have to get back to this gentleman with an answer. And I appreciate we're short staff. I know healthcare is short staff. And there's housing shortages, as we've already heard from the CAO. There, there is no doubt that we have a problem and we need to address it. I do see the benefits of some of the suggestions regarding uh, becoming more efficient with our uh, staff using technology. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure there are more efficiencies possible, but, but if, we, if we go too far in abandoning these commissions, um, we, we are going to have consequences and that community frustration is going to increase. And what that means is the morale of our staff is going to diminish. And we are not going to have a better outcome, not a better tomorrow. We're gonna to have an even more awful tomorrow. So I think we need to learn from from this feedback, we need to listen, we need to hear with an open mind and, 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 and work together uh, with, uh, with some, maybe, maybe some other ways of, of solving this. Uh, I, I don't know that our commissions would welcome some participation in this discussion, 
But I know my commissions very well. I sat on both of them before I was elected. I know the high quality of the concern. And I want to emphasize the word concern. The people who show up and do this volunteer work, they care about their community. They care about these issues. They really care. And, and, and they, they, think, they think that we're hearing them. They think that we're listening to them. They think that their advice is being respected. This is not a step that makes them feel more respected. This is, this is a step, I mean, I'm already hearing it, and, and, and I think the communication went out maybe last week, and I've heard three or four feedback already. <coughs> So I'm just saying, Director Monty's points were well made. I, I agree with them. I have concern. And uh, I, in the electoral areas, we're not like municipalities. I know Director, uh, Director Coyne is sensitive when I point out the differences. I want to make it clear to every, every council member who's, who's on this board, I, I respect you and I'm not offended by you. I'm just saying we are different in the electoral areas and the staff um, resource at these meetings and the advice of these commissions, it's real important. And when, when the municipal appointed directors are, are contributing to these decisions, well, I think we have a duty to pay a little bit of attention to these advisory planning commission. We don't have to rubber stamp approve anything that they recommend. But I think they, they, they do deserve the respect of, of hearing them. And I think we're slipping maybe a little bit the wrong direction here. Thank you. Thank you, Director uh, Over Director Roberts, please. Thank you to the chair. I think it's important for us to be really careful. Um, I want to be aware and avoid hyperbole. Um, we are right now respecting the needs that staff have and when we express in regards to whether or not they're paid or not um, effectively a uh, work-life balance um, we've heard from the previous uh, committee meeting and as we carry into this one uh, the fact that it's impossible for there to be an appropriate life and work balance for staff and if we want to have them in the initiation of the area g uh, OCP, you know, I've had, you know, from the persons who have initiated it, initiated it in planning, um, had a turnover of three people, and which makes it quite difficult. And I and I want to see them um, aspire to their personal successes and feel that they're appreciated and moving forward. A lot of the things that we're looking at here is not about not having staff. Uh, assistance not have not not having staff participate, but it's in a more measured and a, and a more practical way that's more sustainable. Now, as uh, board members, it uh, behooves us to come up with some other ways of providing direction for getting further staff. Maybe looking at how we do business with our APCs, because at the same time. You know, we were the ones elected to make the decisions. The APCs are the ones that are the sober, sober second thought for us in regards to as we move forward. And I think we have, we have to be really aware of that. I think it is really important that the stats that we've been shown where we're, where we're at and how hard the staff have been working to maintain um, cohesion with all our different groups. You know, and I, and I think a lot of these ideas are really good. And again, a lot of these ideas are brought up because of the crisis we're in in the moment. And as we are able to facilitate support for staff, providing different avenues and or more staffing or a different structure to how we facilitate the needs of each of our communities, uh, maybe that will alleviate it and then we can revisit. But in the meantime, uh, it's a quite a clear picture that um, what is happening and what has happened and what's going to continue to happen um, is not sustainable in its present model. And I think it's really important that we really digest the material that's been put in front of us and you know, take the opportunity to maybe think, bring things back and ask those questions 
of the CAO and kind of move forward and see what we can do um, on top of these suggestions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Director Roberts. Director Coyne, please. Yeah, so uh, Director Roberts put it uh, probably a lot nicer than I would, um, but I totally agree with what he said. Um, we all have to realize that we're going to have to make changes, whether we like it or not. We can't keep this revolving door of planners going through. And when I, when I first read the proposal that, that uh, we were going to quit having planners attend the APC meetings, I was like, holy cow, how is that going to work? Because there's lots of, lots of times there's decisions that come from the APC meetings that um, people will withdraw an application because they, they realize that it's not going. And, and redo it in a way that can work and saves them a lot of time and a lot of money with getting a rejection and having to wait to, to reapply and all that sort of thing. But on the same token, we have to realize that with the revolving door of planners, it slows everything down to exponentially anyway. So I I propose that, you know, we, we go with, with Chris's uh, proposal and let's revisit it in six months to a year and see if all of these um, disastrous negative thoughts that that uh, we're all having right now are going to come to fruition or are we going to be able to actually work through this because I think with a little bit of uh, a little bit of extra work maybe we can we can make this work if we get the agendas if we get the proper uh, information out that we don't necessarily have to have a staff member there. Anyways, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Coyne. Director Gettins, please. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Chair. Um, just sort of echoing on the past, or uh, uh, Director Coyne, or sorry, yeah, Director Coyne, sorry. Um, I, I like the idea of piloting this as well. I think it is a significant change, and it's always hard to try a significant change. We do need an opportunity, however, to discuss this in a little bit more with more time, because if we're looking at the time now, we're halfway through this meeting, we've got another four items to discuss. And I think this would be a great thing to have a rural roundtable on. We've done that one time before in this term when we had rural people come to the rural directors come talk this through and kind of figure out how to work it out. I think there's a way of balancing what we need internally with what as long as and, and serving the citizens in a way they want to be serviced as well. But I just, I think the angst, if staff is hearing angst, it's not disrespectful of your time. It's just that we value your knowledge. And so does the APC. So how do we, how do we address that and make it work for staff as well and keep the citizens feeling like they got the right information? So I would like more time to discuss this. Happy to pilot it, but um, we need to keep our staff long-term. That's very important. So thanks. Thank you, Director Gettins. Uh, Director Holmes, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just have a question. I was just wondering, uh, you know, is there any reason why APCs uh, can't meet during working hours? Uh, I understand that, uh, you know, maybe some members wouldn't work for some members, but on the other hand, it might work for other people to serve on the uh, on a committee that um, better during the day than would in the evening. Um, <clears throat> I uh, I know municipalities are wildly different than the rural areas, but our APC meets during the day. It seems to work okay. So um, just just the question of why why do they have to meet in the evening? Thank you, Director Holmes. I think that's a, an excellent uh, thing. Uh, 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 Director McCardoff, please. Thank you very much. Um, this I was on the APC before I was ever elected on to town council, so I have seen it both ways. I'm just wondering if there's um, some way to do a compromise here, and if that maybe has already been thought of. But you know, oftentimes um, there are is there an ability for um, staff to have their hours adjusted, and if there was a meeting in the evening. Um, I'm hoping that they would maybe work their eight hours, but it would be a different eight hours than other people who are um, in the office. Uh, because I, I totally agree with whatever, all of the things that have been said. It's necessary to have some staff input, but let's make it easier for staff to provide that input 
in a way that respects their time and their ability to attend these meetings. Thank you. Director McCordoff. I do I see any other uh, Director Monteith, please. To the chair, I have tons of ideas. This is super important to my community. You know, ideas could be aligning APC dates, but they're all on one day. We have area A, B, C, D, so all the way down. We have technical difficulties over at the city. <laughs> um, another option could be to, um, with the public information meetings or um, during the uh, sewer referendum, Lisa Bloomfield had a set day and times. She was avail available to be able to be on Zoom or WebEx that she could pop in and answer questions directly. You know, those sort of um, changes to me are something that we could look at that would be, you know, honoring the work-life balance, getting us to a point of honoring the staff time because it is valuable, um, but being able to still do that, that engagement with our communities. Because if we drop that, you're leaving it to directors to attend meetings. I don't have WebEx, once again, so I'm looking forward to getting my own WebEx, looking forward to my planner training, because it's all going to fall on me, and that's not fair. Thank you, Director Monteith. Seeing no... A, there's a couple in the boardroom, Director Bush and Director Obrick. Oh, very good. Director Bush, please. You want... Um, Director Holmes stole my thunder, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering why they couldn't... I mean, could be possible to do an APC meeting in the afternoon or something like that, or in the morning, or, and do it at the, the office here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Director. Uh, Director Obert, please. Yes, thank you to the chair. And I, I also wanted to thank uh, Director uh, Holmes. Well, yeah. I, the, uh, thank you. I have a lot of experience with APCs. And in our community, the majority of the members, also Parks and Rec Commission, the majority are retired, uh, but some are not. And, and so the evening meetings certainly are more, uh, they, do, they do welcome participation that might not otherwise be possible and so so there is benefit to hearing from people who are not retired uh, there, but there's also uh, it's, a, it's an interesting idea and uh, that I think this is the beginning of some good discussion on ways that uh, perhaps we can find uh, something different I, I like director points uh, uh, positive uh, forward-looking of, of change for the better uh, I think better is different and, and it would be wonderful to get some balance with uh, so, some some good outcomes and, and and address some of these uh stressors that uh, we're all facing uh the uh, turnover of the staff in that planning department last year that was awful awful and 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 of course the uh overtime hours we see and, 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 and the troubles we're seeing today, these are the chickens coming home to roost from what happened in the past. So when we look at the past and what happened, and we look at the present, which is some of the consequences of choices in the past, we, we need to have a further discussion. I think Director Gettin's suggestion is one I can fully support that we need to uh, get together and uh, kick this around a little more. I think there is potential benefit from us uh, joining our, our, our brains and our experience together and uh, seeing if we can't come up with even a better option than the one presented. Thank you. Thank you, Director Albrecht. Director Bauer, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just quickly, um, how does that uh, lightening up the, uh, lighting up the uh, workload for staff if they meet in the afternoon with the APCs, they still have the workload to do, are they done? then going to do the office work they uh, have to do in the evenings. Uh, you know, either we need extra staff or we need to make some cuts. So I think those are really the only two options. So, so Your audio is leaving us, uh, sir. Yes, sir. We've lost you all together, sir. With that, I like. I don't see any other questions right at the moment. Uh, Director Bauer, are you checking in through another medium, or 
Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? Uh, excellent. Yes. Sir. Okay. I just took my earpiece off. That does it sometimes. I don't know how far I got, but so I'm just going to say quickly again. I don't see how you lighting up the uh, um, lightening up the workload of staff. If you move the APC meeting in the afternoon, they still have work to do. So uh, I only see either you have a reduction by cutting out some of the workload uh, by not attending APCs or you hire extra staff. But again, that's a discussion the rural directors can have. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I'm not seeing any other questions out there, but I do have another comment to this. I very much value staff's attendance at these meetings are very important. Uh, the, the use of staff at, at various meetings I think very much depends on the amount of regulation you have in the area. Um, but that being said, not all meetings that I have require staff, uh, but I see some coming in the future where it may help to be able to request staff's attendance at a couple that I see that may be very contentious uh, and require some history. Perhaps that's a solution is, is requesting where needed or where felt it might be needed uh, carrying on to that, changing the time uh, so it's not a go home and come back uh, where they can carry on uh, the shift may help considerably. I would see uh, people leaving work and then coming off to a meeting as quite disruptive to their day. Uh, I would like to see this uh, discussion continue. I think there are solutions that may be workable uh, for all. Uh, staff's time at these meetings is, is extremely valuable. We can't underrate uh, how much they, they provide on certain meetings. They are definitely important to it. So uh, with that, I, uh, I think we've moved this one to an end. I don't see any. Oh, uh, Director Obrick, please. Director Canodo, uh, thank you, Chair. And I, I... Two, two thoughts. One, I agree with everything you just said, but, but secondly, a thought came to me just as you were speaking, and I don't want to lose it, so I want to share it with all the people at the board so it can ruminate and come back in a better form later. Um, we have members of our commissions who I'm sure would volunteer to learn the technology to operate. I, I know people I'm sure would do it. So there we can eliminate one staff member instantly. It's not hard, that's doable. And the members, I've gone to these meetings for years and they used to drive out to OK Falls. Well, the technology now, they can appear. We've got the smart board, it's not hard. Uh, they, can, they can show up for a 20 minute uh, participation and maybe not have a three hour uh, event where they're driving and coming and waiting and watching and leaving and driving. So I think we have, uh, with respect to Director Bauer's uh, well-stated concern, I really think Director Coyne is onto something. Better is possible. We, we can do better. We can, we can have more value for money and have respect to community. I think, I think we can, uh, uh, I look forward to having the round table that Director Gettin suggested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Over. Director Robinson, please. Thank you. Could I just get some clarification? Is it that we can't find the people to hire, like the staff, or is it more to the point where we don't have the money to pay any extra staff? Mr. Noel, please. Uh, just like everybody, we budget for a certain capacity during the year. Uh, the problem right now is that uh, we is the retention part. And uh, same with recruitment, we're getting as many applications when job postings go out. We don't have any uh, seeming redundancy to carry through during the uh, vacancies. So that's the case. Now, last year, uh, we had three planners. We only have three. Uh, we had three planners uh, all quit at the same time. Uh, so it takes a significant amount of time to recruit, then they've got to get up to speed on the files, and then they've got to get oriented, and uh, the productivity isn't quite the same. Uh, we've just recently had uh, one of our three planners uh, leave, so now we're in the same boat where we have others uh, that aren't able to maintain the evening workload uh, that we're placing on them. Thank you, sir. 
That'd be uh, Director Monteith, please. To the chair, I'm looking for some direction. I know that this is for information only, and I'm happy to make a motion. Or is this going to come back again? Like, what is the process from here? CEO? Uh, we can, uh, uh, sure, we can put it on a future meeting, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'd like that myself, too. Uh, I think this bears a little more discussion. Director Monteith, follow up? Yeah, to the chair. Are we able to add some ideas that we may have to be considered? Is that an option? I think we should leave that for a future meeting. We are really uh, uh, hitting our time constraints here. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to make it through the whole meeting if that's acceptable. No comments. I, I think we best move on uh, and plan for another uh, meeting in the near future. Uh, uh, Mr. Noel, if that's uh, acceptable. Copy that, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, let's uh, move on to our schedule of public information meetings, item C. Uh, Mr. Noel, please. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, so this is regarding uh, pub public information meetings, and we've given you some information that uh, we initially had them as being developed by the applicant, and uh, they were discretionary, and then we made them uh, mandatory, and uh, now we're finding that, uh, uh, to some extent, we're not getting the value out of them that we were, and that the uh, applicants weren't able to uh, organize them themselves, so then we had to take that over. Uh, so, uh, cumulatively, we're talking now about going back uh, to making those discretionary, but uh, Mr. Garish has additional information on that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Garish, please. Uh, sure, thank you. I'll, I, th I think I'll forego my, my slide presentation in the interest of time, but um, yeah, just similar to what the CAO was saying, we would like to go back to the way the procedures development procedures bylaw was originally structured, which is that the board would have the discretion if it felt that a particular temporary use permit proposal uh, warranted additional input from the community uh, to direct that a public information be scheduled prior to their consideration of the permit, as opposed to the current situation, which is the procedures bylaws mandating uh, that these PIMs happen for every single uh, TUP that comes in. So uh, it is putting a burden on staff. It relates back to the discussion that we just had. Uh, our preference would be to have the board uh, weigh these individually, and if you feel it's warranted, to send staff out. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions on this matter? Uh, Director Pendergraf, please. I would just move that motion. Seconded by um, Director Robinson. Is there any more discussion on this? Seeing none, uh, Director Rob, uh, uh, Roberts, did you have a hand up that I missed? It's been told to me, or sorry, to the chair, it's been told to me that my background's pretty busy, so I'll, I'll try to clean that up so see, people can see me waving in the wilderness. Thank you, sir. Um, my, my, my question was just whether or not we should make a motion or leave it to notice a motion in regards to setting up a electoral area um, director meeting for the discussions that we were saying. So we just might make sure that we have that solidified and set forward so we can expedite it as soon as possible. I don't think we can go back on that at this point, but we do have a meeting coming forward on that. We can discuss it at that time. Uh, Perfect. Thank you. So we're, we have a notice of motion that's been seconded. Uh, Ms. Mulden, would you read the motion up? I sorry about that. My mute button was not working. So, if I understand correctly, uh, this was item C. That's correct. That bylaw, sorry. That's correct. Yes. That bylaw number twenty five hundred point two seven. A bylaw to amend the development procedure bylaw be initiated. And it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. 
All right, we'll move on to item D, proposed noise, noise control uh, bylaw, CAO, please. Mm -hmm. We've been working on the noise bylaw for about a year now, Mr. Chair, and uh, we've had significant consultation. Uh, one of the, the most recent suggestions was to make it more objective uh, and to do that by using uh, the appropriate uh, equipment, which is a decimeter. Uh, and then uh, that would take some of the discretion or the subjectiveness out of it, where we just right now have a bylaw officer go out, uh, listen, and uh, make a subjective evaluation as to whether it contravenes the bylaw or not. So that is the proposal. Uh, Mr. Chair, is that we do that amendment uh, to include uh, the decimate. It's sort of a philosophical change going from subjective to objective, and uh, we're recommending that we proceed on that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, Director Gettins, please. Thank you to the Chair. I'm curious about this as far as um, if the bylaw officer has to come out and record the noise, and that's, and we couldn't, and that's a struggle. Is there any research or understanding about the apps that are available? So if a neighbor has an ongoing complaint, there's an app, I understand that they're quite um, reliable and I think they've held up in court in the past. I think we saw that when the truckers were down in Ottawa that somebody used a, a decibel to record the amount of noise in her living room. Is this something that can be accommodated within this bylaw that neighbors can record their own, their own little device? Uh... I'll pass that back to uh, CAO Newell. Oh, Mr. Garish has done the research on this, Mr. Chair, and he's quite familiar with decimeters now, so we'll turn this over to him. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see him on my uh, screen anymore. Uh, Mr. Garish, please. Uh, sure. So my, uh, yeah, we, we are aware, and I think we've actually had cases, uh, even under our current bylaw, uh, where people have submitted complaints in relation to noise occurring around them, and they've sent us screenshots or photos uh, from their phone. Uh, where they've attempted to register the uh, the decibels occurring. Um, honestly, I'd have to do some more research on that because I think the way our even our current bylaw versus the proposed decibel version of the of the new draft bylaw is structured, um, I think they all require that the measurement be taken by our bylaw enforcement officers. Uh, the decibel version ideally has them being able to do that with the the sound equipment. Uh, that we would be required to purchase, but there is a provision within the decibel version of the bylaw that says if for whatever reason either the, the equipment's not working or the situation doesn't allow for easy recording of the equipment, or I guess possibly even the bylaw officer shows up without the equipment, um, that he would still retain the ability to do it as they've historically done it here, which is just to listen uh, themselves. I mean, we could certainly use uh, any input from neighbors where they've recorded on their phone as the basis for going out to investigate. I just think the, the recording would have to be done by our staff as opposed to neighbors, but I, I'm happy, happy to look into that further. Thank you, sir. Uh, Director Roberts, I saw your hand waving there. Well, thanks to the chair. Sorry, uh, once uh, Director Gettins brought up about the app, that was what I was going to bring about. Um, since I'm one of those uh, people that tend to have motorcycles that are fairly loud, uh, going through different directions, I've used the app to make sure that I was within the correct noise allowance whilst I was backing off my throttle. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, Director McCardoff, please. Thank you very much. I probably should have asked the area director of this, but uh, I noticed that area A does not have a, a noise bylaw. I'm wondering if there's a reason for that because the town of Asuyas does, and we often get questions, but they're not within the town limits. So it causes a bit of a concern. <laughs> Did I put you on the spot, um, no. Mr. Chair? If, if I could respond to that, Director, you know, Director Pendergraf, quickly. Sure. Uh, most of the complaints we get down in Area A are to do with uh, cherry cannons, which we have no control over through a noise bylaw. So I've really not seen the need for a noise bylaw okay. because of that. You're, you're leaving it all up to me because as soon as it's outside my limits, I have to. That's it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Director Coyne, please. <clears throat> so I'm assuming that this one is going to affect everybody in the entire district because 
it's um we'd be way better off out here just to be left alone by the time anybody gets out here with a decibel reading or a decibel meter um it's always a moot point anyways we've had multiple not multiple but a couple of issues in the last what four years and it's just been a all it does is serves to to cause problems between neighbors because they think they have a bylaw that is not not functional and not uh, enforceable anyways so for my money i'd rather just see us completely opt out of this one if that's at all possible Thank you, Director Quine. Director Gettins, please. Thank you. Just as a follow-up, I think that's why the apps are an important tool, because then if the citizens can just record it right then and there, because like that happens regardless of how close you are to, um, you know, Penticton or whatever the bylaw officers are. So with that, I would like to see the research done on the apps, but given everything we've just heard about staffing and planning and workload and the fact that I think we're going to run out of this meeting before we get the update on the soil deposition bylaw, I just want to know if there's a if this is a priority enough that we take more staff to do this or like how are we working out these strategies recognizing that we've got an issue in our planning department thank you to the chair thank you uh any other questions coming on that one uh okay and from from area c's point of view uh we, we do need a little more uh, uh control over this uh, we have a number of these that become just a matter of opinion uh, and we need a little bit of basis on it, but it still allows uh, discretion on the part of the bylaw officer. So I see this quite uh, uh, as quite valuable for area C and probably all areas that are a little more uh, populated. Uh, Director Gettins, I see your hand up. Yeah, I'm just, I would just like an, an answer about the staffing and if there's staff time to do that, given everything we've just heard about staffing and if this, this is the priority we need to be working on right now. Mr. Garrish, please. Uh, a fair question. Um, I guess my response would be is that uh, planning, uh, we, because of the retirement of the, the previous uh, bylaw and the building enforcement uh, manager, uh, and also as the board would recall, the, I, I believe the noise bylaw with your uh, strategic planning session last November was uh, rated for our department as one of the top three priorities. Uh, so with the retirement and with the board setting this a priority planning uh, stepped in to assist um, to keep this bylaw moving forward. Uh, but the administration of the bylaw, from my perspective, would probably fall to our bylaw enforcement department. Uh, so it's not going to, you know, not going to affect uh, planning staff uh, per se, uh, although I, I don't want to speak for how the or what the implications might be for the building department and their staffing. Um, Thank you, Mr. Garish. Uh, any other questions? Uh, would anyone care to make the motion? Move ahead with this. I would so care to make the motion if anyone will second it, please. Not even seeing a seconder here at this point. So, oh, I see a seconder from Director uh, Monteith. All in favor? Any opposed? One opposed? Mr. Director of uh, 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 I can't make oh director uh, uh coins junior and I believe that was director uh, uh Johansson is it yeah and director coin senior See. both both coins uh, both <laughs> that's well, saying that's it. motion is passed and we'll carry on uh do we have time to attach the uh report on the soil uh management one uh you know? I believe Mr. Garish has a presentation on this. Uh, I, I believe we should give it a try, Mr. Chair. If not, we'll do it later. Thank you very much. Mr. Garish, please. Great, thank you. I'll, um, I'll try to go as fast as I can here so we don't go too far over. Um, so the soil uh, removal and deposition bylaw update. Um, just so the board understands where this is coming from, it was one of the action items out of the uh, the geotech uh, report for the West Bench that um, I believe was completed last fall. Uh, we the, the same report also recommended the uh, the OCP and zoning changes, which I believe were recently adopted by the board in relation to say, swimming pools and parcel sizes and hazard land policies. 
and the West Bench. And so with that bylaw now being completed, we've shifted over to start working on the soil bylaw. Um, I'll skip this. This just gives the background uh, legislative authority. Uh, so the service area that we're looking at is, which the board is aware of from the April meeting, is the same uh, as the study area for the West Bench Geotech report. Uh, it's currently out for the AAP. I believe that closes July 15th. As the board is aware, 10% uh, is required in order to push it to referendum. Uh, I'm not sure where that's at, but um, while that process is ongoing, uh, we've been working on the soil bylaw itself. Uh, and just just to give the board a, an update on where we're at with it, that there's, I mean, we we have no experience other than I mean I, I know there's the area B and G soil prohibition bylaw, but that that's very rarely uh, used by staff, so we don't really have very much experience with a soil bylaw. So there's a number of issues that we're trying to uh, sort through. Um, obviously, is it removal and deposition? Uh, are we going to go for a prohibition? Because uh, I believe the prohibition would allow us to do more uh, in terms of regulating and potentially stopping uh, the removal of the deposition. But of course, the prohibition uh, engages concurrent authorities under the community charter. So we would need provincial sign off on the bylaw. So staff are currently working, uh, trying to establish with the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Mines uh, what issues they might have uh, if we ask them to sign off on a particular soil bylaw for the West Bench. Um, we're also trying to sort out the applicability of the bylaw, the range of exemptions that might be considered. Um, you know, would we allow for X amount of or cubic meters of soil to not require a permit to just be exempt? Um, you know, the, the recommendation from the West Bench report was in relation to hazard lands, but you can also use these bylaws to address contaminated soil. Uh, that wasn't really part of the West Bench recommendation, but you know, it's something that we could look at. So we're sorting through that. Um, we do see challenges with this bylaw that we see with our development permits, particularly in relation to professional reliance and uh, the use of professional reports. Um, how effective could this be? Uh, but this leads back into our explore, exploration of the prohibition aspects with the province. Um, so when you start asking or looking into professional reports for a soil bylaw, this runs the gamut of uh, geotech reports, weed management plans, environmental assessments hydrological assessments, reclamation plans, erosion control. So we're trying to sort out uh, from that potential list, like what would actually be best suited for the West Bench. Uh, there's delegation issues we're working through, major versus minor permits. Uh, would the board be prepared to have staff deal with minor ones? Uh, you know, in terms of major ones, is there so maybe certain situations where the board wouldn't be prepared to sign off or approve a permit? So we're working on that. And then it was as with all of our regulations, we get down to enforcement and what can we actually achieve on the ground and what would we require of applicants to assist with enforcement. And so that's why I have the references here to log books, buffer zones, uh, posting of permits on sites. Uh, do we want to start looking at issues around um, completion reports uh, so that we know if uh, soil projects have been conducted in accordance with the permits. So uh, th those are just some of the issues. We're, we're hopeful that we can have a discussion paper to you, and I'm, I'm going to emphasize tentatively uh, for maybe the second meeting in July. Uh, but as you can see, there's still a lot of issues for us to work out. Uh, once we have that draft, we will bring it to committee. Uh, we've identified four amending bylaws to, you know, potentially the procedures bylaw, or sorry, development procedures bylaw, CAO delegation bylaw, fees and charges bylaw, and the ticketing bylaw. Uh, we would then propose uh, public um, input opportunities on the draft and then come back to the committee with everything that we've heard and um, seek further direction. So that, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. And uh, I appreciate it's uh, you haven't seen it. And I, I'm, what I'm describing is a very rough version of the bylaw with a lot of questions yet to be answered, but I'm, I'm um, happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Garish. Any questions going forward? Director Gettins, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did have a few follow-up questions because he did mention the soil prohibition bylaw for B and G. And for us to do a soil pro prohibition bylaw in Area F, we need to get the Ministry of Environment and Mines to sign it. I'm just wondering if we had to do that for B and G's bylaw, or is that something new since that bylaw was put in place? And I do have a few more questions, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garish. I, I, honestly, I, I would have to research it, but um, the area for the board's benefit, the area B and G prohibition bylaw was adopted uh, 25 years ago, 1997. So it would have been done under the old municipal act. And uh, I, I'm not sure I'd have to go back and look to see if ministerial sign off was required at that time. I think the version of the bylaw I've seen doesn't have the signature lines for the ministries, so it, it may not have been required at that point. 
Thank you, Mr. Garris. Ms. Gettins, or Director Gettins, please. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I think it would it's in, it's interesting to me that we have a, a bylaw already in place that I think would be helpful for Area F. But if there's new rules since then that we need to go get the the provincial to, provinces to sign off on this. So I understand that um, the regional district staff have reached out to the provincial staff, and I'm wondering how that is going. And have you heard back from provincial staff? Mr. Garris, please. Uh, yes, so we have, I've reached out, uh, we, we have um, uh, a contact at the uh, Municipal Affairs Department who helps us with these uh, inter-ministerial coordination of approvals and whatnot. And so I've been provided with contact details for the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Mines. Uh, I have heard back uh, from staff there, but I take it based on initial discussions that this is a infrequent uh, request that they get from local governments. And, uh, you know, the ministry is also uh, struggling with some of the same issues that we uh, are struggling with, at least in the planning department in terms of staff turnover, st staff turnover and new staff coming online and uh, just people not being familiar with this process. So we're working through it. Um, I, I'm aware that the Ministry of Mind, or sorry, Ministry of Environment is preparing comments for us, which I'm hopeful to receive this week. And Ministry of Mines is still investigating who best to respond to our queries. So that, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Thank you. Director Gettins. Thanks, Chair. Um, so this is a follow-up, and so the board recognizes that this is something that came out of the geotech report, but it also was something that I tried to get onto the business plan in 2020, but it was too busy. And then 2021, it was on the business plan, and then, sorry, and then a budget was put into place for it as well. So I just wanted to put that out because we've had discussions about getting work done without also adding a budget. So there is a budget here. The citizens that are putting up with this dumping have had like it's so incredibly stressful and they have been looking for help. They've been looking for help from the MLA, from the different ministries. They're looking for at the wrap um, reports They like, they have really been working hard here and I can't explain to you what it's like. So they live in a, in a very small cul-de-sac. I think there's 12 houses. That gully is massive. There's years, years worth of dumping left for that. There's hundreds of dump trucks coming down. It is such a stressor for this community and it really needs to be addressed and this is the only way when we when the ministry is involved and the MLA is involved all fingers are pointing back to this table to help these citizens out and it's just tensions are high and it's incredibly stressful so I appreciate staff putting in the effort because once we get through the AAP if we do go to referendum which um if that happens I don't think it will we want to do it immediately but we just we really need to get this work done so if you need help or support working with the ministry staff. Like, I'll be happy to talk to our MLA. Like, I just, we need to keep this moving because there's nowhere else for these citizens to turn. And they've been waiting for years and this should have been started earlier to be, to be not earlier in this term, I mean, previous to this term, it's a problem. And it's a problem that may very well spread to other areas once we prohibit it happening in area F. So I think it's something that we need to pay attention to. And I just want to appreciate staff because I know it's a lot of work, but if you need more, um, support with those provincial conversations, please let me know because we'd like to keep it moving. Thank you, Director Gettins. Uh, I don't know if this matters for your area or not, but the ALC also has a dog in that fight for soil deposition, but it may not apply to that area. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, that brings us to the end of our agenda. I'm looking for a motion to uh, exit the Thank you, Director Bauer, Director Roberts. All in favor? Robinson, pardon me. All in favor? Any opposed? See, seeing none, we are out of the meeting. Thank you, Chair Pendergraft. Thank you, Director Canole. That moves us on to Environment and Infrastructure Committee, and I will go to Director Gettins to chair this one. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Can I call the meeting to order at 1127, please? And if I can get a motion to adopt the agenda. First, second, thank you very much. Any opposed? Motion, oh, motion carries. Um, so the first part of is a delegation. We're going to item B. It's the Water Management Program Review. Um, so Anna's here, which is fantastic. And then I will refer this over to you, CAO. Thanks, Madam Chair. So uh, really nothing much further. Dr. Sears is available. She wants to update the uh, committee on two of the programs that the Okanagan Basin Water Board has underway. And I see uh, uh, there are recommendations uh, where she wants uh, committee's uh, uh, support on both of those. So uh, we'll let uh, Anna go ahead and, and do her presentation and, and then make sure that she uh, 
stipulates what her re her request is. Thank you, CEO. Welcome. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, as uh, as Bill said, there's two things here. I'll take each of them separately. The first one that I came to talk to you about is the water management program renewal. So this is something that happens uh, periodically. It was um, when the water management program was first established in 2006, it came with a stipulation from the regional districts that it uh, was up for renewal. At that time, it was a three-year renewal period to match the election cycle, the municipal election cycle. And then when the municipal election cycle changed to four years, it was extended to a four-year renewal period. So um, this is uh, the fifth time that I've come to the regional districts for this renewal uh, since 2006, 16 years ago, when I started. Um, the program has really grown and become, um, I think the major thing that the Okanagan Basin Water Board is known for, the many services that we provide in terms of things like flood mapping and drought planning and water conservation outreach and all the different types of services that we mostly interact both with uh, elected officials and with staff. So um, uh, th this request that I'm coming to you and to the other two regional districts about is uh, first to renew it and uh, second to renew the our to remove the requirement for this renewal process because it is quite a bit of work and uh, we believe that the the reasons for which these uh, re renewal requirement was originally put in place in terms of transparency and um, uh, giving the uh, regional districts control is uh, is taken care of in other ways and um, what I have provided is a two-page memo that sort of outlines all of these things. It includes at the end of the memo a requested revolution, resolution, and this resolution in this form is going to the other two regional districts um, in the next six weeks or so as I am on their board agendas. I've also provided um, the uh, full um, review of the program in uh, it's a uh, is it a 15 page document that kind of talks about what we've done in the last four years and then i've also provided a, a copy of our updated governance manual just showing uh, which which sections we're asking to be uh, removed to remove the um, uh, renewal requirements so those are finding the page number here for you on page uh, 13 and 14 of the governance manual. So um, uh, that is the overview. I don't have a presentation, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions about this request. Thank you very much. I'll go to the table to see if there are any questions. Questions or comments? Seeing none. Thank you. And then did you also want to talk about the asset management plan? Yeah, can I just get some clarity though, maybe from uh, Bill, um, uh, Mr. Newell. Uh, so this is the environment committee and would this resolution then go forward to the board and at what time would that happen? CAO? So typically what would happen is committee would uh, put the motion on the floor, discuss it, and then indicate their support. And then it would go in the minutes uh, out of this committee to the board at their next meeting. Uh, that's the typical approach, and probably the best one for us. Okay, and and uh, do you have a, a timing of that that um, you can share with me? Like approximate? Yeah. Uh, two, two weeks. Two weeks, okay, thank you. Uh, Director Holmes. Uh, well, so should I bring forward a motion or should somebody bring forward a motion now um, to, to go to the board? 
Thank you. Well, there is a recommendation here, but we haven't had the asset management plan discussed yet. So I guess my question is, do we want the asset management plan discussed first or do we want to make the recommendation? It is a, a completely separate item. Yeah, two separate things. Okay. Maybe our CAO can answer. So I only have one recommendation, CAO, about the asset management plan. So over to you, CAO. Yeah, uh, there is a recommendation in the report. Uh, <laughs> prepared, but apparently we didn't capture that recommendation on the agenda. So the recommendation is that the Regional District of Okanagan Similkameen reaffirm support for the OBWB's water management program under the updated terms of reference of the OBWB governance <laughs> manual, removing the requirement for a four-year renewal cycle. So if somebody wanted to move that, Madam Chair, then the committee could uh, discuss it. Thank you. Director Holmes? I'll move it. Thank you, sir. Seconder. Thank you, uh, Director Bauer, for discussion. Go ahead, Director Holmes. Yeah, I just think this is a unnecessary, you know, piece of bureaucracy. It, it's we're 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 all represent. We're each regional district has three of us on on the board, and so at ever whatever point in the future, you know, the 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 OBWB board, which is. Um, which our regional directors decides it's not necessary, we can then just, you know, deal with it at that board level and bring it back here. But, you know, I certainly can't foresee that happening in any time soon. So I, I don't really see this four year cycle as necessary at all. That's my my view. Thanks. Thank you, Director. Any other comments? Director McCordoff, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Director McCordoff. Um, thank you very much. This has been talked about at the OBWB board table. All of the directors that are that are there have all agreed that this is the way to go. It's more of a formality to bring it back to the three regional districts because we have all discussed it. We've all agreed that this is the best way to, um, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, director. Any further discussion? Okay, let's call the question all in favor. Any opposed? Excellent, it passes, thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to the asset management plan then, please. Excellent, and this has to do with an, another Okanagan-based water board program, which is the Milfoil Control Program, um, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with, but I am going to turn uh, the uh, presentation over to James Litley, who is the manager of this program, and has developed the asset management plan. Uh, the one thing that I will say is that um, the reason why we're bringing this to you is because it is in our um, in our supplementary letters patent, our governance documents that we're making major capital purchases like a milfoil harvester. We need to get sign off and approval by the three regional districts. And again, this is quite a bit of an administrative burden if we had to, you know, come back each time we wanted to buy a pickup truck or, you know, replace the crane or one of these things. So uh, what we did starting five years ago at the recommendation of the board is to develop this asset replacement plan, get that uh, approved by the three regional districts. Then we just follow that plan. And uh, that way we only have to come back to the regional districts once every five years as that asset management plan is renewed. Great, thanks, Anna. Over to you, James. Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, the purpose of the asset management plan is to just financial planning. Um, the intent is to identify the minimum annual budget necessary to meet the needs of the milfoil control program uh, while maintaining a consistent level of service. And so when I uh, redid this asset management plan following the, the previously approved five-year one, uh, one of the additions that, I, that I've recommended is um, $50,000 a year for research and development. You may have seen in the paper that we've worked with UBC Okanagan recently, uh, the milfoil control program faces a number of challenges with lakeshore development, um, increased milfoil due to climate change, uh, other issues where uh, we had access to like transfer sites in the past, some, some operational difficulties. And so we want to be able to look at ways that we can make the program uh, kind of future-proof, uh, more efficient, and not have to deal with those onshore issues. 
so that's kind of the, the only major addition uh, that's different. And aside from that, uh, the, this renewal is just laying out our capital purchases over the next five years. And what that looks like kind of specifically, um, I believe that the asset management plan may have been included in your agenda. So on page seven of the plan, it talks about the specific assets over the next five years, which include uh, two of our aquatic harvesters, um, our aluminum boat with trailer, which will be almost 50 years old at that time, um, and the OBWB staff car, and then the, the research and development uh, and equipment uh, that I spoke about. So um, I, I think that's basically it, but we do also have a requested resolution, and that's that the Regional District of Okanagan Similkameen approve the OBWB asset replacement plan 2023 to 2027. Thank you very much. I'll go to the board for any questions or comments. Thank you, Director McCordo. Thank you. I would like to uh, to uh, move the adoption of the of the ask, please. Thank you, and I've got a couple of seconders already. So thanks for that. Any comment, discussion, questions? Oh, go ahead, Director Ulbrich. Uh, thank you to the chair, and I, I don't know if this is the right place and time. Uh, my question relates to Vassal Lake and milfoil mitigation. And I, I do recall speaking with uh, Dr. Sears back in April of 2019. She was off to Ottawa to meet with some ministers. Uh, I, I really don't have an update on uh, where we're at at Vassal Lake. I'm hopeful that you've had some success in your efforts to re-engage in mitigation there, but is it possible to get an update on what's going on with milfoil and vessel? I think we can get an update, but let's just finish the discussion on the motion first, and then I'll go to that. Just quickly, is there any discussion on the motion? Okay, I'm gonna call the question then, please. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Thank you. Um, Dr. Warwick, Sears, do you have an update for Director Albrecht, please? I think you might be on mute, Doctor. Oh, maybe not. No, I'm not on mute. But... Oh, sorry, no, it's just a delay. Sorry, go okay. ahead. Um, I, we do have an update, but again, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Litley, who um, has been uh, more closely in touch with the government permitting agencies. Great, thanks. Mr. Litley? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, Vasa Lake, right now, we have a permit to operate the uh, harvesters this summer from Canadian Wildlife Service, so that allows us to operate a motor vessel on the lake. Uh, we have submitted and are waiting for the habitat officers' terms and conditions from the province. Um, we submitted that at the end of May, so they have 45 days to respond to us. Otherwise, uh, we can basically go ahead with the existing um, environmental terms and conditions, which we're aware of. And finally, I'm working with our environmental contractor to have uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, review to ensure that they have no further, um, you know, permitting requirements for us. So I'm hopeful that by mid-July, uh, for the first time, we'll have a harvester in Vassal Lake. The preferred treatment would be to do winter uh, derooting or, or the rototilling because that actually prevents the plants from growing during the summer. The harvesting is more like cutting the lawn with your bag on and then removing those weeds to the shoreline to, to truck away. Um, that's not a long-term solution, but it would have a, a number of uh, potential water quality uh, enhancements, um, habitat enhancements, as well as, of course, recreational enhancements, because if you cut the weeds five feet below the surface in July, it makes for a, a much more pleasant lake experience. Um, but to get the, the rototilling permit, which we've been trying to get for about the past six years now, is a lot more complex because, of course, you're disturbing the substrate. There's concerns about heavy metals, uh, other things being released from previously undisturbed substrate, a lot more habitat concerns for fisheries, um, as well as potential archaeological concerns. So we're continuing to pursue that as a potential pilot project so that down the road we could expand that and eventually get to uh, annual rototilling to prevent the weed from growing in Vassal Lake, or at least in a lot of places. But for now, as a, as a kind of a stopgap measure, we're uh, going for this harvesting permit, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll have it in place by mid-July. Thank you very much. Um, Director Canola, that was a good update. Director Canola, or not Director Canola, sorry, Director Albrecht, is that, does that suffice? 
Yes, it was wonderful. Uh, just on the last point on the winter program which you're working on, do you have any timeline at all on expectation on, on progress on that? Just, just I, I realize it's probably impossible to, to, to answer, but do you have a, a goal, an objective, a thought on timeline when that might uh, get? I know it's only six years so far, so what do you think about the next six years? Thanks, Mr. Lindley. I'm I'm hopeful I continue to work with the Okanagan Nation Alliance and Osuyus Indian Band. That's kind of the first um, appropriate step to take to make sure that uh, any of their concerns are addressed and that archaeology work happens uh, before we do any disturbance. Um, it's been a long process overall, uh, but one of the, the big things that's happening next year, uh, our milfoil program uh, writ large has to go for reapproval every five years through the province. And next year is the last year that that uh, permit will be in place. And so we'll have to go for uh, the next five-year renewal. And I would like to tack this uh, onto that process. We've done a, a number of, um, you know, updated mapping things and uh, turbidity studies and ecosystem studies and things like that to really enhance the position that we're in when we go back to the province. And so hopefully as part of that process, um, we'll be able to see at least a small pilot. And I think that would look like, you know, maybe derooting in an acre or, or something uh, in one year and then doing a whole lot of monitoring to see what the effects, and then if that's successful, deciding on the next year and expanding slowly. Uh, I do know and I will say that some of the substrate sampling has identified um, heavy metals in, in, uh, in the lake bed. And so if we start disturbing the top six inches or whatever, there's the chance to release these, which of course would be harmful uh, to the ecosystem and, and other things. So it's something we really have to take slowly and carefully. Thank you, Mr. Lintley. Um, Director Knold, I'm just gonna check in. I saw a hand up. Do you wanna put it down? No, nope. okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for our guests? I don't think I see any. Just double check in the boardroom. Oh, Director Albrecht, please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Chair, and I uh, uh, really appreciate the last answer, and it leads to a, a further follow-up question. Uh, we have UBCM deadline coming up June 24. I'm working on a request specific to Vassal Lake issues. My question is, is there anything that I can do to, to bring this issue forward at the UBCM? Is there anything, uh, if, you're, if you're willing to provide me something, I don't mind. Uh, adding it, uh, I did speak with Minister Donaldson, for example, uh, at UBCM in uh, September 2019, specific to this issue. I, I fear it may not have helped, but uh, if there's anything I can do to help, I'd sure like to try. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Litley. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I, I appreciate the offer, and I think um, if, if we do get to a point where we could use the help, I can certainly reach out. Um, we actually have, I think, been greeted with some uh, willingness to make this process happen, the, the summer um, harvesting particularly, and we were well in process to have this happen last year, but the lake level dropped so low that we wouldn't have been able to physically launch the machines by the time the permits were in process. Uh, so this year is a little bit different. We, we started the permitting a little bit earlier. I think everyone had that heads up from last year. I've heard back from the provincial staff already so they're aware that the that the permit is in process um, i don't think we're going to need the help it's just a matter of whether we get the permits in place uh, while the lake level conditions allow us to be in there and um, you know we also have a close relationship with sean reimer at the province who controls the lake levels uh, and in some cases they've been willing to keep the water level a little higher for a week or two to allow us to do our job so um, I don't want to sound too optimistic because it has been six years, but I, I'm I, I'm really hopeful <laughs> that this is going to happen this year. Yeah, appreciate the answer. Thank you very much, um, and thank you very much for your time and for coming and discussing with us. So thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone. Jeez, thanks. Um, the next item up for discussion is the update on the new building Canada Fund Grant, and this is for information only. And I'll just go over to the CAO, please. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, so, uh, interesting uh, program. Uh, back in 2013, the uh, uh, Canada and uh, the province of British Columbia entered, in, entered into an agreement called the New Building Canada II program. 
and it's really a gas tax program. Uh, but it was 1 of those for major infrastructure projects. Uh, we applied under that and we were awarded 6.6 .6 million dollars uh, to. Uh, bring either Skaha states. It was a phased award. So we got, we applied for both, but we had the opportunity to bring either Skaha states or Cleden into the wastewater treatment system uh, of Okanagan Falls. We uh, started out with uh, Skaha states. Uh, the estimates came back at uh, way too high to proceed on that one. Uh, we repurposed it to uh, try Cleden. Uh, that went to referendum and failed. And uh, most recently, we went back to them to repurpose for Naramata, uh, which was also doing uh, wastewater treatment and uh, collection studies at the time. We thought that may fit in, and that has recently been denied. Uh, the program was a 10 year program, uh, so that expires in 2023. And at this point, uh, based on the criteria uh, for the grant, we had no other suggestions for the board to. Uh, proceed on. So, uh, the bad news is that would just expire and the uh, remaining funds out of the 6.6 .6 million would be returned uh, into the program. Now, there's no guarantee on this, but chances are there's going to be another program uh, that comes out uh, subsequent to the exp expiration of this. It would be a new agreement between the provinces and Canada, uh, but we don't have any certainty on that yet. Uh, at, at a recent board meeting, uh, the board uh, requested that we bring this back uh, for discussion as to whether there were any other projects. We didn't identify any administratively uh, that met the criteria, but if uh, committee has any suggestions, Madam Chair, we'd be willing to uh, discuss that. Great. Thank you, CEO. I'll go to the board to see if there's any questions or comments. Thank you, Director Albrecht. Oh, thank you to the chair. Thank you to staff for the report. Um, we have uh, two wastewater treatment plants in Area D. Um, I, I looked at the original guide, 60 pages, and I had asked for a meeting with uh, both Jim Zafino and, and with Lisa Bloomfield. Lisa's been away and, and she's recently back. Uh, I'd love to meet with them both further to see what we can do with respect to possibilities. Uh, when we had the debate back in September, we had a three-day notice of the request to move the, the funds to the repurposing in Naramata. I, I, I spoke with community members at that time, and in those three days, I, I received a, a non-certain uh, offer of commitment towards a million dollars from, from local developers for a, for a good project. And, and so in terms of the funding of the uh, one-third share, uh, you know, there, there, we may have ways to do that, that, that could possibly fit that this is work, of course, but the work may be worth trying. Uh, this is 6 million that's still in the bank. Uh, I would really like to see the RDOS not lose that $6 million. Area D budget is $2.75 million. So 6 million is more than two years of our total, uh, tax base. That's how much money that is for a community like ours. If you're in Penticton or somewhere, just think of how much that would be for you. Uh, when we look at our community need, we have tremendous infrastructure need, both water and wastewater. Uh, when we look at the original grant, there was drinking water eligibility. Now, I understand that might not be a viable option, but we do have, you know, over six and a half million dollars identified urgent need for our Okanagan Falls Irrigation District System, a million in reserve. That uh, urgent need is um, um, interesting because there's lots of issues that, that relate. It, irrigation District, as you all know, has now gone through a positive uh, uh, AGM uh, support of the community, 92.5% support in the community. There may be uh, technical approvals still coming from the province. I suspect that will all flow. But my understanding is maybe not on this particular grant, but certainly on other grants, our, our Okanagan Falls Irrigation District now does qualify. That's a big step. On our sewer system, I understand from Lisa Bloomfield, we don't have a, a sewer master plan. Last year in budget, I learned for the first time we didn't have that. 
and I did approve 160,000 asked for getting that in order, which means outside consultants will be hired. Once that's back, we'll learn what we need to do. It could be millions of, uh, and then of course, this is how we get projects uh, ready for grants. Uh, we're not in a position right now, unfortunately, from what I'm reading in the report. <clears throat> but I did speak with the province on this, and I asked about our troubles with the Vintage Views Wastewater Treatment Plant, which I've spoken to at this board many times. Uh, our community right now is under a provincial Minister of Environment stop order. We have 17 home uh, lot owners uh, in, 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 in stress, thousands of dollars a month of damage to them, uh, costs escalating. Some are calling me in tears. I had a public meeting where a member of the community in anger swore at me in two different languages, which is really interesting uh, that he could do that. The, the, the point is, I, I met with Roland Russell uh, more than once on this issue. He's up to speed. We've talked about last June, I met with Roly and asked if we could repurpose this grant. And he said he would speak to Minister Osborne recently. He said he would speak to Minister Collins. He's supportive in that sense. Uh, with respect to the uh, Vintage Views Wastewater Treatment Plant, we have three objectives. One, to uh, get some help on the uh, freeze right now. Mr. Garish cannot issue a permit under that order. We can say it's not our jurisdiction, but that's not a very good answer to community who is stressed. Um, so I, 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 I joined in uh, at meetings. The, the owner operator, Mr. Johnny Angies, is collaborating. He is helpful. Uh, he is he's grateful for, for my assistance. Uh, I've spoken to him about this grant opportunity. Uh, we're going to meet next week. And indeed, when I spoke with uh, Laird uh, McLaughlin of, of the province, he, 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 and I gave him some of the history. He said that one he thought might stand the best chance of qualifying, given it's been there since, since 20, uh, 2000. Uh, it's a history of non-compliance. We have ongoing serious issues of, of compliance need. Uh, I've asked Mr. Angies for a cost, if he can give us one, because that could be a way to source that. This would be a benefit in the community. I, I do know community uh, supports the conversion, uh, everybody wants compliance. We're, we're having trouble getting compliance. Enforcement by the province, they tell me 30 to 40 months of process. I know from experience that we can facilitate quicker resolution through collaboration. Uh, ministry has indicated they are willing. They're very positive on that suggestion. The, the utility operator is very positive. Community is positive. But what I'd like to do is, is uh, you know, indeed, I'm sharing this information with all of you. I spoke with the CAO on these concerns on Wednesday, April 27, 2022, when I was at the Silver Conference in Salmon Arm. There's a long story here, but I wanted you all to be up to speed. And, and I do hope that I can meet with uh, both Lisa Bloomfield and Jim Safino further to this concern. And I'm going to see if we can't find uh, a way to put in an application. It, it, it's $6 million in the bank. I think it would be a shame for all of us if we weren't able to, to use those funds. Uh, I guarantee right, you, if we don't ask you, ask you, Brush you over it. Yeah. So you request that yeah. a set up a meeting with Mr. Zafino and Ms. Bloomfield? Because I think like we can, that'll be accommodated for sure. Yeah, I, oh, I've done that. And Mr. Uh, Zafino had COVID, had to cancel. Uh, I understood, uh, but now that I'm moving forward, we can. Yeah. Okay, that's Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. I was just going to finish my thought, but it's been interrupted, so thank you. I think I'm done. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Are there any other discussions or comments on this? Okay, seeing none. Any other new business to add for this this meeting? Okay, I'll call the I'll call it for a motion to adjourn the meeting, please. Thank you. Second. Thank you very much. Uh, any opposed? Or no? All in favor? <laughs> any opposed? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Director Gettins. I believe that brings us to lunchtime for the moment. Uh, um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, if uh, if uh, the board's up for it, we, we do have one additional committee that's scheduled for after uh, lunch. We could go ahead and do that now, and then you could take your break in between committees and the hospital board meeting. Uh, or if sure. you have a break right now, you could do that too. I think we probably, I'm seeing nods to go for it. So let's do that. 
that would mean Director Roberts uh, for Protective Services. Go ahead. Thank you to the chair. Could I get a motion to accept the agenda in regards to Protective Services? Director Gettins and Director Robinson. Thank you very much. All in favor? Perfect. Any opposed? No. Carry on. Uh, Dr. Uh, CAO. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, so at strategic planning, uh, we talked about doing a review of the emergency management program and uh, the board put some money in the budget for that. And uh, before we go out uh, for proposals, we wanted to discuss a term of reference uh, just to make sure that we're completely uh, understanding the scope of the study and that we have captured uh, the issues uh, that the board is interested in determining. Uh, but I would turn this over to Woods, uh, Mr. Woods, Mr. Chair, and he can uh, give you more detail on this before we just discuss the uh, proposal. Thank you. Could Mr. Uh, Woods speak to this? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, so um, as was set up there by the CAO, when this was discussed um, during strategic planning and ultimately budget, uh, we had a suggestion come in from the board uh, to look at doing a review. So it is timely. It's uh, the program's been in place since 2006. Uh, we did a review of the of the bylaw and made some changes to the bylaw in 2020. Uh, but certainly, we know this is an exceptionally busy program throughout the region. Um, takes a tremendous amount of our resources and time. Um, at, at a number of levels, so any review is a good thing. Uh, we always, as a rule, do uh, debriefs, uh, post-operational reviews after events to, to continue to try and get better at it. But there's some really good suggestions made related to our municipal partners and, and overlap with uh, municipal emergency program coordinators and people that are in those positions uh, within our partner agencies as well. So we went out and spoke with a few different consulting firms uh, to look at some uh, current practices, current uh, for doing these reviews. Uh, this, uh, what I proposed here, uh, what I've, uh, as, a, as a set of core objectives came from that conversation. For the most part, um, you know, what, what we would want to do is do a pretty good review of our process uh, related to the work plan, budget, uh, bylaws, but a lot of that's been done, so we wouldn't delve too deep too into too much detail on that. But we'd certainly want to do some comparisons to other regional districts and and test some of the benchmarking and best practices that's going on, because as we know, these events are happening um, uh, across the province. So a lot of our colleagues are going through similar um, exercises. Uh, we would look to uh, analyze our procedures and policies again, operational planning pieces. Just to some extent, we're pretty dialed in on how the operations occur. So we wouldn't need to get into a lot of detail on that. Uh, we'd look at the frequency and severity of our EOC activations and how that, and, and really try to get some program performance metrics out. So again, working off the best practices out there, uh, what are the things that we need to be looking at to, to measure ourselves appropriately? Uh, one step would be to look at our emergency program partners, as I alluded to, and in, in the interaction with our, uh, uh, and the arrangements and working relationships that we have with those, those partners. Uh, within the organization and and really try to ensure that we're providing the support that's needed because we heard that loud and clear, certainly the atmospheric river, which was a, a very fast moving dynamic event uh, and, and fires as well, which, you know, often take resources, but, you know, the interactions that we have and that needs to be looked at in detail so that we can have a good sense of what we can and cannot achieve. Uh, and part of that would be the decision making criteria. So when these these core decisions are being made that affect the public, uh, our residents, uh, we want to make sure that it's being done in a, a collaborative in a collaborative way. Uh, looking at staffing levels ourselves, obviously, you know, the board's talked about that a lot with the CAO lately. Uh, I'm sure that our municipal partners are in the same boat. When we get thrown into these things, we're often there for many many days. So uh, we'd want to look at again benchmarking off other organizations and. I think a big part of this for me that I've observed is, you know, we do ramp up quickly to look after these events, um, but but we can create a lot of systems and mechanisms. So looking at those and really understanding if they're needed, I think is gonna be important. You know, we can often see a dozen or two dozen people in the EOC and, you know, we wanna be objectives focused, task focused, not just sitting in the room for the sake of being there. So I think we need to do some analysis on that. We often see multiple EOCs activated. I think we need to analyze whether that's that's needed or not. 
because every time you activate and fill, it's it's more people and and people and resources are what we tend to need more of. Uh, we want to look at the uh, duty officer program. So our call our our, our system is a twenty four seven process, and uh, I know a lot of conversation on on work life balance, and so that's the same case here. When when you're on, you're on. <clears throat> so we we run a system that. Any of our emergency response teams, that's how we that's how we activate uh, our, our role is not to be responders. We respond uh, to support the site. So the site might be uh, a wildfire or an emergency service based event. So where we have an agency that says we're calling on you to provide some additional resources. What seems to be happening more and more in the province all around the province are these events that do not have a lead agency uh, landslides uh, rain events atmospheric river events as they call them now where of course fire departments and other emergency response agencies are on the front end uh, in the, it really falls to local governments to to be an incident command system model so we're finding we're needing to do that from the pointy end of the stick of course are our emergency program coordinators and and often some of our uh, operational staff so so having a deep dive into that i think would be certainly helpful uh, and then just looking at our staffing levels as it relates to what we call a EOC level uh, two and three. So that's where we think three is where we're ramped up fully, fully ramped up within the EOC 24-7 um, and, and, and doing a deeper look at that. So as the CIO mentioned, uh, Chair, we want to make sure that we're on the right track for you. Uh, we had some good suggestions made early on. So uh, we can certainly dial this back, add to it, tweak it if we don't have it right. Um, so I'll turn it back to you. For any questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Uh, any questions for Mr. Woods in regards to this? Uh, Director Coyne Sr. Can't hear so, you. Um, I was the one that brought this this up at strategic planning and then again at budget. And um Quite frankly, I think we've the, this whole procedure has totally missed the mark as far as what uh, what I'm what I'm uh, what I was hoping to see. I believe that uh, this is we need to we need to do a, a complete in depth review of the system and. Going by um, what I read and what I just heard heard uh, Mark say, I don't think this is the route we need to take. I believe that we need to number one, we need to strike a committee uh, from the board so that we actually, uh, as board members, are having some having more input into this to direct staff in where to go. Um, you know, you can you can do things a, a hundred times and think you're doing a hell of a good job of doing it until somebody else comes along and says, well, you know, if you'd opened that door first, it would have been better. And going by the remarks that that uh, Mark just made, I believe that that we need to go completely outside the box and um, and start all over again on this. I don't believe that this is is a department number one that can be run off the side of somebody's desk. I believe that this we need to have um, a manager of community services or not community services, emergency services that is strictly dedicated to emergency services. I also believe that we need to have a, a whole new culture change in emergency services. I don't believe that emergency services is um, giving supplying our constituents with the services that they believe that they're entitled to. We've never gone out in the eight years that I've been here and actually asked people what they expect. And I believe that a lot of our emergency services are direct, are managed around um, convenience of operations rather than what the actual requirements of operations are and what people expect. 
I believe there's way too much stuff goes on in the office and not enough boots on the ground. Um, now, with that, I'd, I'd like to hear other board members um, comments on this because I've been through quite a few of these incidents over here um, in area H and no, you know, we're the, we're the biggest area with, with the most rural um, areas. So we get, we have a tendency to have more, um, more issues, more fires, more, uh, you know, we pretty annually have a flood. And I think that my constituents are not at all happy with our uh, emergency services the way they are today. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to leave it at that for right now. And I really like some feedback from the board on this, because this may be something that we need to delve into at a much deeper level. Thank you, Director Coyne. Uh, is there any um, reason or support for the CAO or Mr. Woods to respond to your comment? I would really like to hear the board's comments because we're the ones that are elected. We're the ones that have to be responsible to our members and we're the ones that are supposed to be giving direction to our CAO who in turns give direction to Mr. Woods. So it's time that that the board members stepped up and said what they think. Maybe you guys are all happy with what's going on because I'm sure as hell not. So I would really like to see the other board members voice their opinions rather than just listen to me spout off. Thank you. Thank you. I see Director Oberick. Uh, thank you to the chair. And I want to thank Director Coyne for everything he said. Uh, and, and I sure appreciate your passion on, on the issue. It's, it's very sensitive and hard to speak sometimes when we have these uh, frustrations. I want to I wanna say that I agree 100% with everything Director Coyne has said. Uh, in my area D, four out of the last five years, before I was elected, this is not about me, the, uh, we had, in 2017, we had floods, we had wildfires. I spoke to staff at the time because I was on the advisory commissions. I heard their stress, I heard their frustration. I talked to the firefighters because I live in the community and I get to hear what they say. And, and, and we had another bad year in 2018. And then and, and we had, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the fellow in 17 was, uh, Oh gosh, the gentleman's name escapes me now. And then we had uh, Paul Edmonds and, 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 and so on. So 2018 again, 2019 a little better. 2020, the COVID, the, the, the computer hack, uh, Christie Mountain Fire, I was evacuated. We, we asked for a, a post-event report. The, the report didn't even speak to a single member of our community, not to me either. Uh, and I expressed my disappointment. And then, and then 2021, another bad year, and, and, and the Thomas Creek fire, and, and the list goes on. Uh, we have a pattern here. It's not the staff's fault that we have so many emergencies. It's not, it's not on them. And, and they have struggles. They have to comply with the law. And, and I just think this, this uh, review that's being suggested looking at other ways i have spoken with the fire chief association on this issue many of the members they're incredibly supportive of stepping up uh, looking at doing more recruiting bringing on trained emergency response professionals who are on call they're, they're not being paid when they're not being used willing to uh to 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 assist in community in real time when there's a flood or a fire so we have a lot to discuss, a lot of opportunity here. And I think the, you know, the motion or the request earlier today that I saw from the CAO, uh, I think the province has to step up and help us. This is, uh, and, and maybe the federal government, this is uh, a big issue. We need the help to fund a proper EOC. And, and uh, I, I spoke with Premier Horgan on March 13, 2019 at the Structure Lab. I expressed my concerns to him that day on these very issues. 
and the need for mitigation. You may remember Linda Larson was here on uh, Friday, uh, uh, November 16, 2018. She spoke to how we don't do mitigation. Hor Minister uh, Pr Premier Horgan said they were working on it. I met with Minister Conroy on March 16, 2022, with, with MLA Anderson and MLA uh, Russell. And, and she announced uh, 300 some million dollars of, of, of budget and they're, they're taking action now. Uh, that's a lot of money, but it's the right thing to do because it costs way more money when you don't mitigate and you don't prepare. That's, that's the issue here. And I think we're learning and I think probably nobody knows better than Princeton and Tulamine right now, just how hard it is on community. And uh, I just thank Director Coyne for, uh, for his for his work on this issue, bringing it forth in such a, a delicate diplomatic manner, it, it is hard. It is hard to say these things. And I just know, I want you to know, because you asked for feedback, I'm 100% supportive, 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Director Obrick. Could I, uh, I see uh, Director Coyne Jr.? Thank you. Yeah, um, the Reverend, I'm going to be surprised. I have a lot of the same issues that uh, Director Coyne Sr. has. Um, there's a lot of frustration out there, not just um, with residents, but with some of the emergency um, support teams that are um, in our area. I think when we look at this, we also need to look at the way we cooperate with with our fire departments, with um, municipalities, with ESS. Um, there's a number of agencies that we, we work with, and those all have to be part of this uh, review as well. Um, this review needs to be as in depth as we can possibly make it. We are we are in a state of emergency just about every single year, and it seems to be ongoing now. It's not just once or twice; it's it's all year round. And everything that we are told says that this is going to be an ongoing thing from here on out. And if we don't get this right, <clears throat> frustrations are going to build to the point where something bad's going to happen. And I don't want to see somebody die because we didn't do our jobs. And whatever we need to do to make this review successful, I think is what we need to do. And I don't think we need to, sorry for the term, but half-ass it. And I think we need to make sure that what we're hearing from constituents, what we're hearing from partners, makes it into this review. And it needs to come sooner than later as well. I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you, Director Coyne. Um, I see Director Holmes. Yeah, I, I think what needs to be done is each of us uh, needs to articulate exactly where we're falling short. And, uh, you know, where are those, what are those frustrations? Be very specific uh, and put those in the terms of reference for the review. Uh, I, um, you know, I, I know in the past, um, it, we we had in Summerland we had our, we had an issue with re working with the regionally and the, and the municipal EOCs working together and so I think that's a lot of that's being addressed because we identified that as a, a, ver a very specific uh, issue that needed to be addressed and and I know the CIA group uh, have, have put a lot into addressing that so I think we need to be very specific on what it is we're trying to resolve and what the problems are put those in the terms of reference because this is our this is the chance this is the only, if, if they're not in the terms of reference you can't expect it, them to be addressed so I, I think it, it, we should just all send in our send in our very specific um, issues of, of what it is that we want resolved thank you director Holmes um, I, I can also and I think a, a good portion is some of the concerns that have been voiced as well if I look to the fourth point on the post -co the core objectives uh, it states a lot in regards to the interaction, working relationships, arrangements with the partner organizations, identify areas to improve, and will support improving decision-making communications and uh, really specifically collaboration. And I think uh, the big part, as was stated by Director Holmes, that it's important for those specific issues that we feel are following that we articulate, put it down in writing, and provide it to the CAO so it can be given to the team as they're working on the terms of reference. Um, any other questions or? I see uh, Director Coyne Sr. 
So I'd like to thank you guys for speaking up today. Um, you know, this has been the elephant in the room for a long, long time, and it needs to be dealt with and it needs to include all of the, the issues that have been going on with the uh, fire departments and what we expect of fire departments and and how we cooperate or don't cooperate or whatever the case may be with with uh, all of the local fire departments and uh, their their level of involvement in emergencies. It's just one massive project. And and here's the other kicker on this that that people need to realize that um, so this this came up in November in strategic planning, then it came up again in budget. So now we here we are in June and we're gonna start to to put this out to uh, an RFP or whatever to get people to even do feedback on it, and then three to five months for that. So that means that this board is not going to actually deal with this uh, with this issue. So we need in the next little while to give really good, strong direction to uh, staff to deal with this because we're not going to be the ones to make the final the uh, vote on this of, of where it goes if we change policies or whatever. Because it, the new board's going to come in in October, and this is not going to be resolved by then. So we need to make damn sure that we get it right. We get it right now so that we can give direction. Because the way it is right now, with the, with the terms of reference that that uh, have been outlined, it's kind of to me, it's like the coyotes looking after the chickens. They don't necessarily think they're doing something wrong because chickens or coyotes eat chickens, but we need to make sure that we have um, the right staff doing the doing the uh, uh, what do you call it the review, because having the people that do the job do the review isn't objective. You try and fit in the questions in the in the terms of reference to make it work for what you got now. And personally, I need, I believe we need to throw the whole damn works out the window and start over again because it really doesn't work very well for us. So that's kind of what I'd like to see is that if we could agree to, to uh, either strike a committee or have the CAO um, appoint somebody to, to take the input be a legislative services or somebody that's neutral, that's not part of it to to be able to gather input and then come up with a with a new plan, because I sure don't like the way it operates today. Thank you. you think, uh, thank you, Director Coyne. I've got uh, Director Kozakovich and I have Mr. Zafino, who's got his hand up in regards to response. Um, could I see uh, Director uh, Kozakovich, could uh, you go ahead, please? Great, thank you, Chair. Um, Director Coyne Sr. used the words boots on the ground, and, and I think that's one of the biggest issues. And yesterday, I chaired a SILGA meeting, and um, Spencer was there, Judy, and, and the rest of the committee, and we're talking about minister meetings this September. And one of the key issues that I hear from my constituents all the time is just having some help with boots on the ground. And it's always the same response that the sand and the bags are in a certain location. Go get them yourself. And these folks can't do it. We have so many seniors and they simply cannot do it. Often volunteers will step forward, but only for so long and, and, and they burn out. But I really think we need to be looking at on the ground activities and what can we do so that something is in place to help these folks with sandbagging and, and other issues. And yes, you know, we, we don't we don't have funding for that, but that's what we should be pushing for. And we should have a list of folks that will physically get out there and do the work, even if we have to pay them. And maybe that's something that this board has to budget for. Uh, moving forward if, if we're not getting funds through the province. Um, but ultimately, if we can't help them on, on the ground to prevent the flooding, they are going to get flooded and then it just becomes the greater issue. 
And it's embarrassing for me to have to say, you know, go get the bags and the sand yourself um, to some of the seniors. So I, I think that's something that I'd like to see solved. And I don't think that should be too challenging. Uh, but uh, thank you for bringing this up, uh, Director Coyne. Thank you. I see that uh, Mr. Zafino's hand's gone down and I see Director Knodles. Thank you and to the chair uh, and uh, I, I've spoken to this matter before uh, and it's not just seniors uh, back in the flooding in 2018. Uh, we had people looking for immediate help and they had to go um, basically to uh, um, electronic format to get local volunteers to help move place sandbags in an emergency situation. So I've suggested a number of times uh, to, to our emergency services people that we start looking at a community volunteer service to, to accomplish this. Uh, I just sent an email to uh, Director Coyne Sr. on this. Uh, I did talk to uh, um, emergency services preparation people, uh, uh, Peter Pendergrass and Kyla Pepper some years ago at a board meeting about this. And they said it is possible, it is being done in other areas. Uh, so, you know, that possibly is a direction we should be looking at going. Uh, because it's not really the mandate for our EOC people is what I'm starting to see. Um, so possibly we have to, to look elsewhere to get this done, uh, but it's definitely needed. I have to agree with uh, Director Coyne. It, it's something that's absolutely paramount for our citizens. We have this service when it comes to moving wildlife or pardon me, uh, livestock. Uh, but we, it, it kind of ends there and it, it, it's a much more wide reaching thing. Um, and people do need help, be they seniors or just people who are in dire times where it needs action now. The, the resources are there, the volunteers are there. All they need is the, the organization uh, and that's, that's all we need to provide. And, and there's lots of talent available to provide that organization uh, some of them through our very seniors uh, uh, community. The, lots of them are highly experienced in that kind of thing. Anyways, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Director Knodel. I see that we have uh, CEO Newell uh, first, and then I have direct, Director Monteith. Just wanted to make sure we didn't miss uh, where we're going, Mr. Chair. So uh, I believe what I heard Director Coyne say is that uh, we need a committee and that uh, we need to expedite this, that we need to uh, get going on it so we can get underway with the study. Uh, we've sort of designated the Protective Services Committee as the area responsible uh, for emergency preparedness. So I'm wondering, are, is, is that okay to still use that or were we looking at a separate committee? Um, clearly we can't wait every two weeks uh, to meet if we want to get something done. So we'd have to have sort of special meetings of the committee, uh, which we could organize. But uh, I just want to make sure we're picking up where the next step is. Uh, thank you, CAO. Um, I, any, I, I've got right now a list, but in response to that, and I could, <laughs> if I could add to that to CAO as well as, um, I'm not sure if everybody else, but I was reached out by a third party person in through the program to access my interpretation of different things in regards to the emergencies we had this year. And I detailed quite significantly uh, the goods, the bads and the uglies uh, as I saw them and um, had good response. So uh, I thought that was part of that. And of course, as a protective service, I believe we are the committee. Um, uh, and again, we're looking at time. I've got uh, Director Monteith, then I've got um, Director Coyne Jr., and then Director Gettens. Um, and we're kind of going on here as we've uh, expanded. So any other wishes here? Do, do we want to carry on with this discussion right now, or do we need to set a different protective services meeting uh, to carry on? Because it looks like this is something again, and it is that important that uh, we can go on for quite a bit. Uh, Director Coyne 
senior just let you to comment on that and then i'll move through the list quickly well i'd i'd like to see uh, a committee outside of this committee uh, out, outside of out, outside of the protective service committee at the board meetings i'd like to see a committee struck um and i would be more than willing to put my name on that and i also believe that um there should be somebody pros there should be somebody on there from protective services but i don't believe they should run they should do that because there again i see i see it as an external look even though we're kind of sort of doing it this first portion of it internally but it needs to be um i believe it it, it needs to be a little more transparent than than having um the the service that you're looking at kind of setting the parameters for what the what the terms of reference are to look at it because that to me is puts almost puts a conflict into um how the heck is how the heck are the the two people that are left in protective services going to objectively look at what they're doing because in their mind they wouldn't be doing it intentionally doing things not what the public wants. So they're doing things what they think they're doing the right thing, but the outside people um, don't agree with that. So okay, I well, think the, we need to have I think your, your, your point is taken with that. We're gonna to try to move this the CAO. You've taken that 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 information because I, I do want to quickly go through everybody else and, and bring this to a close. Yeah, so just to clarify, protective services is uh, the 19 elected officials. Okay, that's that's the committee structure we've set up. As far as what staff supported, uh, that's completely uh, uh, a discretionary. So really, I, I'm wondering how do we get this back? Uh, do you, are you setting up a separate committee, or are we just going to organize as uh, uh, a sort of an in between protective services committee, or where which forum are we talking about creating here? Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. C or CAO. I'm just going to move down through and see, just in case there's some other ideas coming from the list that we have. So I have Director Monteith. I do appreciate the idea of coming up with this smaller committee, but I do believe that every electoral area is going to want to be on it, and as well as the municipalities, because it directly affects them. So this is the working committee to come up with those ideas, in my opinion. Um, secondly, I want to share the South Oak Province Milk Community Volunteer Center. We are getting volunteers actively looking to volunteer for emergency events. So use us. Absolutely. We have the volunteers and they're, they're ready and they're willing. So we do have a partnership there. Uh, th thank you for that. That's uh, important to know. Uh, Director Kettens. I'm fine, Chair. Thank you. Okay. But, uh, Director Canodal. Fine, go ahead. Okay, up to CAO. I <laughs> just just wondering where we're going with this, Mr. Chair. Do you do you want me to set up a, another protective services committee like very quickly and then who is ever available attends? Uh, and I can work with Director Coyne on that uh, just to get us moving. Or were you setting up a new committee? Well, I've we've now heard from director coin senior that that's he would like to see something done separately um but as uh we've stated and you've stated and director monteith that's what this group is um but i don't see any issue with being able to have you brainstorms with uh, director uh, coin senior and see if we can come up with a proposed uh other step towards what he's um asking for is is that um all right to move forward on well if, if you're going to set up a new committee that's got to go to the board and you right. got to appoint members and i i have a director trainer <laughs> you not set up like a subcommittee of this committee um to discuss um all the concerns that we talked about today 
And all of the directors that can be part of that or who have something really important to say and want to contribute to that specific committee, then they can meet maybe one time, put everything into a list and then bring it back to this committee. And then we can add that to the current list of objectives that we have um, and flush it out and make sure that our committee, the one right here, we all agree to it. That might be a way to quickly move forward with this just so that we aren't you know, spinning our wheels. Thank you, uh, Director Coinstein uh, Jr. Why don't we have a workshop from that, have a working group. The working group can then report back to this committee and then we can go from there. We can set up a workshop for, I don't know, before the end of the month. Okay, so CEO, how, how about we go with this? We'll make, make a motion, motion. we we'll do it. That we take that we, Put together a working group taken for you from the protective services. So, so I'm going to make a motion that we have a workshop on the 30th of the month to deal with this issue. Do I have a second for that? I have uh, Director Robinson. Okay, uh, and anybody wants to speak to this? Are we? Would, would, would somebody let them know I, I like I, to speak? I'm yeah. tired of holding my hand. You've got the virtual hand sometimes. You can I don't know how to do that. If you throw over it, you'll try to get your it. attention. Yeah, Director you. Ober, uh, sorry, uh, within the picture, you're set off to one side. When you put your hand up, it's off my screen, so I don't see it. <laughs> so you have to switch I, arms, I, maybe. But go ahead. Yeah, I, I wave both arms, and thank you so much. I appreciate that I'm not waving my arm the right way, so I'll work on that. Um, I, I just wanted to add to the discussion, and, and, and I, I support what Director Coyne Sr. And, and, and the motion of Director Coyne Jr., and, and I applaud uh, Director Trainer's uh, suggestion. I wanted to add to it, we can have the best of all worlds. We can have a subcommittee that works hard and fast and efficient and they can bring back to this wonderful committee of the whole, which can then add and, 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 and together, together, we can get this done faster and better. And that was my suggestion. I, I just feel so bad I don't raise my arm correctly. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so any more comments in regards to the motion that's on the table, which is to form a working committee by the 30th of this month? of this from this illustrious committee no more oh i see i own will sorry mr chair i thought the motion was to have a workshop on june 30th that's correct that's what i said oh okay okay uh all in favor all any opposed i saw both your hands there director obrick <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the, the motion passes. CAO? Uh, I think that's it, Mr. Chair, for your committee. All right. Yeah, so uh, you're at adjournment. Okay, we're at adjournment. Uh, motion to adjourn protective services, Director Robinson, seconded by Director Holmes. Uh, anybody opposed? Nope. All right, it's back to the chair. The fact that the yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, just sort of not this. So, what is it? Hey, it's lunchtime, everybody, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs>
get this idea that people have. That they one minute warning to everybody. We're going to start at 110. It's almost that now. She's there. But that whole thing. She is. It is. So let's go. Yeah. Over to the hospital district. Chair. Director Johansson. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I'll call this meeting of the Regional Hospital District to order at 1.10 p.m. Thursday, June 16th. Look for a motion to adopt the agenda as circulated. Moved and second. Any further discussion? All the question, all in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, looking to uh, staff recommendation that the May 19, 2022 minutes of the Okanagan Smoke Community Regional Hospital District be adopted. Okay, mover, move, second. Any further discussion on those minutes? Not seeing any, I will call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, we have a delegation here from Interior Health Authority, Dan Goffner, Corporate Director of Business Operations South, and John Blair, Interim Executive Director, South Okanagan. And they're here to complete some discussions that we started at the last hospital district meeting on capital planning. Do we have them online, Danny? They're in the meeting now. They're in the meeting. So we're going to go closed for this discussion. Um, the recommendation is that in accordance with Section 92B of the Community Charter, the Board close the meeting to the public on the basis of the consideration of information received and held in confidence relating to negotiations between the Regional District and the Provincial Government or the Federal Government or both, or between the Provincial Government or the Federal Government or both, and a third party. Can I get a motion to close the meeting? So move to second. second. All the question, all in favor? Opposed? We are closed. So, uh, the medical Arts Research, Donna Benson and Barb Stewart are going to present on the Rural Health Equity Research Study. I don't see them online there anywhere. It's on the screen. I see their names. Oh, I see Donna's there. Or do you ask? Hi. Um. Is Barb Are you able to share there? your screen? There's Barb. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hi, Barb. Hello. Who's going to be presenting and sharing their screen? I Barb will, will be. <laughs> and Danny has the slides. Okay. So I'd like to begin um, by introducing Donna Benson and myself. I'm uh, Barb Stewart. I'm program manager at Medical Arts Health Research in Penticton. Donna Benson is owner, PhD. <laughs> and I'd like to introduce three concepts you may know. I'm, I will be quick. I won't bore you if you already know them, but participatory action research, the first slide, Danny. Is, um, is uh, co-led by community members and researchers. It is to learn more about the root causes of systemic issues that impact our community's health. Participatory action research methodology is based on the belief that research must be done with people, not on them, not for them, with. The research is grounded in critical reflection, continuous cycles, like Donna always says, of think, plan, do. The next slide, a little bit more about participatory action research. And in this particular um, project that we're going to be introducing to you, it is co-led ABCO. Actually, the, um, the rural health equity team at UBCO, um, and importantly, PAR, we call it PAR, Participatory Action Research, incorporates a powerful and promising new form of scholarship into academic settings. These continuous cycles of think, plan, do, that's with the UBCO students, and in this way, 
participatory action research holds great potential for creating social capital. capital. Now the next slide, Danny, I'll just, most of you know all about dementia friendly communities. This has been, um, it's at the, glo the global level, the United Nations have toolkits. Certainly the Alzheimer's Society of Canada has toolkits, um, the American, so there are many, many dementia friendly communities. It's a global movement and its aim is that people living with dementia are included in all aspects of community life and that their rights are fully respected. The community members, the businesses, the organizations promote independence and safety of people living with dement dementia. And they do so by learning, by raising awareness and by working together. The next slide is ensuring a human rights based approach for people living with dementia. It is widely recognized that these people are frequently denied their human rights, both in the community and in the care homes. Therefore, the voices of the people living with dementia and those who are their caregivers must be heard from in a meaningful way. And as Donna and I are seeking funding, we're seeing clearly that any funding that we access, first priority, we hear the voices of those living with dementia. And that's what we're in the process of doing now. The next slide um, just tells you a little bit about rural health equity at UBCO. Our partner, as I mentioned, is Dr. Eric Lai. He sent me this slide. We also work with Dr. Kathy Rush on this particular PAR, Rural Health Equity Program, that I'm gonna to introduce to you now. So the, the next slide, we are proposing a PAR Dementia Friendly Community Research Project in the communities of Princeton, Headley, Kermius, and Coston. We've met with the community services societies in both of these communities and in Headley and in Coston. And um, we will be focusing on those people live, diagnosed with dementia who live in their homes rather than those who are in institutionalized care settings. So those in the community, those in their homes. Um, we will be co-designing our education series with the young adults at uh, UBCO. We have a focus because of the rural health equity to listen to the minority and the marginalized voices and to collaborate with all of the different sectors, education, health, nonprofit, municipality, business sector, the faith-based community, the media. So, those are the communities that our first pilot is going to take place in. The next slide, please. We will begin with stakeholder meetings in Coston, Kermias, Headley and Princeton. We will be inviting in the voices from all of the sectors. Um, the UBCO Rural Health Equity students and research assistants We'll be listening to the conversations at these stakeholder meetings and asking what are the assets in your community related to dementia friendliness? What are the missings? And what are the possibilities? Um, we, like I said, we've already met with Becky in um, Princeton, with Sarah at the Community Services Society in Carameas. We've scoped out places for these um, stakeholder meetings to take place in. We've made several grant applications um, to the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research is one that just went through with UBCO. Um, so these stakeholder meetings, and this is a large reason why we wanted to meet with you today. We'd like to invite you to these stakeholder meetings and that will be a first step. Now, 
as I said, listening to the voices of the people with dementia and their loved ones who are caring for them is really the very the most important first step. And we are proposing that we do that after the stakeholder meetings via memory cafes. It is a well-researched methodology of listening to the voices of people with dementia. It was, it was suggested to us, but th thanks to Sarah Martin at the uh, Executive Director at Community Services Society in Karameas, she suggested that model for bringing people together. And we've had a lot of good response to that. And I've already looked at community halls and spaces where those memory cafes can be held. They're, they're what, what is called social third places. And so what I'm looking for is places in each of these communities. I've heard very clearly, don't lump Headley in with Princeton. Don't lump Coston in with Karameas. So we're going to have these stakeholder meetings in the memory cafes in all of, in these four communities. So I'm looking for places um, that are calm, that are not overly stimulating, that of course are fully accessible, including their washrooms, um, that are places of the community's choice, and just a very calm, not a lot going on, not a lot of busyness. So, you know, maybe row 14 with people coming and going, not the best idea, although it's been offered, you know, probably not the best idea. Maybe the WI room at Coston Hall instead or something like that. Um, so yeah, giving each person with dementia and their caregiver time, space and some freedom. So that's the memory cafes. It's a model that started in the UK probably a couple of decades ago. And it, um, well, the next slide, Danny, it, um, our memory cafes will be around the noon time, maybe 11 to 2, more or less like the adult day programs. Um, but they will serve a lot of purposes for peer support, for education, entertainment. We've already got the Barry Beecroft band on board. We've got Barry Beecroft already kicking in $1,000 for the fuel to get people places. Barry Beecroft fuel distributors understand dementia very well. In fact, during my mom and dad's time there, Barry Beecroft and his, and his band, I became aware, were circulating in all of the homes playing their music, the music that these folks with dementia remember. And so his gift of $1,000 for gas to get people out to these memory cafes is a real blessing for us. Um, so we'll have food at the memory cafes, a midday meal, um, but uh, what is really unique about ours is that we're going to be bringing in that intergen intergenerational perspective. We're going to be, which the research has pointed to, that was my very first finding when digging into the research, is the personhood knowledge of the people who are 20 and 30 years old right now is lacking. So that's the personhood knowledge of dementia. Unless uh, a person 20, 30 years old has a personal experience with it, they know little about it. So we're going to be bringing in that intergenerational awareness by bringing these UBCO students into these memory cafes, into the stakeholder meetings as well. Um, then the next slide just tells you a little about, bit about the partnerships so far. Um, in the nonprofit sectors, we, we're um, working with One Sky, Better at Home, with community services societies in both Princeton and, and, and Karameas. Hopefully, with the Regional District Okanagan Smilk Mean, we've um, made um, connection already with Michael Ann Smith, um, who is the secretary of the, um, of the, the doctors in these areas. I haven't heard back from that letter yet, but on our team is also Dr. Alan Gao. Um, he's retired in Osoyas right now, but he's on the board of the Division of Family Practice. And as um, a guiding light is, is a person with dementia himself, Mr. 
Craig Burns of um, Kelowna. And he has a lot of experience and he's actually created a website called Flipping the Stigma. It's one of the best that I've seen as far as being really user friendly for giving the person with an early diagnosis and their loved ones really good information. It's called Flipping the Stigma. I don't have Craig's, um, I don't have that here on the link, but I should have put it on there. And then um, we have other community partners coming on board all the time. Like I said, just most recently, I've met with the pharmacies and the pharmacists are very interested in it. So our list of, um, of DFC PAR participants is growing. Um, the next um, slide, I'm just about finishing up here, um, is, is just a note that all of the participatory action research projects that we engage in at Medical Arts Health Research are grounded in the United Nations 17 Goals for Global Sustainability. So this, there are five of the UN's 17 goals that pertain here. And if you browse the, um, the World Health Organization's um, Dementia Friendly Communities website, you'll see this right up front. These are the goals that pertain. End poverty, the good health and the well-being, reduced inequality, sustainable communities, and peace, justice, and strong institutions. So the last slide here is um, our ask of you and, and how we could possibly um, help one another. Um, I guess our first research question is going to be from the RDOS perspective, what can be done to make these communities more dementia friendly? And then what Donna and I would ask if you would consider, please, for any, um, I know that we're looking at a Vancouver Foundation grant application with Dr. Eric Lai, um, support letters would be greatly appreciated. Um, and attendance at these stakeholder meetings would be so appreciated. But um, first we want to, we want to ask the RDOS directors in Kermes, Costum, Princeton and Headley, um, what are your concerns related to dementia right now? And you could reach out to either Donna or I and let us know how your current concerns can be expressed within the grant applications that we are making. How can we include those in any grant applications that we make starting today? Um, that's from the slides, Donna. Would, have I missed anything? Well, I... I think you might want to mention that uh, you just received word, um, was it this week or last week, about a, a grant that it was, I mean, I, I was thrilled that you were awarded it from the UK, um, from the Collaborative Action Research Network, which is a global um, network of university uh, collaborators who are again collaborating with universities and the community i think that was a huge and i think what they you know, really like in your cap they, they i didn't mention enough what they really liked is how right from the get-go we worked with the lower smilk mean and the upper smilk mean indian bands we have pauline Turbasket from ona right on board from the get-go on this but karen and this susan nofke fund that I just accessed. Yes, they loved one, the intergenerational approach of our proposal, and that we are absolutely rooted with our First Nations people here in this project. Donna, do you want to talk about cascading down and a little bit more about the goal? Oh, all right. From, from my perspective, I'm working with uh, global organizations using action research, which again, is the university community um, collaboration uh, for social change. And um, Canada does have a dementia-friendly strategy, 
And uh, what, what I'm looking at from my angle is how do we help implement that at the ground level? Uh, we have done some work with food. Again, we look at the national policy and then how does that actually then get operationalized at the provincial and then the municipal level? So again, action research is always about implementing, implementing. Um, and again, there's barriers always. There's the barrier, the one primary barrier, which Barb and I are, are focusing on is the uh, no join up. And that meaning not having that join up with government partners up and down the hierarchy. And so that's primarily why we wanted to talk to you, tell you what we're doing, because at the end of the day, again, we want to help implement um, the national strategy at the ground level. So. But we're open to any questions you you have. Happy. Yeah, I was going to say thanks, thanks Donna, and thanks Barb. That was a great presentation. It's great to hear the the work you're doing, and I'm sure everybody around this table knows of somebody that's had to deal with dementia or knows somebody that's supporting somebody with dementia. Um, very important topic and something that's relevant. Uh, you know, in, in all of our lives. And is anybody here have a question? Barbara Donna, uh, Director Roberts. Thank you to the chair. Uh, Barbara would be happy to be a part and to be at your memory cafes. And uh, one of the things that we're also looking at is I don't know, um, you understand that the city central mission is the owner of the old outward bound site or what's called now the crossing and the crossing is no longer functioning as it was at that time, but it is being maintained. And it's a large facility nestled in, in a great environment um, and that has separate cabins, also a large um, area for, for meeting and mezzanine. So it might be a very appropriate place um, since it's not up and running at the moment. Um, and uh, maybe myself and the others can see a way forward in accessing it. Thank you, Tim, very much. Thank you. Uh, director. Director Coyne. Hi, uh, I'm the director for Princeton. I'm also the mayor. I, I would suggest that you guys write a letter both to the village of Caramus and the town of Princeton asking for support. Um, you're working with the, the right people in our communities now. Um, but if you could write a letter asking support, we could probably get a letter of support. I won't speak for Director Bauer, but um, we can put it on our agendas and uh, council can make a decision to support you uh, through that as well. Thank you very much. I have sent one to the village of Kermias and I will get one to the village of Princeton. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Director Holmes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to thank you for, for your commitment to trying to hear the voices of the people who have dementia. My father had dementia. And uh, the one thing about him is that he refused to ever acknowledge that he had dementia. Uh, till the day he died, he re refused that, you know, he was fine. And so um, it would, he was invited to attend a, a number of events such as memory cafes and different studies. And he always refused to participate because uh, he, he didn't believe uh, it was for him. And, and so I, I, I'm, I'm just curious to say, how do you hear, how do you get the voices of, of those who are in denial? And I'm sure my father is the only one who, who are that. So that that's, uh, must be a real challenge for you. And I'm just curious, I guess, how do you, how do you approach that? I can tell you theoretically, um, theoretically, there's an acronym called LEAP. And uh, it's listen, empathize, agree. Although in my own experience, my partner would argue it doesn't work well. The A is for agreement and then partner. 
So that's the theoretical. Uh, in practice, of course, there's so much, so many emotional triggers. Um, you know, when you're dealing with family, it's 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 very difficult. But yes, that that is one of the. Uh, you have to meet people where they are, and that certainly um, is an audience that has special needs. The caregiver, the caregivers may be the ones that need help in dealing with that too. So, I mean, we know there's the two audiences. We have to, we have to care for the caregivers as well. So it's very frustrating, I know for sure. Um, and it's we we have the same issue in you know in mental health other mental health issues with cognition. There is I mean the part of the brain that just has no insight. And and there's a there's a name of it I don't have it at the tip of my tongue but yeah no insight is there's, that's definitely a condition. Um, Donna, I yes. wonder if you can let sure. the audience know about yeah. your work already with this clientele at Research House on Martin Street in Penticton. Um, well, I've been working with Alzheimer's patients for like 20 years. Um, but I also work, I'm a caregiver myself at home. So uh, with um, cognitive issues. So that's been since 210 so i have i have a history professional of and the family yeah so um thanks again barb and donna for bringing this presentation to the board you'd asked for letters of support so if you just let us know what grants you're applying for and when you need those letters i think that would be a, a good uh, ask of the of the board here and we should be able to provide those when the when the time comes uh, again, thanks for your for coming here today and, and sharing this important information. Uh, it, it's a worthwhile effort that you're that you're researching. And uh, I, I guess I would ask one quick question, since the the vice uh, chair of the regional district said I could take a little extra time. <laughs> the, where does the what, what do you do with the, the the information that you gather from the research? Oh, well, knowledge transfer. That's, uh, yeah, we use traditional media, uh, which would be papers, you know, journals, uh, meetings, uh, conferences, sharing academically. Uh, but then also what we've been doing uh, is starting YouTubes and having a YouTube channel and sharing. Uh, one of the things in this whole area of knowledge transfer, uh, it's being proposed now that YouTube is the best, best way to communicate. You know, it, it takes like six months to two years to get a paper published, whereas in YouTube, you know, you can do interviews with, with people and information can, can, you know, be dispersed way quicker. So right now uh, we are doing a series of speaking with caregivers on their their experience and their advice to them and their stories. Because again, one of the biggest issues is the isolation. You know, there's the isolation is, is just dreadful and, and the stigma as well. And um, you know, the services suck. So that's mm. that's one of the things that we're doing is having a caregiver series. Speaking to caregivers. I mean I was in garden works just the other day, met an old friend, and her mother has just been diagnosed. She doesn't know, you know nobody knows where to turn, right? Um, so, so that's where we hope that this series will help. And also interviewing physicians, speaking, you know, again, with Dr. Gao, getting the word out on these YouTube series. About, I mean, he's worked with Alzheimer's patients up in Salmon Arm for years and years and years. So he has a thank lot you. of experience. Thank you, so, Donna. Thank you, Barb. YouTube, YouTube is, is, that's the fastest and easiest and broadest way to, and again, it's okay. sharing the stories. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank Thanks for you. coming. Take care. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Bye. Uh, motion, to, motion to adjourn the hospital district. Move the second. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, was, I was making a motion. <laughs> okay. Welcome, everybody, again. We will call the regular board meeting to order. Uh, we have before us a proposed agenda. I would just remind everyone this is the opportunity to take anything out of the consent agenda that you want to see discussed in the regular agenda. Looking around for any hands on that. Seeing none, uh, looking for a motion to adopt the agenda. Moved, seconded. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Any opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to consent agenda corporate issues. Looking for a motion to adopt that. Moved, seconded. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Over to B, development services. Untidy, unsightly bylaw enforcement. CAO. It's all right. I'm trying to find my mouse so I could unmute myself. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, this is a motion that is already on the floor, Mr. Chair, and it was brought initially to the board in 2021. Uh, and it was a recommendation to commence enforcement uh, against uh, uh, a property in Area D. So uh, that resolution uh, was put forward uh, to abandon enforcement at the time, and then it's been uh, uh, referred uh, a number of times since. So uh, this was the date that uh, the previous motion uh, had it coming back to the board. So uh, since the motion is already on the floor, uh, it would be appropriate, Mr. Chair, to uh, just go ahead and open discussion. Okay, thank you for that. I'll go to Director Ulbrich first. Go ahead. Uh, yes, and thank you to the Chair. Um, and just to add to the introductory remarks, which I think are all accurate, um, when this came before the Board the first time, I had been contacted by the uh, someone on behalf of the property owner that uh, they had an FOI request in and they did not have a, a timely response. So when it first came before the board, I wanted to speak to a postponement and it was simply for the purpose of giving proper time so that the FOI could be received and, and then uh, give fair process to the person looking for that information. Um, in that context, I made the motion to abandon uh, for the simple reason that if I made the motion to enforce and it had been, uh, it's a negative motion, there may have been confusion if the applicant spoke to it and, and I just wanted to postpone it. So I made the motion to abandon simply for the purpose of giving the owner a chance to get a proper opportunity uh, to, to resolve this, and indeed the subsequent postponements were for the same purpose, to give opportunity. Now, I've had no update from staff or from uh, the property owner, other than what I see in this report, which uh, I, I don't know if that update is complete. I don't know if any of the matters were uh, resolved or, or none of them were resolved. I have no idea. But in terms of this motion, uh, I will not be supporting the motion myself. I think if the rule is good, it should be enforced. Um, and uh, the, the reason for the postponement was to give time to the parties to resolve it. I, I don't even know if there's been any success. So a question to staff is, has there been success? If there is, I'd be curious to hear it. But as uh, the information sits before me right now, I'm. I'm not prepared to support the motion. Is there an update from staff, CAO? In, uh, just that so we had the bylaw enforcement officer out, um, I believe it was on June 3rd, Mr. Chair, and he indicated uh, that the problem still remains. I think for us, it's more, uh, there is still the disagreement. 
uh, between us and the property owner as to whether this is an enforceable action or not. Uh, and we don't, we don't see uh, coming to agreement on that. It's a matter of uh, inviting uh, tourists to uh, park recreational vehicles uh, in a zone that doesn't permit it uh, in Okanagan Falls. So without the agreement there, it'd probably be better to get that uh, sort of independent viewpoint as to whether uh, the, the zoning is appropriate or whether uh, there is flexibility um, or... or I, so we would we would not withdraw, Mr. Chair, but uh, up to the board as to whether they want to uh, abandon it or to carry forward with the enforcement. Thank you. Go ahead, Director Roper. Yeah, a follow-up question. I'm just curious. If we vote uh, down this motion, then what happens next? Does it come back to us a different day as an enforcement report, or what would happen next? Board would probably be looking to make a different motion today, would be my suspicion. And, and if the, if they're, I don't know if they're present today, would they would be able to speak to it if it was an enforcement motion? If they were online, yes. And if they weren't, uh, you could then make the motion to defer until she was notified, they were notified. And I, that would be my first concern, is I had no idea if they had notice. I certainly didn't know until I read the report what was going on. I have no idea what they know. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? We do have the motion on the floor right now. It's to abandon enforcement. And you've heard from the director in the area. He's not supportive of that. Seeing no other hands anywhere, I'll call the question on the motion before us at the moment. All those in favor of abandoning enforcement? Okay, opposed, uh, unanimously opposed by the looks of it, unless I'm missing anybody. I'm not gonna read out all the names, I'll call it unanimous. Is there another motion that the board would like to make, Director Holbrook? Well, I, I think in the circumstance, and thank you for the guidance a moment ago, I think the, I would make the motion to enforce that was before us in the first instance, and then, uh, after it's second, that I would move to postpone. Uh, Let's to, see if she's on or there on online. Line. Sure, After sure. that, okay. So yeah, you're making the motion, second it. Yeah. With that motion, then that does give us the opportunity to ask the individual if they are online and give them the opportunity to speak to this. I cannot see them. Is there anybody online, Danny? That you're seeing. I'm seeing one raise her hand. I'm trying to identify the name. It would be Walker, I believe. Okay, not seeing them one. So, would you want to make that motion to defer and I, until they're notified? Yes, thank you, Chair. I think that's the, 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 the right thing to do here is to make the motion to defer. Okay, motion is made. A seconder for that. Thank you. No discussion on deferral, so call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. That brings us over to item C. Development variance in electoral area A, CAO. There we go. Uh, so this is an application for a variance permit uh, at uh, 2,285th Street in Area A, just outside of Soyuz, and it's uh, to vary the front yard setback from 7.5 meters to 1.8 meters, uh, basically for the purpose of constructing a swimming pool in the front yard. So it does take it very close to the street, and uh, there are fencing requirements that go along with a pool. Uh, so uh, we were uh, recommending that this application be denied, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, from my perspective, I would ask the board that we could send this to my APC just for further discussion. So that would be the motion I would ask. Moved, seconded, thank you. Any discussion on that? Seeing no hands, but CAO? Uh, I, I know that, 
so this is confusing, but we should have a motion on the floor and then have it referred to the APC. Okay. And I don't believe there was a motion on the floor, Mr. Chair. That's what I was doing. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not prepared to make the motion to deny it. Uh, I'll make the motion then. I would just make the motion that it's sent oh, to my area APC yeah. without a okay. commitment. <laughs> Point of order, there was a motion on the floor because I seconded yeah. it. Yeah. What was the to motion? To send it to the APC. Just straight. to send it straight to the APC. Exactly. Katie, this is rural. Yeah, it would be a rural vote, I believe. Oops. Any further discussion? Seeing no hands, call the question. All those in favor, thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item C2, uh, temporary use permit, request to resubmit, CAO. This was an application that came before the board on May 5th, and it was for a vacation rental at Vassaw Lake, uh, and the uh, application was denied. Uh, there is provision uh, in the Local Government Act and uh, uh, subsequently in our Development Procedures Bylaw uh, uh, for uh, somebody who's had an application denied to appeal the reapplication period. So in the, in the Development Procedures Bylaw, there's uh, a one-year waiting period before uh, an applicant can reapply uh, for the same uh, use. So in this case, the applicant is appealing to the board to waive that one year reapplication period. And the basis for that, and I, I believe the board's had uh, uh, some information that's been sent out to them by the applicant. But the, uh, the rationale is that uh, the applicant felt there was some inconsistencies uh, during the discussion on May 5th where uh, it should be, and he was, he was interested in a reconsideration, but was too late in, in the, uh, bringing forward his request for a reconsideration. So that is off the table, but there is this one year waiting period that he wants to appeal. So that is what's before the, before the board today is just whether to waive the one year reapplication period. It's not the issue if the board were to waive the one year period, the issue would come back if the applicant reapplied. But that is not uh, the content of the discussion today. It's just the one year period. And uh, it was based on the applicant's uh, belief that he wasn't given a fair opportunity the first time, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. So direction from the board on this. This is just, are we prepared to waive that one year waiting period. Director O'Rourke. I, I had two questions and the first is uh, if this is, is not, uh, if this motion to waive is, it fails, um, how long would they have to wait? I, I don't know, though, I understand one year, but is it one year from May 5th or one year from a different date? I'm curious when the one year uh, date uh, would be. And then my second question is, how long does a reapplication process take once it's begun? CAO? Uh, the one year period would start uh, uh, from the date that the application was denied. Yes. And uh, the reapplication process, it, um, it's a matter of doing the uh, advertising and so the notifications, uh, you know, just ballpark probably a couple of months. Okay, thank you. So direction on this. Director Obrick? Uh, uh, I'll make a motion to deny the request and if it's seconded, I'll speak to it and then I look forward to board uh, discussion and input on the whole motion. Okay, there's a motion moved. Is there a seconder for that? Seconded? Discussion on it. Director Obrick? And, and thank you. I'll, I'll speak first, Mr. Chair, and 
I think we've all seen the materials. Uh, I think the, uh, the applicant has raised a lot of interesting questions. And I know this was uh, one that when it came before us, we had a real strong community uh, concern raised in opposition. Uh, there's a history acknowledged of not uh, having a permit and doing it for many years. Uh, and in that context, we had a, a lot of uh, people not happy. So the idea of the, of the TUP, the first period, is a trial. So if you have people not happy, in theory, it, it doesn't get renewed. And with respect to some of the specific points raised, I just want to speak to a couple of them quickly because I, I do appreciate the passion of the applicant, and they may believe these things are accurate, but they may not be accurate. The, the notion of double hearsay, for example. The question put was to the applicant and they answered. The fact that somebody else said something to somebody else is not the point. They, they, they were asked and they said no. Uh, so there was no double hearsay. The idea that I failed to advise the board, well indeed the written materials indicated that the Advisory Planning Commission indeed had supported this. So, so there was no failure for this board to be notified of the APC. When we look at the more technical concerns, and I think here the applicant has a really good point. The applicant uh, indicates that they didn't have understanding of the uh, neighbor's concerns. And, 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 and they talk about the links uh, and, and how the um, the website was confusing and how they didn't know and how they felt they didn't have a fair chance to speak to those concerns. And of course, they spoke on the day of, of, of the, uh, when the motion happened on May 5th, but it, it appears to me they, they felt surprised by some of that. They didn't know. Now, what they did and didn't know in the history of their community, we could debate all day long, but, but I think what's clear and what I've understood from our concern is that our website and our process maybe needs to be reviewed. And I, I know our uh, bylaw review is going to take years, but those are little things to go on the checklist. Maybe we can do better. Uh, maybe sooner we can do better on those issues. Um, with respect to, uh, there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a possible misunderstanding. There's a reference to the matter that was before the board, not this one, and it had to do with the issue of the bylaw itself being reviewed and amended. And, and, and the discussion, for those who don't remember, was uh, staff didn't have time this year, and so it couldn't even start until 2023. And, and there seems to be some uh, confusion that that somehow is inconsistent with the board's decision, which is discretionary in that, at, 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 on that application, there, there was no change of policy, I don't think, by virtue of the decision. So those little technical things I want to just bring to the attention of the board, and, and I, I welcome everybody's input on this. I, I, I don't know um, when we should and when we should not waive. I've never seen an application like this before us before. I think the obvious concern is we have to be pretty careful when we waive these things or it'll become an automatic step on everyone that there'll be a request to waive and, and reapply. We could be doing this every month and a half on, on one property alone because if it's denied, you just ask to waive and waive and reapply. I, I don't know what that is. So that's something that when the bylaw gets reviewed, we should put that on the list also. Thank you. Okay. I was remiss, since this is a motion to deny, then we actually should be asking the applicant to speak to it. So if they are online, I will give them that opportunity to do that now, to address the board briefly. I cannot see anybody there. Danny, is there anyone? Uh, hello, my name is Grant Temple. Can you hear me? Hey, yes, we can. Go ahead. Excellent. Please, Thank Temple. you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Grant Temple, and my wife, uh, Michelle McCreevy, is with me as well. And uh, first of all, we'd like to thank the board for giving us the opportunity to speak regarding the application to waive the permit timeline. Um, 
what we want to make clear is that this vote is simply whether there was procedural abnormalities. We only want a fair chance to discuss real concerns and either pose options or challenge uh, the validity of some of the statements that were made. Um, everyone at this point, because uh, I've heard uh, Director Over just mention it, everyone at this point has already reviewed our lawyer Ian Aikenhead QC's legal opinions, specifically discussing procedures uh, with no conjecture. Uh, this is not a lay vendetta based opinion. It is an opinion based on legal precedents, and that's why we asked him to look through it and review it. On March 8th, we began the TUP process in an attempt to legalize our existing vacation rental with the supportive help of the RDOS staff. We were able to comply with all of the requirements necessary to submit the temporary use permit. The staff advised us that there would be two meetings and they gave us the times and the dates. However, nowhere in any of their emails or in any of their verbal communications did they ever indicate to us that there was a location called representations that would hold the letters concerning, uh, or letting us know that there were any concerns for our upcoming meetings. So that's our first uh, point. We didn't know about the letters because the staff did not inform us that there was a location for letters or even that there was. The first meeting we attended was with the APC, which Director Obrick has just mentioned. Um, I, I have read through the information regarding that. It is important to note that, especially given the fact that this commission is part of a public consultation process, it should be made worthy that they supported it 100%. We had to go through lots of discussions with them. They asked us lots of questions and they supported it, but that wasn't also mentioned or brought forward during the May 5th meeting. We then participated at the May 5th meeting in good faith, expecting if there were any issues, we would be given an opportunity to deal with them. Director Obrick moved to deny that uh, what the staff and the APC recommendations uh, had put out and giving us no reason at all what his purpose for denying it was. We were then given an opportunity to speak, as he just mentioned, but having not been told why there was uh, a motion to deny, we simply spoke about our retirement plans, custodial obligations, the intentions to follow all of the RDOS regulations, and we did not address any issues because we were not told of any issues. Director Obrick then went on about the renovation of our deck, which he did again without a permit, which um, had no and still does have not have any relevance to the TUP application. He accused us of making a statement. Uh, it was easier to seek forgiveness and then ask for permission. We denied that and he repeated it again, which we feel defamed our character. This statement, and it has been confirmed by Director Obrick because we met with him, that it is double hearsay because it came from several locations. I met with Director Obrick because we felt he did not have all the facts. So to be respectful, we went to him first, and that's why we missed this uh, next board meeting that you are supposed to come and bring it forward. So we weren't allowed to have it reconsidered because we were trying to do the right thing. We were trying to get Director Obrick to see that there might have been some issues that he should have been aware of. During the May 5th meeting, the chair interrupted Director Obrick's line of questioning, stating they were not relevant to the TUP application before the board, but that the damage was already done at that point. The chair then asked for discussions. It is crucial at this point to note that not one board member asked any questions or indicated there were concerns over any of the specific issues. That leaves us again in the dark about what the denial was based on. Director Obrick simply asked the board to pay attention to the obligation or to the objections of a few complaint letters, never stating any of the objections. At this point, we were placed on mute, which is unfortunate the way the situation works, but I understand as a board, you have to control the, the speakers, but we were placed on mute. Once he started talking about letters and objections, we could not even ask, what are you talking about? I was typing on the side palette asking, what is he referring to? Are we allowed to talk? We were not given any opportunity to ask what the letters were or what they were regarding. Now I know 
Director Ulbrich just mentioned again that, you know, this is something that we should be well aware of, but I'm sorry, if you don't apply for these things on a regular basis, it is not easy to find the, um, the to find the links. Had I been aware of any issue, even by the board discussing them, then I would have been easily been able to have a rebuttal. With no discussion about the actual permit, the chair moved to have the vote and it was denied. Being muted with no option to inquire sealed our fate. This truly is an unfair way of determining the truth in this matter. I subsequently called the RDOS staff following the following day to ask where could I find the letters and ask if they could tell me why they didn't apprise me of this information, why I was not let notice of this. And I'll quote one of their emails, uh, not giving the names, of course. My apologies for not sending you a direct link to your application. Instructions on how to get to the webpage were sent in a letter dated March 22nd. However, generally, I all also provide a direct link in an email, and I apologize for the oversight on this occasion. If you did not know to look for them, and they're referring to the letters, I understand how they could be missed. Now, RDOS did send us a letter, and in that March 22nd letter, it states additional information regarding this TUP application can be found, and it provides a URL. Once you get to that web page, there are multiple links, and the word representations is the one where you find the letters of concern. For somebody who doesn't do this on a regular basis, and this was our first application to the board, locating those letters was extremely difficult, and we couldn't find it without staff direction. In conclusion, there were multiple procedural abnormalities, errors, and oversights, which we feel put us at a disadvantage and did not adequately allow us to speak to the application without prejudice. I have indicated multiple RDOS issues, as well as actual procedural concerns that occurred during the meeting. If someone is told that there is an objection to an application, they must be told what the objection is. It is the obligation of any elected board and is in fact their legal duty to make decisions that are based on all aspects. Given the fact that the letters are not based on any scientific evidence, Issues unrelated to the application were brought forward, and we were not given a chance to respond to a couple of concerns. The decision to deny the application was not based on all the evidence. Not allowing us to respond to said letters denies us natural justice, and it is completely unfair to us, and that's why we asked for it to be waived, so that we could then speak to the matter and speak fully instead of being cut off. Thank you for your time and your interest, and I, um, I hope that the board has a chance to, to consider this because this isn't just a simple aspect, it's, it's about um, people, and we are trying our best to make things work. Thank you. Board, is there any questions for the applicant here? Uh, go ahead, Director Monti. To the chair, uh, obviously you've seen the letters, um, from your neighbors, what is your response to their comments and letters? Are you asking me? Yes, she is. Okay, well, first of all, the uh, this motion that we have right before us right now is directly related to um, waiving the timeline. It's not directly related to the letters. I can speak at, at uh, um, to the letters if you truly want to. But I think um, I don't maybe I'd ask direction from, uh, you know, the RDOS, maybe uh, Director Newell, or not Director Newell, but Mr. Newell, as to whether or not I should be answering the letters, or is that to be saved for if we have a further meeting? It probably should go to the, if there's a further meeting, I would suspect. Uh, anything from the Director Monty? Director Point. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody, this is about whether or not we're going to allow him to reapply now or not that's all this is about it's not about anything else it's not about neighbors or anything it's only about this one issue so with that i'd, I'd like to ask you to call the question i just got to check if there's any other questions for the applicant and then we will discuss it as a board i don't believe i'm seeing any hands 
but I've been known to miss them, so I'm double checking. I don't see any. Okay, we thank you, Mr. Temple, for your input, and we'll go back to the board to deal with this for discussion. I, I can't support a motion to deny at this time. Um, I feel that something was missed somewhere along the way, and I think it would be responsible to uh, of us to at least give him an opportunity to reapply and do it right this time, and maybe we can put uh, everything else aside and just deal with the problem, or with the issue at hand and nothing else. Okay. Any further discussion on this, Director Bush? <clears throat> I feel the same. I think there's uh, reasons enough to uh, waive this uh, application year wait or whatever. Okay. Anything further, Director Kazakovich, I believe, has a hand up? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, while I don't agree with everything in the applicant's um, lawyer's letter, uh, I do feel that um, the process wasn't exactly the way it should be, and, and I don't have a problem with allowing this to come back and have a look at it again. Thank you. Okay. thought I'd seen a hand from Director Knoble, but it disappeared. Did you? I'm in concurrence with the other directors, so. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Okay, seeing no hands, we do have the motion. Oh, uh, Director Holmes, go ahead. Just if, um, could somebody read the motion again before we call the question? Thanks. I was going to just state it now. The motion is to deny the waiving of the 12 month wait period for the reapplication. That's what's on the floor at the moment. So that's what we will be voting on Calling the question on that. All those in favor of denial. Okay. Those opposed. Uh, looks like everyone but Director Obrick was the only one I had seen in we, favor. Sorry, Chair, can we go with the names on that? I can't see that all 19 directors are on here, so if we could just get... Okay, I will list off... Those opposed, please put your hands up, and I'll just start looking on the screen, although they jump around quite regular. Director Coyne Sr., Director Coyne Jr., Director Trainer, Director Holmes, Director Sanchez, Director Bauer, Director Kazakovich. Can't tell if oh, Director Robinson, Director Vasilaki, Director Bush, Director Johansson, Director Pendergraft, Director McCordoff, Director Gettins, Director Canodal and, and Director Roberts and Monty. Yeah, I believe it was everybody but Director Home or uh, Ulbrich, Sorry, so that Thank motion you. fails. Director, we need another motion. Director yeah. Coin. Yeah, I was just going to make the uh, the uh, motion that we allow it. Okay, and moving it. Yeah, seconding motion. it. Thank you, and this is to allow a resubmission, waiving of that 12-month resubmission period. Any discussion needed? Director McCordoff? Can I just ask, uh, is there a timeline on that? Uh, if he or the applicants uh, put in a motion to uh, have a look at it again, to reapply, how much time after that does it take? In other words, he's probably looking at doing it this summer, yeah. if he can get it done. Yeah. Is like, I, think, I wasn't sure how long. I think Director Obrick had asked that. It, roughly a couple of months uh, okay. for the application to probably get back to us Thank in you. that neighborhood. Okay. Maybe quicker, depending on a lot of the work has been done already. Uh, okay. So it should be reasonably quick. And at that time, they will look at the letters when the TOP it comes in come. with, the, with the letters that were reviewed. Yeah, okay. we would see the. I'm sure there would be resubmissions of sure. letters and everything that go with it. Correct yeah, okay. point? I think it's just important to note that this is not an approval of right. his application. This is just an approval of us allowing, allowing him to redo it because obviously there, 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 there seems to have been some misunderstanding, whether it's on our end or his end, I don't know, but it's, it's uh, to offer a fair chance. Fair enough. Any further discussion? Seeing none, again, call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Director Obrick is opposed. 
motion carries. So just a reminder, this just approved only allowing him to resubmit in a short time frame versus 12 month wait. Moving on to C3, zoning and building bylaw amendments for metal storage containers, CAO. Uh, so this is two bylaws, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an amendment of the zoning bylaw with regards to uh, the siting of uh, and regulations around the siting of metal storage containers, and then the building bylaw to remove the requirement for a uh, building permit for a siting of a container. And we're recommending third reading on both of these. Okay. Direction from the board on this. We've seen this many times, probably too many times, but. <laughs> Director Knoll, are you moving it? I'd like to move the recommended. Okay, mover, seconder. Thank you, Director Roberts. I'm assuming that's a second. Thank you. Discussion on this? I believe we've talked about this enough. I'll call the question. And this one is, just to be sure, a rural vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next is C4, uh, Zoning Amendment in Electoral Area E, CAO. Yeah, this is the existing building that uh, is limited by the zoning bylaw to just five units, uh, Mr. Chair, and they've applied for the amendment to allow them to use a sixth one uh, that is already in the existing building. And we're recommending that this be given third in adoption. Okay. I'm just came to my mind here that I believe there was a public hearing that was held in Area E. Uh, Director Kazakovich, did we get a report on that? Yeah, it's in the package. Did you do that? Is it? Okay. Uh, do we not normally approve those uh, public hearing minutes when it's held outside, uh, or at least receive them? That's generally what we've done in the past. Yeah, we normally, it's not written in the package there, but normally, you're right, we'd have a motion to approve. Uh, yeah, so let's do that just to be sure. And you will attest that the public hearing minutes? Uh, yes, I uh, move, <laughs> move the accuracy of the public hearing uh, report from May 31st, 2022. Okay, thank you. And it's being moved. Seconded for that. Thank you. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, call that question. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Any opposed? Motion carries. And then to the actual zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, Director Kazakovich? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like to move the administrative recommendation for third and adoption and can speak to it as well. Okay, so it's being moved. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Go ahead, Director Kazakovich. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. I have some notes I'd just like to state. Um, this has been a, one that's been ongoing for many, many years. Uh, this site-specific rezone application is about an increase from five agritourism bedrooms to adding one more for a sixth. Uh, currently, they are permitted the five. If they had more acres, so a larger parcel of land, they would be allowed to have up to 10 bedrooms. They do have a second parcel of land, but it's not attached to this. Uh, but of course, they don't have enough land to increase. Um, so that's why we are looking at a site specific rezone. So approximately four years ago or so, they put this application forward and um, withdrew it before it got to the board because there was neighbor opposition. And that was specifically around uh, noise, possible noise issues. There was a previous owner before these folks where there was a fair bit of noise issues from them hosting weddings and uh, I think, you know, more people on the property. Uh, so I asked uh, the folks to, you know, it is a good idea to just take a step back and prove to the neighbours, prove to the community that you can operate this uh, agritourism uh, five-bedroom unit without impacting the neighbours. And if it goes well, then then put your application in once you've proven that there aren't noise issues, there aren't parking issues. And that's where, where we are right now. 
So over the past four years or so, we have not received any noise complaints at all. And I do not believe that the addition of two more people, so one bedroom that's already there, putting two people in it, is going to cause a problem for the neighborhood. There's ample parking as well. Um, of course, if there's ever a noise issue, the people can phone into 24-hour noise control bylaw and file a complaint. We did have a public hearing. There was four members of the public in attendance. Three spoke in favor, one against. The APC did support this application as well. And we've had numerous letters. That, so there's been uh, many people against, many for this. If this was a re request to put in a new building or to expand this building and take away land, um, good agriculture land, then yeah, I'd have a different opinion. But it's an existing building that already has a sixth bedroom in it. And I do not see an issue with putting two more people in that building, um, as I just don't see that that two uh, husband and wife or a couple coming for an agritourism experience are going to cause a huge impact to the neighborhood. So for these reasons, I am in favor of this rezoning. Thank you. Anybody else who wishes to speak to this? I don't believe I'm seeing any hands. Oh, Director Obrick on live, go ahead. Yeah, thank you to the chair and, and thank you to Director Kazakovich. Uh, I have reviewed all the information, all the attachments. There's a lot there, and, and the written letters are uh, are, are, are split. Uh, there's there's one side that is uh, short of words and, and, and in support, and there's another side that's long in words and and very much in opposition. The um, the one of the things I'm not clear on, and it was referenced in a lot of the letters, this this property was not in compliance, and and, and the building maybe now I, I don't know was that building put in use when it wasn't in compliance, and, and somehow they're they're getting uh, this uh, this use now that that was not proper. Uh, I, I am confused on the detail. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate uh, Director Kozakovic's help in, in explaining the history. It helps a lot. But, uh, but on those concerns, I just wanted to be satisfied that those concerns have been properly considered, and, and I was unclear on that detail. Okay. And Director Kozakovic, re respond to that. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks for that question. There, there were many comments about past history. Uh, you know, a lot of noise complaints, weddings, parties. That was uh, previous ownership. So the new owners have been working really hard to be good neighbors and not be hosting large events or putting too many people into a building. So it, it's unfortunate, but they've had to work to uh, build a good name as the new owners of the property. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Any further discussion? Seeing none, again, this is a rural vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. C5, petition to enter the fire service in electoral area E. CAO. This is uh, eight properties on Smethurst Road, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, we're bringing into the Naramata Fire Service uh, area, and we're recommending that that be approved. Okay, Director Kazakovich. Yes, I'd like to move the administrative recommendation. Okay, moved, seconded. Thank you. Discussion on this. I don't believe I'm seeing any hands. This is a corporate vote. Call the question. All in favor. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Down to C6, another petition to enter electoral area E fire service area. CAO. Yeah, this is additional properties on Workman Place and Kettle Ridge Way, Mr. Chair, and we are recommending that this amendment to the establishment bylaw be adopted. Okay. Director Kazakovich again. Yes, I'd like to move the administrative recommendation. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this? 
Seeing no hands, again, corporate vote, all in favor? Thank you, any opposed? Motion carries. C7, Okanagan Valley Zoning Amendment Bylaw, CAO. Uh, this is our newly consolidated zoning bylaw, uh, Mr. Chair, and we had identified some mapping errors uh, uh, that occurred during the, the uh, drafting of it. So we're in the process of amending uh, that to correct those. So uh, we're recommending that uh, that amendment be adopted. Okay. Direction from the board on this. Is there someone willing to move it? Moved. Thank you. A seconder. Perfect. Any discussion? This is just to correct mapping errors. Seeing none. Again, a rural vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. C8, Delegated Development Variance Permits, CAO. Uh, the province made some legislative amendments to allow uh, uh, local governments, uh, boards and uh, councils to delegate uh, the responsibility for minor variances uh, to administration. In order for us to do that, we have to amend our delegation bylaw and we have to amend our development procedures bylaw. So uh, we're recommending, and they both have third reading, we're recommending those both be adopted, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. I see a hand from, uh, I was gonna say director. <laughs> Ms. Mullen, please, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, with this one here, I can see that the voting we inadvertently missed. Uh, they should be divided. The first part of it, the bylaw to amend the Chief Administrative Officer delegation is a corporate, and the second part okay. of it is a rural. All right, thank you for that. So we're looking for a motion for the first part, since we need to separate them, different voting structure. Moved, seconded, thank you. Any discussion on that, that we're delegating it to the CAO? Seeing no, oh, go ahead, Director Gettins. Thanks, Chair. I think, were we, I'm not sure if I'm doing this right now because of the of separating the two, but I thought we agreed to move, move it to 60 meters for the letters, or am I thinking of the wrong thing? It was the error that, um, Director Trainer brought up last time. I don't believe that's with this one, but I could be wrong. I don't recall which one it was actually with now, but can staff clarify that? CAO? I recall that discussion, Mr. Chair, but I can't remember if this was <laughs> as if the, as this was a pertinent bylaw either. I think we'd have to ask Mr. Garish. Yeah, I spoke to Chris. Let's go to Mr. Garish. Sure, thank you. The, uh, the the radius for the notifications is in the development procedures bylaw amendment. Okay, so it's not this one. No. Not this motion anyway. Okay. Seeing no other hands, I'll call the question. Corporate vote. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. The second part of that, needing a motion for that to amend the development procedures bylaw and adopting it. Moved, seconded, thank you. Rural vote, any discussion? Seeing, oh, Director Holmes, go ahead. Well, this is the one where it says 30 meters. Word. Mr. Garrish, could you clarify that? Is this the what part that says the 30 meters yes. or 60 meters? I believe the bylaw currently is structured to say 30 meters. Okay. And we wanted that to be 60. Is that my understanding? Or we're not correcting that at this time? Director Gettins? Thank you. I recall from the last meeting that Director Trainer brought this up, and we all agree that 60 meters was the way to go if we weren't going to have board input on this like we were so yeah we want it to be 60 meters director trainer yeah i mentioned it at the last meeting because i remembered from the meeting before when we originally discussed this that there was a suggestion to move it to 60 in summerland we have an area of 60 um, meters to make sure that we get all the neighbors and i think at that time at that meeting two meetings ago the board agreed with that um 
And then I noticed at the last meeting that it hadn't been changed. So that's why I brought it up there. And it still is at 30. So I think that the intention okay. was to move it to 60. To be sure on that, we should just probably amend the motion to approve or to extend that to 60 meters. Is there a mover for an amendment? I can make that amendment. I think I made the motion. I may have if I did. I'm okay, so moving the amendment to 60 meters. Seconder for that. Thank you. Any discussion needed on the amendment? So from 30 to 60. Seeing none, call the question on the amendment. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. And then to the motion as amended. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. Rural, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. C9, uh, sub regional growth strategy, CAO. So we've had discussions. We've got good direction on how to proceed on the sub regional growth strategy. Uh, the regulation requires us to get the consultation plan approved. Uh, so we need the resolution on that, Mr. Chair. So that's what this is, is to approve the consultation plan uh, for the sub-regional growth strategy. Okay, thank you. Correction from the board on this one. So approving the consultation plan, is there a mover? Thank you. The seconder? Thought I seen a hand, go ahead, thank you. On the floor, any discussion? It's fairly straightforward, self-explanatory. And for this one, I'll call the question, but it is a participant vote, just which is something we don't often have to deal with, but participants for the sub-regional growth strategy. All those in favor, thank you. Any opposed? It doesn't say that. Motion carries. There was a, a typo and oh. it was corrected after. I was looking at that. Yeah, it was a participant. <laughs> the motion carries. That brings us down to community services, uh, provincial license of occupation for boat launch in OK Falls, CAO. So, our current license of occupation has expired on the Okanagan Falls boat launch, Mr. Chair. So, this is to reapply for another 10 years. Okay, I'll go to Director Oberg for direction on this. I'm assuming you would like this. Thank you. Thank you to the Chair, and yes, I'd like to move the administrative recommendation. Moved. Seconder, thank you. Any discussion needed on this one? I don't believe I'm seeing any hands. Call the question. Corporate vote. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. D2. UBCM Community Emergency Fund Extreme Heat Risk Application, CAO. Yeah, we had a, a presentation from Mr. Dresner at the last uh, 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 committee meeting, Mr. Chair, and this is now the resolution that we need to send along with the grant. Okay. I'll make a motion. It's moved. Is there a seconder for it? Thank you. Any discussion on this? Believe I'm seeing any hands. I'm trying to glance everywhere here, starting to go cross eyed. I will call the question on this. A corporate vote. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Again, motion carries. Clean energy transition and electri electrification feasibility, CAO. Yeah, so uh, this is a project that Mr. Dresner is working on. Also, Mr. Chair, uh, it has a short uh, timeline for us to get the application in. We didn't have time to get up to the committee and then wait for the delay. So we have Mr. Dresner set up in the Samalcoming Room to give the board a short presentation on just what this uh, uh, project is about. Okay, thank you. I will go to Jeremy. Are you with us? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Um, thank you to the chairs. Hopefully you can see the start of my presentation here. Um, there we go. go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. This uh, the 
areas that um, I've been working on in, in general, and uh, this um, this application for funding is going to be covering the following areas: electric vehicles, community energy, corporate energy, and street lights. Um, the application is is looking to achieve a number of longer term objectives, uh, including producing a long term net zero strategy, street light to EV conversion study, uh, reduction of natural gas use in corporate buildings, the addition of renewables to our buildings, um, study the potential for off site renewables and um, battery. I'm going to just quickly go through a few highlights of that. Um, there are some areas in BC, in the city of New Westminster in particular, where street lights are able to do a double duty. If you um, change out the light bulbs to more efficient ones, you sometimes have capacity to use that for electric vehicles. Quite what that means uh, from a technical perspective and also on a regulatory perspective is what we want to study here and see if that might be something that's suitable for the region and our street lighting areas. Um, full building energy modeling, um, in integrating uh, renewables, including solar, um, developing actionable and costly electrification proposals for our buildings, and a pathway to net zero for each site. This is some significant engineering work, and um, we're seeking support for that in this fund. Um, we are examining the use case for a large battery, which can deliver multiple services for the region, uh, including cut power to the emergency operations center, which don't, doesn't currently have that facility, and also do some demand management services, um, potentially also provide uh, small power um, for, for visitors as well, and uh, manage our power use. Um, additional items are understanding the energy generation potential of off-site spaces, e.g. E reservoirs and looking at micro-hydro, uh, long-term 2050 net zero strategy and working with indigenous local youth for trainee skills and development. So um, what you have in front of you in the report is the proposed timeline and if uh, this, is the, this is the timeline we, we would like to work on. It is it is fairly tight and we were going out to tender as soon as possible to get a single company that can provide all of this, uh, all of these services and after that we'll be able to um, provide further announcements about, about the, the funding potential but there is uh, no additional costs, it is being, uh, the offer is that it could be 100% funded from an outside source. Um, and I'll hand back to the chair. Okay, thank you for that. Is there any questions on this? You're making the motion to, yeah. what is the wording on this one? It is to yes. investigate electrical feasibility projects with the support of a donor at no cost to the RUS. <laughs> that sounds like a good thing. Well, the no cost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's moved. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Regular no cost. A discussion? I guess everybody likes the no cost, but I have to admit for myself, when I seem with the uh, support of a donor, I like the idea of a donor, but I just would like to be assured that this isn't going to uh, put us in a bind in the future. Like, is this a non-committal of any sort, other than the donors just out of the goodness of their heart, saying, here, this is a project that's dear to my heart, support and support us on it, that there's no strings attached? Is that... Can that be answered? Uh, who are you asking, Mr. Chair? I would suspect, I'm not sure if it would be you or Jeremy. It's uh, a government this agency. Is a notion. Okay, fair enough then. That answers that question. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we will call a question. Corporate vote, all in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries as a little bit of rumbling happens in the distance. Wow. Down to finance, the SOFI administration, or administrative report, CAO. We have a regulatory requirement to file our statement of information, of, of financial information on an annual basis. 
So this is our report for 2021, uh, Mr. Chair. I believe it was sent out to all members. Uh, and I believe Mr. Sfino is standing by to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Thank you. Direction from the board on this. This is the expenditures we incurred. Director Coyne. I'll make the Okay, it's being moved, seconded, thank you. Any discussion or questions on this? We see this every year, although the spending is slightly different each year, but it's considerably, well, quite a bit similar every year. The large number of people we give, spend money with. Seeing no hands, we have the motion on the floor. Call the question. Corporate vote, it is weighted, but we'll just go with the standard vote. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Is no opposed? Okay, then it's carried unanimously, which would make the weighted vote easy to tabulate. So, perfect. Down to nothing for legislative services, CAO reports. CAO. <coughs> uh, nothing new for me, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Over to Chair's report. Uh, the only item I would report on is that I had been asked as the Chair of the RDOS to sit on the Fire Safety Act working group with UBCM, and I've accepted that, so my first meeting for that is starting, I believe, on June 20th, if I'm not mistaken, and I suspect um, maybe Director Kozakovich had some input into that happening, but maybe I'm wrong, but I'm glad to sit on that one and represent the board. Just for the board's information, that has to do with doing fire inspections in the rural areas, or uh, safety inspections in the rural areas, and there was a motion a few years back that we didn't want to get involved in it, that regional districts didn't want to have to do that, and it was put on hold, and now the province is coming back and wanting to move ahead. So this is to see if we can come to some resolution on how to move forward on that. So just informing the board of that. Uh, nothing else for me. Board representations. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, but I have to depart. No problem. We're having a problem with flooding oh. on the northeastern corner. Okay, of the well, good luck with it. Okay, thank you. Understandable. You're leaving. Uh, municipal Finance Authority and Municipal Insurance Authority, nothing to report there. OBWD? Sure. Sure. Thank you. So you did hear some things this morning, obviously, from uh, Jan Anna and James. But um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, you should be make water work. Take the pledge, makewaterwork.ca. You could, if you get lots of people from your municipality, you could. You didn't already win. I already checked, I already checked the votes. Um, but please do that. I know it's raining and there's a thunderstorm, but still, we need to look after the water that we have. Um, we've also uh, begun talks with uh, making a toolkit for use with um, local governments and on Zebra Quagga. And, and actually, the, the provincial government agreed to do that, but that was easy for them to say because Okanagan Basin Water Board does the work for them. So they've already okayed to that. You heard about the milfoil. That was in the newsletter this month as well on Vassal Lake, the possibility of getting a harvester. Harvester haircut. That's why I always think red rototiller roots. So that's how I, how I remember the green and the, and the, and the red road, um, machines. And um, the board approved the audited financial statements. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Okanagan Film Commission, Director Gettins, anything to report there? Well, there's a, a, a sea do commercial being filmed right now in the South Okanagan, so hopefully they'll catch a break on the weather. Um, and a few movies are um, two in Penticton, I think one's heading out to Osoyas, and another one figuring out somewhere in the South to go. Quite a few on the, um, the list of potential movies as well, so busy as ever, which is just fantastic. Okay, thank you for that. Okanagan Regional Library. Director Monteith, anything there? Um, we are actively working on our CAO recruitment, so we hired a headhunter to start that process. 
um, it's looking really well. Things are kind of in place, so we we'll see. Okay, we'll keep up updated on that, how that mm -hmm. comes about. Oh, Canogan sterile, sterile insect release, yeah. Director Bush. Yeah, nothing new. Uh, we've got a meeting coming up towards the end of July. Okay. Simia, Director Canodal, anything there? Nothing to report there. Sterling Control, Director Bush. And we just recently had a meeting and nothing much changed. Uh, Financials all the same, everything's going according to the plan. Okay. <clears throat> Fire Liaison Committee, uh, nothing to report there other than that we're trying to get together uh, for a meeting, and I'm hoping to do it next week, and we're going to have to try to do it via Web app, WebEx, so I'm going to have to ask for some help from staff on that, because not all of us seem to be able to attend in person. So that <clears throat> will be notification coming out to everybody shortly. Intergovernmental Indigenous Joint Council, nothing to report there. Director's motions, and we have one on there already from Director Knobel. So I'll go to him, please. That went ahead with uh, this, this afternoon's uh, yeah. pro program, so I dealt with. Okay, so you're comfortable with that being dealt with, just with the meeting to of the minister? You're not wanting to... Make well, a motion to send that to UBCM, like as a... To send that to UBCM, obviously, that, that's where I thought we were going this afternoon, or this earlier today. Well, we were making ministers' meetings, but do you want this as a resolution to UBCM or not? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's what you... Okay, so that is a different motion, but it may be... Are we still on time for that? That's a question I'm unsure of. CAO, can you... When is the deadline for motions to UBCM? I believe we can still get that in, Mr. Chair. Okay. It, there is that window for late resolutions. It has to be approved to get on there. So, Director Canole? Yes, sir. I'd like to. Uh, you want to make that motion? I'd like to make that motion. <clears throat> Moved. A seconder for it. Thank you. Any discussion on this? Not seeing any hands. Call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Director Bush is opposed. Motion still carries. Any other director's motions? Seeing none. Moves us on to board members' verbal updates. Any news from the areas? Go ahead, Director Johansson. Yeah, I'll just. Uh talk about the recent meeting that Sue and I had with the uh, health ministry, Dr. Dix, and with the recent loss of two doctors in the Oliver Asuyas. Asuyas, I felt it was Asuyas. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I felt it was imperative for Sue and I to meet with the Minister of Health, Adrian Dix. I wanted the opportunity to personally voice our concerns about the healthcare crisis we are experiencing in the South Okanagan and get consensus on an approach towards a sustainable solution that takes into account all the components of primary care. I'd like to acknowledge our MLA, Roly Russell, for setting up the meeting with the minister. By all accounts, it was a very productive meeting with a lengthy discussion on health care challenges we are facing without all the politics. It was like that was checked at the door and we just had a really good conversation. The meeting was scheduled for 30 minutes, however, the meeting went on for close to 40 minutes and concluded with some clear follow-up action items and a commitment to meet again in the summer. I just want to say I've worked hard over the last four years building relationships with the ministry and with healthcare partners serving the South Okanagan. This meeting to me was a breakthrough that I've been looking for and has created momentum. I look forward to building on the momentum when we meet again this summer and getting support for some tangible action items that will address the primary healthcare challenges we are facing in the South Okanagan. Anything to add to that, Sue? No, but I know why the meeting went on for 40 minutes, <clears throat> because the minister offered you a Diet Coke, and you said, don't you have any rum to go with that? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> that was why it went on a little longer. <laughs> no, it was a very positive um, meeting, because what we were really, but sorting through everything was asking for 
his ideas on whether we could suggest some flexible funding, mm -hmm. which probably was a way of not being combative, was saying, you know what, we've got some ideas and, uh, and we'd like to present them to you, and, um, and are you agreeable to that? And he said, yes. Yeah. So he's coming up to the South Okanagan. No, no, it's the Suya, sorry. <laughs> 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 who's, got, who's got the rock? <laughs> Anyway, go. it was it was um, it was a, a good step. Yeah. Good good news, Director um, Monty. I want to share that on July the 9th, Eden is having a community day. So instead of having Canada Day, this is what we're doing. So we're kind of having different stations throughout the community to just showcase what's in our community. So kind of exciting. So if you want to learn about about Eden, come see us on July 9th. Interesting. Good to hear. Director McCarthy? Yeah, thank you. From Asuyas, um, we have just hired a new CAO. We're very, um, we're very pleased with that. We have 56 applicants, so um, you know, it was nice and we narrowed it down. And, and fortunately, the applicant that we chose already has a house in Asuyas. So how, <laughs> that was fantastic. He's had it for 15 years. And he paid his taxes on it too. We <laughs> That's <good. laughs> and and the, He starts uh, um, August the second. And the other thing I wanted to say is that July first, we are having the seventy second annual Cherry Fiesta yeah. in Asuyas. We're, as you heard me say when all of the RCMP were here, we're a little concerned about the number of people that might show up. But you know what? There we go. And I was in charge of the Cherry Pit Spit. And I thought, no, no, this is not the year to be doing that. So I said I wasn't doing it, so we're doing three-legged races instead. <laughs> and we have the best fireworks in Canada. Um, it's Frank's uh, 25th year of doing this, Frank's Emily. And um, so we're looking forward to it. I'm usually up at 6, setting up things, and I get home about midnight. So it's a long day for those of us. Not the town, it's the Festival Society. So please watch it. Um, if you like to come down, I suggest that you do not go across the bridge because you'll never get back for hours. So make sure that if you are coming down that you stay uh, on the north side of it. Thank you. Okay, Director Quinn. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to the Princeton Rodeo Association. We had a rodeo, our 40th uh, Memorial Rodeo on uh, Saturday with over Saturday and Sunday, with over 2,000 people show up to our little rodeo in a town of just under 3,000. That's pretty darn good. Um, and we also have a, a new disc golf, um, Nine Holes, that uh, a volunteer group um, put together on the weekend on some municipal owned property. So um, if you're into disc golf, check it out. It's on the app. <laughs> cool. Good news. Um, Director Knobel and then Director Obert. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, say that the RUS had a, a Fire Smart uh, uh, presentation at the uh, Wilbert Fire Hall on Saturday. It was very well done, very well uh, received. Uh, I'd like to thank Carrie and Sean for a job very well done. It, uh, it impressed the, the locals. And the other uh, point is we're starting to uh, see a, a little localized flooding here off the river. Uh, apparently, there's some at the south and around road 22 right now and i just heard from my alternate terry schaefer that it's starting to flood at his house again so welcome to the spring in the okanagan <laughs> thank you kindly director over something to report yes thank you i have two updates and the first is uh uh was speaking to a uh, production a uh, producer from cbc's program uh still standing this morning and uh, I have permission to speak to it at the board table here. Uh, they're going to go ahead with the still standing uh, show featuring Okanagan Falls. Uh, they're shooting in August. And I just wanted to say uh, to, to the CAO and legislative service manager, uh, they, they've been in touch with Augusto Romero. They have some documents that might, might need uh, execution for permissions and whatnot for shooting. And I, I've indicated to them, I'll give them all the support I can, whatever, whatever that might mean. Uh, from a community perspective, it is exciting. We've talked to a lot of people. There's a lot of stories. And I think the fun of this is it's going to showcase not just us, but the entire region. And it'll, it'll, it should be a lot of fun. 
Uh, the second update is just quickly on the governance boundary and services review. Uh, we had a committee meeting uh, last evening and the uh, survey which was sent out uh, by consultants and staff came back. It's a 73 page report. There's 506 responses and, and to give a comparable, uh, we were told that the 2020 RDOS citizen survey uh, in 2020 had 223 for the entire regional district. The 220, 2021 survey, 373. So by that standard, 506 is quite a good return on a 4,016 population. Uh, again, by comparison, the, the election in 2018 had 939 people in there to vote. So it's not quite as many people who voted. Um, in terms of results, about 111 or 13, depending what page you look at, uh, were not in favor of this proceeding. But the remainder are, are in favor, and of the options uh, put forth, the uh, option E, which is pretty much all the area D, with some exclusions of, of Crown land possibly, uh, that is the number one option with the analysis done. And the uh, by area, it, it's, it's fairly well supported. There's lots of feedback, lots of information. Uh, my understanding is the committee will be meeting again next week. They will be uh, receiving a draft uh, report from the consultants and with whatever changes arise, it will find its way to this board sometimes possibly in, in the summer. So I'm waiting to see what uh, that process brings forth, but I thought uh, people might be curious to hear what's going on with that study. Thank you. Thanks for the update. Anything further from anybody? Oh, Director Sentes. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I just thought I would share uh, a presentation made to the Silga Board this week. Uh, uh, Director Coyne Sr. and uh, Chair Kozakovich uh, and I. And uh, the reason I bring it forward, it was about code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And it specifically focused on how that will be impacted by the upcoming election and the subsequent campaign. Um, social media, people are saying anything and everything. Within our own council chambers, uh, we're getting, you know, the, the, the old adage that the Canadians were reserved and they didn't speak out abusively or uh, negatively. That's all gone by the wayside. People are very much emboldened. Um, and so um, we're getting a, a report at, uh, at Silga on the presentation, and I think it might be something to be shared because as each of us um, go forward, even prior to the, uh, the election campaign, um, it's interesting what we're seeing in our council chambers um, and the social media element, which never existed if you think back a few years, it's, it's caustic in, in many cases now. So it was an excellent presentation, made us aware of some things and uh, offered some suggestions. So. Um, it's going to come forward to Silga, and uh, perhaps we can get uh, Chair Kozakovich to uh, share it uh, here at the at the board of the RDOS. Interesting. Thank you. It was very interesting. Anything further from anybody to further area or municipality to report? Seeing no hands, thank you everybody for attending. Looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Never any opposed. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs>